Introduction to Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions. By Frank Lewis Dyer, General Counsel for the Edison Laboratory and Allied Interests, and Thomas Comerford Martin, ex-president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Introduction Prior to this, no complete, authentic, and authorized record of the work of Mr. Edison during an active life has been given to the world. That life, if there is anything in heredity, is very far from finished, and while it continues there will be new achievement. An insistently expressed desire on the part of the public for a definitive biography of Edison was the reason for the following pages. The present authors deem themselves happy in the confidence reposed in them, and in the constant assistance they have enjoyed from Mr. Edison while preparing these pages, a great many of which are altogether his own. This cooperation in no sense relieves the authors of responsibility as to any of the views or statements of their own that the book contains. They have realized the extreme reluctance of Mr. Edison to be made the subject of any biography at all, while he has felt that, if it must be written, it were best done by the hands of friends and associates of long standing, whose judgment and discretion he could trust, and whose intimate knowledge of the facts would save him from misrepresentation. The authors of the book are profoundly conscious of the fact that the extraordinary period of electrical development embraced in it has been prolific of great men. They have named some of them, but there has been no idea of setting forth various achievements or of ascribing distinctive merits. This treatment is devoted to one man whom his fellow citizens have chosen to regard as in many ways representative of the American at his finest, flowering in the field of invention during the nineteenth century. It is designed in these pages to bring the reader face to face with Edison, to glance at an interesting childhood and a youthful period marked by a capacity for doing things and by an insatiable thirst for knowledge then to accompany him into the great creative stretch of forty years during which he has done so much this book shows him plunged deeply into work for which he has always had an incredible capacity reveals the exercise of his unsurpassed inventive ability his keen reasoning powers his tenacious memory his fertility of resource follows him through a series of innumerable experiments, conducted methodically, reaching out like rays of searchlight into all the regions of science and nature, and finally exhibits him emerging triumphantly from countless difficulties, bearing with him in new arts the fruits of victorious struggle. These volumes aim to be a biography rather than a history of electricity, but they have had to cover so much general ground in defining the relations and contributions of Edison to the electrical arts that they serve to present a picture of the whole development effected in the last fifty years, the most fruitful that electricity has known. The effort has been made to avoid technique and abstruse phrases, but some degree of explanation has been absolutely necessary in regard to each group of inventions. The task of the authors has consisted largely in summarizing fairly the methods and processes employed by Edison, and some idea of the difficulties encountered by them in so doing may be realized from the fact that one brief chapter, for example, that on ore milling, covers nine years of most intense application and activity on the part of the inventor. It is something like exhibiting the geological eras of the earth in an outline lantern slide, to reduce an elaborate series of strenuous experiments and a vast variety of ingenious apparatus to the space of a few hundred words. A great deal of this narrative is given in Mr. Edison's own language, from oral or written statements made in reply to questions addressed to him with the object of securing accuracy. A further large part is based upon the personal contributions of many loyal associates, and it is desired here to make grateful acknowledgment to such collaborators as Messrs. Samuel Insull, E. H. Johnson, F. R. Upton, R. N. Dyer, S. B. Eaton, Francis Jale, W. S. Andrews, W. J. Jenks, W. J. Hammer, F. J. Sprague, W. S. Mallory, and C. L. Clark, and others, without whose aid the issuance of this book would indeed have been impossible. 
In particular, it is desired to acknowledge indebtedness to Mr. W. H. Meadowcroft, not only for substantial aid in the literary part of the work, but for indefatigable effort to group, classify, and summarize the boundless material embodied in Edison's notebooks and memorabilia of all kinds now kept at the Orange Laboratory. Acknowledgment must also be made of the courtesy and assistance of Mrs. Edison, and especially of the loan of many interesting and rare photographs from her private collection. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 1. The Age of Electricity the year 1847 marked a period of great territorial acquisition by the American people, with incalculable additions to their actual and potential wealth. By the rational compromise with England in the dispute over the Oregon region, President Polk had secured during 1846, for undisturbed settlement, 300,000 square miles of forest, fertile land, and fisheries, including the whole fair Columbia Valley. Our active policy of the Pacific dated from that hour. With swift and clinching succession came the melodramatic Mexican War, and February 1848 saw another vast territory, south of Oregon and west of the Rocky Mountains, added by treaty to the United States. Thus, in about 18 months, there had been pieced into the national domain for quick development and exploitation, a region as large as the entire Union of 13 states at the close of the War of Independence. Moreover, within its boundaries was embraced all the great American gold field, just on the eve of discovery, for Marshall had detected the shining particles in the mill race at the foot of the Sierra Nevada nine days before Mexico signed away her rights in California and in all the vague remote hinterland facing Cathayward. Equally momentous were the times in Europe, where the attempt to secure opportunities of expansion as well as larger liberty for the individual took quite different form. The old absolutist system of government was fast breaking up, and ancient thrones were tottering. The red lava of deep revolutionary fires oozed up through many glowing cracks in the political crust, and all the social strata were shaken. That the wild outbursts of insurrection midway in the fifth decade failed and died away was not surprising, for the superincumbent deposits of tradition and convention were thick but the retrospect indicates that many reforms and political changes were accomplished, although the process involved the exile of not a few ardent spirits to America to become leading statesmen, inventors, journalists, and financiers. In 1847, too, Russia began her tremendous march eastward into Central Asia, just as France was solidifying her first gains on the littoral of Northern Africa. In England, the fierce fervor of the Chartist movement, with its violent rhetoric as to the rights of man, was sobering down and passing pervasively into numerous practical schemes for social and political amelioration, constituting in their entirety a most profound change throughout every part of the national life. Into such times Thomas Alva Edison was born, and his relations to them and to the events of the past sixty years are the subject of this narrative. Aside from the personal interest that attaches to the picturesque career, so typically American, there is a broader aspect in which the work of the Franklin of the 19th century touches the welfare and progress of the race. It is difficult at any time to determine the effect of any single invention, and the investigation becomes more difficult where inventions of the first class have been crowded upon each other in rapid and bewildering succession but it will be admitted that in Edison one deals with a central figure of the great age that saw the invention and introduction in practical form of the telegraph, the submarine cable, the telephone, the electric light, the electric railway, the electric trolley car, the storage battery, the electric motor, the phonograph, the wireless telegraph, and that the influence of these on the world's affairs has not been excelled at any time by that of any other corresponding advances in the arts and sciences. 
These pages deal with Edison's share in the great work of the last half century in abridging distance, communicating intelligence, lessening toil, improving illumination, recording forever the human voice, and on behalf of inventive genius it may be urged that its beneficent results and gifts to mankind compare with any to be credited to statesman, warrior, or creative writer of the same period. Viewed from the standpoint of inventive progress, the first half of the nineteenth century had passed very profitably when Edison appeared, every year marked by some notable achievement in the arts and sciences, with promise of its early and abundant fruition in commerce and industry. There had been exactly four decades of steam navigation on American waters, railways were growing at the rate of nearly one thousand miles annually, gas had become familiar as a means of illumination in large cities, looms and tools and printing presses were everywhere being liberated from the slow toil of manpower. The first photographs had been taken. Chloroform, nitrous oxide gas, and ether had been placed at the service of the physician in saving life and the revolver, gun cotton, and nitroglycerin added to the agencies for slaughter. New metals, chemicals, and elements had become available in large numbers. Gases had been liquefied and solidified, and the range of useful heat and cold indefinitely extended. The safety lamp had been given to the miner, the keyson to the bridge builder, the anti-friction metal to the mechanic for bearings. It was already known how to vulcanize rubber, and how to galvanize iron. The application of machinery in the harvest field had begun with the embryonic reaper, while both the bicycle and the automobile were heralded in primitive prototypes. The gigantic expansion of the iron and steel industry was foreshadowed in the change from wood to coal in the smelting furnaces. The sewing machine had brought with it, like the friction match, one of the most profound influences in modifying domestic life, and making it different from that of all preceding time. Even in 1847, few of these things had lost their novelty. Most of them were in the earlier stages of development. But it is when we turn to electricity that the rich virgin condition of an illimitable new kingdom of discovery is seen. Perhaps the word utilization, or application, is better than discovery. For then, as now, an endless wealth of phenomena noted by experimenters, from Gilbert to Franklin and Faraday, awaited the invention that could alone render them useful to mankind. The eighteenth century, keenly curious and ceaselessly active in this fascinating field of investigation, had not, after all, left much of a legacy in either principles or appliances. The lodestone and the compass, the frictional machine, the Leyden jar, the nature of conductors and insulators, the identity of electricity and the thunderstorm flash, the use of lightning rods, the physiological effects of an electrical shock. These constituted the bulk of the bequest to which philosophers were the only heirs. Pregnant with possibilities were many of the observations that had been recorded, but these few appliances made up the meager kit of tools with which the nineteenth century entered upon its task of acquiring the arts and conveniences, now such an intimate part of human nature's daily food, that the average American today pays more for his electrical service than he does for bread. With the first year of the new century came Volta's invention of the chemical battery as a means of producing electricity. A well-known Italian picture represents Volta exhibiting his apparatus before the young conqueror Napoleon, then ravishing from the peninsula its treasure of ancient art and founding an ephemeral empire. At such a moment, this gift of despoiled Italy to the world was a noble revenge, setting in motion incalculable beneficent forces and agencies. For the first time, man had command of a steady supply of electricity without toil or effort. The useful results obtainable previously from the current of a frictional machine were not much greater than those to be derived from the flight of a rocket. While the frictional appliance is still employed in medicine, it ranks with the flint axe and the tinder box in industrial obsolescence. No art or trade could be founded on it. No diminution of daily work or increase of daily comfort could be secured with it. But the little battery with its metal plates in a weak solution proved a perennial reservoir of electrical energy, safe and controllable, from which supplies could be drawn at will. That which was wild had become domesticated. 
regular crops took the place of haphazard gleanings from brake or prairie, the possibility of electrical starvation was forever left behind. Immediately, new processes of inestimable value revealed themselves. New methods were suggested. Almost all the electrical arts now employed made their beginnings in the next twenty-five years, and while the more extensive of them depend today on the dynamo for electrical energy, some of the most important still remain in loyal allegiance to the older source. The battery itself soon underwent modifications, and new types were evolved, the storage, the double fluid, and the dry. Various analogies next pointed to the use of heat, and the thermoelectric cell emerged, embodying the application of flame to the junction of two different metals. Davy, of the safety lamp, threw a volume of current across the gap between two sticks of charcoal, and the voltaic arc, forerunner of electrical lighting, shed its bright beams upon a dazzled world. The decomposition of water by electrolytic action was recognized and made the basis of communicating at a distance, even before the days of the electromagnet. The ties that bind electricity and magnetism in twinship of relation and interaction were detected, and Faraday's work in induction gave the world at once the dynamo and the motor. Hitch your wagon to a star, said Emerson. To all the coal fields and all the waterfalls, Faraday had directly hitched the wheels of industry. Not only was it now possible to convert mechanical energy into electricity cheaply and in illimitable quantities, but electricity at once showed its ubiquitous availability as a motive power. Boats were propelled by it, cars were hauled, and even papers printed. Electroplating became an art, and telegraphy sprang into active being on both sides of the Atlantic. At the time Edison was born, in 1847, telegraphy, upon which he was to leave so indelible an imprint, had barely struggled into acceptance by the public. In England, Wheatstone and Cook had introduced a ponderous magnetic needle telegraph. In America, in 1840, Morse had taken out his first patent on an electromagnetic telegraph, the principle of which is dominating in the art to this day. Four years later, the memorable message, What Hath God Wrought, was sent by young Miss Ellsworth over his circuits, and incredulous Washington was advised by a wire of the action of the Democratic Convention in Baltimore in nominating Polk. By 1847, circuits had been strung between Washington and New York under private enterprise, the government having declined to buy the Moore system for $100,000. Everything was crude and primitive. The poles were two hundred feet apart and could barely hold up a wash line. The slim, bare copper wire snapped on the least provocation, and the circuit was down for thirty-six days in the first six months. The little glass knob insulators made seductive targets for ignorant sportsmen. Attempts to insulate the line wire were limited to coating it with tar or smearing it with wax for the benefit of all the bees in the neighborhood. The farthest western reach of the telegraph lines in 1847 was Pittsburgh, with three-ply iron wire mounted on square glass insulators, with a little wooden pent roof for protection. In that office, where Andrew Carnegie was a messenger boy, the magnets in use to receive the signals sent with the aid of powerful nitric acid batteries weighed as much as 75 pounds apiece. But the business was fortunately small at the outset, until the new device, patronized chiefly by lottery men, had proved its utility. Then came the great outburst of activity. Within a score of years, telegraph wires covered the whole occupied country with a network, and the first great electrical industry was a pronounced success, yielding to its pioneers the first great harvest of electrical fortunes. It had been a sharp struggle for bare existence, during which such a man as the founder of Cornell University had been glad to get breakfast in New York with a quarter dollar picked up on Broadway. End of chapter 1。Chapter 2 of Edison, His Life and Inventions。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter 2. Edison's Pedigree.
Thomas Alva Edison was born at Milan, Ohio, February 11, 1847. The state that rivals Virginia as a mother of presidents has evidently other titles to distinction of the same nature. For picturesque detail, it would not be easy to find any story excelling that of the Edison family before it reached the Western Reserve. The story epitomizes American idealism, restlessness, freedom of individual opinion, and ready adjustment to the surrounding conditions of pioneer life. The ancestral Edisons who came over from Holland, as nearly as can be determined in 1730, were descendants of extensive millers on the Zoider Zee, and took up patents of land along the Passaic River, New Jersey, close to the home that Mr. Edison established in the Orange Mountains a hundred and sixty years later. They landed at Elizabethport, New Jersey, and first settled near Caldwell in that state, where some graves of the family may still be found. President Cleveland was born in that quiet hamlet. It is a curious fact that in the Edison family the pronunciation of the name has always been with the long E sound, as it would naturally be in the Dutch language. The family prospered and must have enjoyed public confidence, for we find the name of Thomas Edison as a bank official on Manhattan Island signed to Continental Currency in 1778. According to the family records, this Edison, great-grandfather of Thomas Alva, reached the extreme old age of 104 years. But all was not well, and, as has happened so often before, the politics of father and son were violently different. The Loyalist movement that took to Nova Scotia so many Americans after the War of Independence carried with it John, the son of this stalwart Continental. Thus it came about that Samuel Edison, son of John, was born at Digby, Nova Scotia in 1804. Seven years later, John Edison, who, as a Loyalist or United Empire emigrant, had become entitled under the laws of Canada to a grant of 600 acres of land, moved westward to take possession of this property. He made his way through the state of New York in wagons drawn by oxen to the remote and primitive township of Bayfield in Upper Canada on Lake Huron. Although the journey occurred in balmy June, it was necessarily attended with difficulty and privation. But the new home was situated in good farming country, and once again this interesting nomadic family settled down. John Edison moved from Bayfield to Vienna, Ontario, on the northern bank of Lake Erie. Mr. Edison supplies an interesting reminiscence of the old man and his environment in those early Canadian days. Quote, when I was five years old, I was taken by my father and mother on a visit to Vienna. We were driven by carriage from Milan, Ohio, to a railroad, then to a port on Lake Erie, thence by a canal boat in tow of several to Port Burwell in Canada across the lake, and from there we drove to Vienna a short distance away. I remember my grandfather perfectly as he appeared, at 102 years of age, when he died. In the middle of the day he sat under a large tree in front of the house, facing a well-traveled road. His head was covered completely with a large quantity of very white hair, and he chewed tobacco incessantly, nodding to friends as they passed by. He used a very large cane, and walked from the chair to the house, resenting any assistance. I viewed him from a distance, and could never get very close to him. I remember some large pipes, and especially a molasses jug, a trunk, and several other things that came from Holland. Close quote. John Edison was long-lived, like his father, and reached the ripe old age of 102, leaving his son Samuel charged with the care of the family destinies, but with no great burden of wealth. Little is known of the early manhood of this father of T.A. Edison until we find him keeping a hotel in Vienna, marrying a schoolteacher there, Miss Nancy Elliott, in 1828, and taking a lively share in the troublous politics of the time. He was six feet in height, of great bodily vigor, and of such personal dominance of character that he became a captain of the insurgent forces rallying under the banners of Papineau and Mackenzie. The opening years of Queen Victoria's reign witnessed a belated effort in Canada to emphasize the principle that there should not be taxation without representation, and this descendant of those who had left the United States from disapproval of such a doctrine flung himself headlong into its support. It has been said of Earl Durham, who pacified Canada at this time and established the present system of government, that he made a country and marred a career. But the immediate measures of repression enforced before a liberal policy was adopted were sharp and severe, and Samuel Edison also found his own career marred on Canadian soil as one result of the Durham administration. 
exile to Bermuda with other insurgents was not so attractive as the perils of a flight to the United States. A very hurried departure was effected in secret from the scene of trouble, and there are romantic traditions of this thrilling journey of 182 miles towards safety, made almost entirely without food or sleep, through a wild country infested with Indians and unfriendly disposition. Thus was the Edison family repatriated by a picturesque political episode and the great inventor given a birthplace on american soil just as was benjamin franklin when his father came from england to boston samuel edison left behind him however in canada several brothers all of whom lived to the age of ninety or more and from whom there are descendants in the region after some desultory wanderings for a year or two along the shores of lake erie among the prosperous towns then springing up the family with its canadian home forfeited and in quest of another resting place came to milan ohio in eighteen forty two that pretty little village offered at the moment many attractions as a possible chicago the railroad system of ohio was still in the future but the western reserve had already become a vast wheat field and huge quantities of grain from the central and northern counties sought shipment to eastern ports the Huron River, emptying into Lake Erie, was navigable within a few miles of the village, and provided an admirable outlet. Large granaries were established, and proved so successful that local capital was tempted into the project of making a towpath canal from Lockwood Landing all the way to Milan itself. The quaint old Moravian Mission and Quondam Indian settlement of one hundred inhabitants found itself of a sudden one of the great grain ports of the world, and bidding fair to rival Russian Odessa. A number of grain warehouses, or primitive elevators, were built along the bank of the canal, and the produce of the region poured in immediately, arriving in wagons drawn by four or six horses with loads of a hundred bushels no fewer than six hundred wagons came clattering in and as many as twenty sail vessels were loaded with thirty-five thousand bushels of grain during a single day the canal was capable of being navigated by craft of from two hundred to two hundred and fifty tons burden and the demand for such vessels soon led to the development of a brisk shipbuilding industry for which the abundant forests of the region supply the necessary lumber an evidence of the activity in this direction is furnished by the fact that six revenue cutters were launched at this port in these brisk days of its prime. Samuel Edison, versatile, buoyant of temper, and ever optimistic, would thus appear to have pitched his tent with shrewd judgment. There was plenty of occupation ready to his hand, and more than one enterprise received his attention. But he devoted his energies chiefly to the making of shingles, for which there was a large demand locally and along the lake. Canadian lumber was used principally in this industry. The wood was imported in bolts, or pieces three feet long. A bolt made two shingles. It was sawn asunder by hand, then split and shaved. None but first-class timber was used, and such shingles outlasted far those made by machinery with their cross-grain cut. A house in Milan, of which some of those shingles were put in 1844, was still in excellent condition forty-two years later. Samuel Edison did well at this occupation, and employed several men, but there were other outlets from time to time for his business activity and speculative disposition. Edison's mother was an attractive and highly educated woman, whose influence upon his disposition and intellect has been profound and lasting. She was born in Shenango County, New York, in 1810, and was the daughter of the Reverend John Elliot, a Baptist minister and descendant of an old revolutionary soldier, Captain Ebenezer Elliot, of Scotch descent. The old captain was a fine and picturesque type. He fought all through the long War of Independence, seven years, and then appears to have settled down at Stonington, Connecticut. There, at any rate, he found his wife, Grandmother Elliot, who was Mercy Peckham, daughter of a Scotch Quaker. Then came the residence in New York State, with final removal to Vienna, for the old soldier, while drawing his pension at Buffalo, lived in the little Canadian town, and there died, over one hundred years old. The family was evidently one of considerable culture and deep religious feeling, for two of Mrs. Edison's uncles and two brothers were also in the same Baptist ministry. As a young woman, she became a teacher in the public high school at Vienna, and thus met her husband who was residing there. The family never consisted of more than three children, two boys and a girl. A trace of the Canadian environment is seen in the fact that Edison's elder brother was named William Pitt, after the great English statesman. 
both his brother and the sister exhibited considerable ability. William Pitt Edison, as a youth, was so clever with his pencil that it was proposed to send him to Paris as an art student. In later life he was manager of the local street railway lines at Port Huron, Michigan, in which he was heavily interested. He also owned a good farm near that town, and during the ill health at the close of his life, when compelled to spend much of the time indoors, he devoted himself almost entirely to sketching. It has been noted by intimate observers of Thomas A. Edison that in discussing any project or new idea, his first impulse is to take up any piece of paper available and make drawings of it. His voluminous notebooks are a mass of sketches. Mrs. Tanny Edison Bailey, the sister, had, on the other hand, a great deal of literary ability, and spent much of her time in writing. The great inventor, whose iron endurance and stern will have enabled him to wear down all his associates by work sustained through arduous days and sleepless nights, was not at all strong as a child, and was of fragile appearance. He had an abnormally large but well-shaped head, and it is said that the local doctors feared he might have brain trouble. In fact, on account of his assumed delicacy, he was not allowed to go to school for some years, and even when he did attend for a short time, the results were not encouraging, his mother being hotly indignant upon hearing that the teacher had spoken of him to an inspector as addled. The youth was, indeed, fortunate far beyond the ordinary in having a mother at once loving, well-informed, and ambitious, capable herself, from her experience as a teacher, of undertaking and giving him an education better than could be secured in the local schools of the day. Certain it is that under this simple regime, studious habits were formed and a taste for literature developed that have lasted to this day. If ever there was a man who tore the heart out of books, it is Edison, and what has once been read by him is never forgotten, if useful or worthy of submission to the test of experiment. But even thus early, the stronger love of mechanical processes and of probing natural forces manifested itself. Edison has said that he never saw a statement in any book as to such things that he did not involuntarily challenge and wish to demonstrate as either right or wrong. As a mere child, the busy scenes of the canal and the grain warehouses were of consuming interest, but the work in the shipbuilding yards had an irresistible fascination. His questions were so ceaseless and innumerable that the penetrating curiosity of an unusually strong mind was regarded as deficiency in powers of comprehension, and the father himself, a man of no mean ingenuity and ability, reports that the child, although capable of reducing him to exhaustion by endless inquiries, was often spoken of as rather wanting in ordinary acumen. This apparent dullness is, however, a quite common incident to youthful genius." The constructive tendencies of this child, of whom his father said once that he had never had any boyhood days in the ordinary sense, were early noted in his fondness for building little plank roads out of the debris of the yards and mills. His extraordinary retentive memory was shown in his easy acquisition of all the songs of the lumber gangs and canal men before he was five years old. One incident tells how he was found one day in the village square copying laboriously the signs of the stores. A highly characteristic event at the age of six is described by his sister. He had noted a goose sitting on her eggs, and the result. One day soon after, he was missing. By and by, after an anxious search, his father found him sitting in a nest he had made in the barn, filled with goose eggs and hen's eggs he had collected, trying to hatch them out. One of Mr. Edison's most vivid recollections goes back to 1850, when, as a child three or four years old, he saw camped in front of his home six covered wagons, prairie schooners, and witnessed their departure for California. The great excitement over the gold discoveries was thus felt in Milan, and these wagons, laden with all the worldly possessions of their owners, were watched out of sight on their long journey by this fascinated urchin whose own discoveries in later years were to tempt many other Argonauts into the auriferous realms of electricity. Another vivid memory of this period concerns his first realization of the grim mystery of death. He went off one day with the son of the wealthiest man in the town to bathe in the creek. Soon after they entered the water, the other boy disappeared. Young Edison waited around the spot for half an hour or more, and then, as it was growing dark, went home puzzled and lonely but silent as to the occurrence. 
about two hours afterward when the missing boy was being searched for a man came to the edison home to make anxious inquiry of the companion with whom he had last been seen edison told all the circumstances with a painful sense of being in some way implicated the creek was at once dragged and then the body was recovered edison had himself more than one narrow escape of course he fell in the canal and was nearly drowned few boys in milan worth their salt omitted that performance on another occasion he encountered a more novel peril by falling into a pile of wheat in a grain elevator and being almost smothered holding the end of a skate strap for another lad to shorten with an axe he lost the tip of a finger fire also had its perils he built a fire in a barn but the flames spread so rapidly that although he escaped himself the barn was wholly destroyed and he was publicly whipped in the village square as a warning to other youths equally well remembered is a dangerous encounter with a ram that attacked him while he was busily engaged digging out a bumblebee's nest near an orchard fence the animal knocked him against the fence and was about to butt him again when he managed to drop over on the safe side and escape he was badly hurt and bruised and no small quantity of arnica was needed for his wounds meantime little milan had reached the zenith of its prosperity and all of a sudden had been deprived of its flourishing grain trade by the new columbus sandusky and hawking railroad in fact the short canal was one of the last efforts of its kind in this country to compete with the new means of transportation the bell of the locomotive was everywhere ringing the death knell of effective water haulage with such dire results that in eighteen eighty of the four thousand four hundred sixty eight miles of american freight canal that had cost two hundred fourteen million dollars no fewer than one thousand eight hundred ninety three miles had been abandoned and of the remaining two thousand five hundred seventy five miles quite a large proportion was not paying expenses the short milan canal suffered with the rest and today lies well nigh obliterated hidden in part by vegetable gardens a mere grass-grown depression at the foot of the winding shallow valley other railroads also prevented any further competition by the canal for a branch of the wheeling and lake erie now passes through the village while the lake shore in michigan southern runs a few miles to the south the owners of the canal soon had occasion to regret that they had disdained the overtures of enterprising railroad promoters desirous of reaching the village and the consequences of commercial isolation rapidly made themselves felt it soon became evident to samuel edison and his wife that the cozy brick home on the bluff must be given up and the struggle with fortune resumed elsewhere they were well to do however and removing in eighteen fifty four to port huron michigan occupied a large colonial house standing in the middle of an old government fort reservation of ten acres overlooking the wide expanse of the st clair river just after it leaves lake huron it was in many ways an ideal homestead toward which the family has always felt the strongest attachment but the association with milan has never wholly ceased the old house in which edison was born is still occupied in nineteen ten by mr s o edison a half-brother of edison's father and a man of marked inventive ability he was once prominent in the iron furnace industry of ohio and was for a time associated in the iron trade with the father of the late president mckinley among his inventions may be mentioned a machine for making fuel from wheat straw and a smoke-consuming device this birthplace of edison remains the plain substantial little brick house it was originally one storied with rooms finished on the attic floor being built on the hillside its basement opens into the rear yard it was at first heated by means of open coal grates which may not have been altogether adequate in severe winters owing to the altitude and the northeastern exposure but a large furnace is one of the more modern changes milan itself is not materially unlike the smaller ohio towns of its own time or those of later creation but the venerable appearance of the big elm trees that fringe the trim lawns tells of its age it is indeed an extremely neat snug little place with well-kept homes mostly of frame construction and flagged streets crossing each other at right angles there are no poor at least everybody is apparently well-to-do while the leisurely atmosphere pervades the town few idlers are seen some of the residents are engaged in local business some are occupied in farming and grape culture others are employed in the ironworks nearby at norwalk the stores and places of public resort are gathered about the square where there is plenty of room for hitching when the saturday trading is done at that point 
at which periods the fitful bustle recalls the old wheat days when young edison ran with curiosity among the six and eight horse teams that had brought in grain this square is still covered with fine primeval forest trees and has at its centre a handsome soldier's monument of the civil war to which four paved walks converge it is an altogether pleasant and unpretentious town which cherishes with no small amount of pride its association with the name of thomas alva edison in view of edison's dutch descent it is rather singular to find him with the name of alva for the spanish duke of alva was notoriously the worst tyrant ever known to the low countries and his evil deeds occupy many stirring pages in motley's famous history as a matter of fact edison was named after captain alva bradley an old friend of his father and a celebrated shipowner on the lakes captain bradley died a few years ago in wealth while his old associate with equal ability for making money was never able long to keep it differing again from the revolutionary new york banker from whom his son's other name thomas was taken end of chapter two Chapter Three of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alana Jordan. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter Three Boyhood at Port Huron, Michigan. The new home found by the Edison family at Port Huron, where Alva spent his brief boyhood before he became a telegraph operator, and roamed the whole Middle West of that period, was unfortunately destroyed by fire just after the close of the Civil War. A smaller, but perhaps more comfortable home, was then built by Edison's father, on some property he had bought by the nearby village of Grashet, and there his mother spent the remainder of her life in confirmed invalidism, dying in 1871. Hence the pictures and postal cards, sold largely to souvenir hunters as the Port Huron home, do not actually show that in or around which the events now referred to took place. It has been a romance of popular biographers, based upon the fact that Edison began his career as a newsboy, to assume that these earlier years were spent in poverty and privation, as indeed they usually are by the newsies, who swarm and shout their papers in our large cities. While it seems a pity to destroy this erroneous idea, suggestive of a heroic climb from the depths to the heights, nothing could be further from the truth socially the edison family stood high in port huron at a time when there was relatively more wealth and general activity than today. the town in its pristine prime was a great lumber centre and hummed with the industry of numerous sawmills an incredible quantity of lumber was made there yearly until the forests nearby vanished and the industry with them the wealth of the community invested largely in this business and in allied transportation companies was accumulated rapidly and is freely spent during those days of prosperity in st Clair county bringing with it a high standard of domestic comfort in all this the edison shared on equal terms thus contrary to the stories that have been so widely published the edisons while not rich by any means were in comfortable circumstances with a well-stocked farm and large orchard to draw upon also for sustenance samuel edison on moving to port huron became a dealer in grain and feed and gave attention to that business for many years but he was also active in the lumber industry in the saginaw district and several other things it was difficult for a man of such mercurial restless temperament to stay constant to any one occupation in fact had he been less visionary 
he would have been more prosperous, but might not have had a son so gifted with insight and imagination. One instance of the optimistic vagaries, which led him incessantly to spend time and money on projects that would not have appealed to a man less sanguine, was the construction on his property of a wooden observation tower over a hundred feet high, the top of which was reached toilsomely by winding stairs, after the payment of twenty-five cents. It is true that the tower commanded a pretty view by land and water, but Colonel Sellers himself might have projected this enterprise as a possible source of steady income. At first, few visitors panted up the long flights of steps to the breezy platform. During the first two months, Edison's father took in three dollars, and felt extremely blue over the prospect, and to young Edison and his relatives were left the lonely pleasures of the lookout, and the enjoyment of the telescope with which it was equipped. But one fine day there came an excursion from an island town to see the lake. They picnicked in the grove, and six hundred of them went up to the tower. After that, the railroad company began to advertise these excursions, and the receipts each year paid for the observatory. It might be thought that, immersed in business and preoccupied with schemes of this character, Mr. Edison was to blame for the neglect of his son's education. But that was not the case. The conditions were peculiar. It was at the Port Huron Public School that Edison received all the regular scholastic instruction he ever enjoyed, just three months. He might have spent the full term there, but, as already noted, his teacher had found him addled. He was always, according to his own recollection, at the foot of the class, and had come almost to regard himself as a dunce, while his father entertained vague anxieties as to his stupidity. The truth of the matter seems to be that Mrs. Edison, a teacher of uncommon ability and force, held no very high opinion of the average public school methods and results, and was both eager to undertake the instruction of her son, and ambitious for the future of a boy, whom she knew, from a pedagogic experience, to be receptive and thoughtful to a very unusual degree. With her he found study easy and pleasant, the quality of culture in that simple but refined home, as well as the intellectual character of his youth without schooling, may be inferred from the fact that before he had reached the age of twelve, he had read, with his mother's help, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Hume's History of England, Sears' History of the World, Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, and the Dictionary of Sciences and had even attempted to struggle through Newton's Principia, whose mathematics were decidedly beyond both teacher and student. Besides, Edison, like Faraday, was never a mathematician, and has had little personal use for arithmetic beyond that which is called mental. He said once to a friend, I can always hire some mathematicians, but they can't hire me. His father, by the way, always encouraged these literary tastes, and paid him a small sum for each new book mastered. It will be noted that fiction makes no showing in the list, but it was not altogether excluded from the home library, and Edison has all his life enjoyed it, particularly the works of such writers as Victor Hugo, after whom, because of his enthusiastic admiration, possibly also because of his imagination, he was nicknamed by his fellow operators Victor Hugo Edison. Electricity, at that moment, could have no allure for a youthful mind. Crude telegraphy represented what was known of it practically. And about that the books read by young Edison were not redundantly informational. Even had that not been so, the inclinations of the boy barely ten years old were toward chemistry, and fifty years later there is seen no change of predilection. It sounds like heresy to say that Edison became an electrician by chance, but it is the sober fact that to this preeminent and brilliant leader in electrical achievement, escape into the chemical domain still has the aspect of a delightful truant holiday. One of the earliest stories about his boyhood relates to the incident when he induced a lad employed in the family to swallow a large quantity of Sedlitz powders in the belief that the gases generated would enable him to fly. 
the agonies of the victim attracted attention and edison's mother marked her displeasure by an application of the switch kept behind the old seth thomas grandfather clock the disastrous result of this experiment did not discourage edison at all and he attributed failure to the lad rather than to the motive power in the cellar of the edison homestead young alva soon accumulated a chemical outfit constituting the first in a long series of laboratories the word laboratory had always been associated with alchemists in the past but as with filament this untutored stripling applied an iconoclastic practicability to it long before he realized the significance of the new departure goethe in his legend of faust shows the traditional or conventional philosopher in his laboratory an aged tottering gray-bearded investigator who only becomes youthful upon diabolical intervention and would stay senile without it in the edison laboratory no such weird transformation has been necessary for the philosopher had youth fiery energy and a grimly practical determination that would submit to no denial of the goal of something of real benefit to mankind edison and faust are indeed the extremes of philosophic thought and accomplishment the home at poor huron thus saw the first edison laboratory the boy began experimenting when he was about ten or eleven years of age he got a copy of parker's school philosophy an elementary book on physics and about every experiment in it he tried young alva or al as he was called thus early displayed his great passion for chemistry and in the cellar of the house he collected no fewer than two hundred bottles gleaned in baskets from all parts of the town these were arranged carefully on shelves and all labeled poison so that no one else would handle or disturb them they contained the chemicals with which he was constantly experimenting to others this diversion was both mysterious and meaningless but he had soon become familiar with all the chemicals obtainable at the local drug stores and had tested to his satisfaction many of the statements encountered in his scientific reading edison has said that sometimes he has wondered how it was he did not become an analytical chemist instead of concentrating on electricity for which he had at first no great inclination deprived of the use of a large part of her cellar tiring of the mess always to be found there and somewhat fearful of results his mother once told the boy to clear everything out and restore order the thought of losing all his possessions was the cause of so much ardent distress that his mother relented but insisted that he must get a lock and key and keep the embryonic laboratory closed up all the time except when he was there this was done from such work came an early familiarity with the nature of electrical batteries and the production of current from them apparently the greater part of his spare time was spent in the cellar for he did not share to any extent in the sports of the boys of the neighborhood his chum and chief companion michael oates being a lad of dutch origin many years older who did chores around the house and who could be recruited as a general utility friday for the experiments of this young explorer such as that with the sedlitz powders such pursuits as these consumed the scant pocket money of the boy very rapidly he was not in regular attendance at school and had read all the books within reach it was thus he turned newsboy overcoming the reluctance of his parents particularly that of his mother by pointing out that he could by this means earn all he wanted for his experiments and get fresh reading in the shape of papers and magazines free of charge besides his leisure hours in detroit he would be able to spend at the public library he applied in eighteen fifty nine for the privilege of selling newspapers on the trains of the grand trunk railroad between port huron and detroit and obtained the concession after a short delay during which he made an essay in his task of selling newspapers edison had as a fact already had some commercial experience from the age of eleven the ten acres of the reservation offered an excellent opportunity for truck farming 
and the versatile head of the family, could not avoid trying his luck in this branch of work. A large market garden was laid out, in which Edison worked pretty steadily, with the help of the Dutch boy Michael Oates, he of the flying experiment. These boys had a horse and small wagon entrusted to them, and every morning in the season they would load up with onions, lettuce, peas, etc., and go through the town. As much as six hundred dollars was turned over to Mrs. Edison in one year from this source. The boy was indefatigable, but not altogether charmed with agriculture. After a while I tired of this work, as hoeing corn in a hot sun is unattractive, and I did not wonder that it had built up cities. Soon the Grand Trunk Railroad was extended from Toronto to Port Huron, at the foot of Lake Huron, and thence to Detroit, at about the same time the War of the Rebellion broke out. By a great amount of persistence, I got permission from my mother to go on the local train as a newsboy. The local train from Port Huron to Detroit, a distance of 63 miles, left at 7 a.m., and arrived again at 9.30 p.m. After being on the train for several months, I started two stores in Port Huron, one for periodicals and the other for vegetables, butter, and berries in the season. These were attended by two boys who shared in the profits. The periodical store I soon closed, as the boy in charge could not be trusted. The vegetable store I kept up for nearly a year. After the railroad had been opened a short time, they put on an express which left Detroit in the morning and returned in the evening. I received permission to put a newsboy on this train. Connected with this train was a car, one part for baggage and the other part for U.S. mail, but for a long time it was not used. Every morning I had two large baskets of vegetables from the Detroit market loaded in the mail car and sent to Port Huron, where the boy would take them to the store. They were much better than those grown locally and sold readily. I never was asked to pay freight, and to this day cannot explain why, except that I was so small and industrious, and the nerve to appropriate a U.S. mail card to do a free freight business was so monumental. However, I kept this up for a long time, and in addition bought butter from the farmers along the line, and an immense amount of blackberries in the season. I bought wholesale, and at a low price, and permitted the wives of the engineers and trainmen to have the benefit of the discount. After a while, there was a daily immigrant train put on. This train generally had from seven to ten coaches, filled always with Norwegians, all bound for Iowa and Minnesota. On these trains I employed a boy who sold bread, tobacco, and stick candy. As the war progressed, the daily newspaper sales became very profitable, and I gave up the vegetable store. The hours of this occupation were long, but the work was not particularly heavy, and Edison soon found opportunity for his favorite avocation, chemical experimentation. His train left Port Huron at 7 a.m. and made its southward trip to Detroit in about three hours. This gave a stay in that city from 10 a.m. until the late afternoon when the train left, arriving at Port Huron about 9.30 p.m. The train was made up of three coaches, baggage, smoking, and ordinary passenger, or ladies. The baggage car was divided into three compartments, one for trunks and packages, one for mail, and one for smoking. In those days, no use was made of the smoking compartment, as there was no ventilation, and it was turned over to young Edison, who not only kept papers there and his stock of goods as a candy butcher, but soon had it equipped with an extraordinary variety of apparatus. There was plenty of leisure on the two daily runs, even for an industrious boy, and thus he found time to transfer his laboratory from the cellar and re-establish it on the train. His earnings were also excellent, so good in fact, that eight or ten dollars a day were often taken in, and one dollar went every day to his mother. Thus supporting himself, he felt entitled to spend any other profit left over on chemicals and apparatus. And spent it was, for with access to Detroit and its large stores, where he bought his supplies, and to the public library, 
where he could quench his thirst for technical information, Edison gave up all his spare time and money to chemistry. Surely the country could have presented at that moment no more striking example of the passionate pursuit of knowledge under difficulties than this newsboy, barely fourteen years of age, with his jars and test tubes installed on a railway baggage car. Nor did this amazing equipment stop at batteries and bottles. The same little space, a few feet square, was soon converted by this precocious youth into a newspaper office. The outbreak of the Civil War gave a great stimulus to the demand for all newspapers, noticing which he became ambitious to publish a local journal of his own, devoted to the news of that section of the Grand Trunk Road. A small printing press that had been used for hotel bills of fare was picked up in Detroit, and type was also bought, some of it being placed on the train so that composition could go on in spells of leisure. To one so mechanical in his taste as Edison, it was quite easy to learn the rudiments of the printing art, and thus the weekly herald came into existence, of which he was compositor, pressman, editor, publisher, and news dealer. Only one or two copies of this journal are now discoverable, but its appearance can be judged from the reduced facsimile here shown. The thing was indeed well done as the work of a youth shown by the date to be less than fifteen years old. The literary style is good, there are only a few trivial slips in spelling, and the appreciation is keen of what would be interesting news and gossip. The price was three cents a copy, or eight cents a month for regular subscribers, and the circulation ran up to over four hundred copies an issue. This was by no means the result of mere public curiosity, but attested the value of the sheet as a genuine newspaper to which many persons in the railroad service along the line were willing contributors. Indeed, with the aid of the railway telegraph, Edison was often able to print late news of importance, of local origin, that the distant regular papers, like those of Detroit, which he handled as a newsboy, could not get. It is no wonder that this clever little sheet received the approval and patronage of the English engineer Stevenson when inspecting the Grand Trunk system, and was noted by no less distinguished a contemporary than the London Times as the first newspaper in the world to be printed on a train in motion. The youthful proprietor sometimes cleared as much as twenty to thirty dollars a month from this unique journalistic enterprise. But all this extra work required attention, and Edison solved the difficulty of attending also to the newsboy business by the employment of a young friend whom he trained and treated liberally as an understudy. There was often plenty of work for both in the early days of the war, when the news of battle caused intense excitement and large sales of papers. Edison, with native shrewdness already so strikingly displayed, would telegraph the station agents and get them to bulletin the event of the day at the front, so that when each station was reached there were eager purchasers waiting. He recalls in particular the sensation caused by the great battle of Shiloh, or Pittsburgh Landing, in April 1862, in which both Grant and Sherman were engaged, in which Johnston died, and in which there was a ghastly total of 25,000 killed and wounded. In describing his enterprising action that day, Edison says that when he reached Detroit, the bulletin boards of the newspaper offices were surrounded with dense crowds, which read awe-stricken the news that there were 60,000 killed and wounded, and that the result was uncertain. I knew that if the same excitement was attained at the small towns turned along the road, and especially at Port Huron, the sale of papers would be great. I then conceived the idea of telegraphing the news ahead, went to the operator in the depot, and by giving him Harper's Weekly and some other papers for three months, he agreed to telegraph to all the stations the matter on the bulletin board. I hurriedly copied it, and he sent it, requesting the agents to display it on the blackboards used for stating the arrival and departure of trains. I decided that instead of the usual one hundred papers, I could sell one thousand, 
but not having sufficient money to purchase that number, I determined in my desperation to see the editor himself and get credit. The great paper at that time was the Detroit Free Press. I walked into the office marked editorial and told a young man that I wanted to see the editor on important business, important to me anyway. I was taken into an office where there were two men, and I stated what I had done about telegraphing, and that I needed a thousand papers, but only had money for three hundred, and I wanted credit. One of the men refused it, but the other told the first spokesman to let me have them. This man, I afterward learned, was Wilbur F. Story, who subsequently founded the Chicago Times and became celebrated in the newspaper world. By the aid of another boy, I lugged the papers to the train and started folding them. The first station, called Utica, was a small one where I generally sold two papers. I saw a crowd ahead on the platform and I thought it some excursion, but the moment I landed there was a rush for me, and I realized that the telegraph was a great invention. I sold thirty-five papers there. The next station was Mount Clemens, now a watering place, but then a town of about one thousand. I usually sold six to eight papers there. I decided that if I found a corresponding crowd there, the only thing to do to correct my lack of judgment and not getting more papers was to raise the price from five cents to ten. The crowd was there, and I raised the price. At the various towns there were corresponding crowds. It had been my practice at Port Huron to jump from the train at a point about one-fourth of a mile from the station, where the train generally slackened speed. I had drawn several loads of sand to this point to jump on, and had become quite expert. The little Dutch boy with the horse met me at this point. When the wagon approached the outskirts of the town, I was met by a large crowd. I then yelled, Twenty-five cents apiece, gentlemen. I haven't enough to go around. I sold all out and made what to me was then an immense sum of money. Such episodes as this added materially to his income, but did not necessarily increase his savings, for he was then, as now, an utter spendthrift, so long as some new apparatus or supplies for experiment could be had. In fact, the laboratory on wheels soon became crowded with such equipment, most costly chemicals were bought on the installment plan, and Fresenius's qualitative analysis served as a basis for ceaseless testing and study. George Pullman, who then had a small shop at Detroit and was working on his sleeping car, made Edison a lot of wooden apparatus for his chemicals, to the boy's delight. Unfortunately, a sudden change came, fraught with disaster. The train, running one day at thirty miles an hour over a piece of poorly laid track, was thrown suddenly out of the perpendicular with a violent lurch, and before Edison could catch it, a stick of phosphorus was jarred from its shelf, fell to the floor, and burst into flame. The car took fire, and the boy, in dismay, was still trying to quench the blaze when a conductor, a quick-tempered Scotchman, who acted also as a baggage master, hastened to the scene with water and saved his car. On the arrival at Mount Clemens Station, its next stop, Edison and his entire outfit, laboratory, printing plant, and all, were promptly ejected by the enraged conductor, and the train then moved off, leaving him on the platform, tearful and indignant in the midst of his beloved but ruined possessions. It was lynch law of a kind, but in view of the responsibility, this action of the conductor lay well within his rights and duties. It was through this incident that Edison acquired the deafness that has persisted all through his life. A severe box on the ears from the scorched and angry conductor being the direct cause of the infirmity. Although this deafness would be regarded as a great affliction by most people, and has brought in its train other serious baubles, Mr. Edison has always regarded it philosophically, and said about it recently, This deafness has been a great advantage to me in various ways. When in a telegraph office, I could only hear the instrument directly on the table at which I sat, and unlike the other operators, I was not bothered by the other instruments. Again, in experimenting on the telephone, I had to improve the transmitter so I could hear it. This made the telephone commercial, 
as the magnetotelephone receiver of Bell was too weak to be used as a transmitter commercially. It was the same with the phonograph. The great defect of that instrument was the rendering of the overtones in music and the hissing consonants in speech. I worked over one year, twenty hours a day, Sundays and all, to get the word specie perfectly recorded and reproduced on the phonograph. When this was done, I knew that everything else could be done, which was a fact. Again, my nerves have been preserved intact. Broadway is as quiet to me as a country village is to a person with normal hearing. Saddened but not wholly discouraged, Edison soon reconstituted his laboratory and printing office at home. Although on the part of the family there was some fear and objection after this episode on the score of fire, but Edison promised not to bring in anything of a dangerous nature. He did not cease the publication of the Weekly Herald. On the contrary, he prospered in both his enterprises until persuaded by the printer's devil in the office of the Port Huron Commercial to change the character of his journal, enlarge it, and issue it under the name of Paul Pry, a happy designation for this or kindred ventures in the domain of society journalism. No copies of Paul Pry can now be found, but it is known that its style was distinctly personal, that gossip was its specialty, and that no small offense was given to the people whose peculiarities or peccadilloes were discussed in a frank and breezy style by the two boys. In one instant the resentment of the victim of such onslaught publicity was so intense he laid hands on Edison and pitched the startled young editor into the St. Clair River. The name of this violator of the freedom of the press was thereafter excluded studiously from the columns of Paul Pry, and the incident may have been one of those which soon caused the abandonment of the paper. Edison had great zest in this work, and but for the strong influences in other directions would probably have continued in the newspaper field, in which he was, beyond question, the youngest publisher and editor of the day. Before leaving this period of his career, it is to be noted that it gave Edison many favorable opportunities. In Detroit, he could spend frequent hours in the public library, and it is matter of record that he began his liberal acquaintance with its contents by grappling bravely with a certain section and trying to read it through consecutively, shelf by shelf, regardless of subject. In a way, this is curiously suggestive of the earnest, energetic method of frontal attack with which the inventor has since addressed himself to so many problems in the arts and sciences. The Grand Trunk Railroad machine shops at Port Huron were a great attraction to the boy, who appears to have spent a good deal of his time there. He, who was to have much to do with the evolution of the modern electric locomotive, was fascinated by the mechanism of the steam locomotive, and whenever he could get the chance, Edison rode in the cab with the engineer of his train. He became thoroughly familiar with the intricacies of firebox, boiler, valves, levers, and gears, and liked nothing better than to handle the locomotive himself during the run. On one trip, when the engineer lay asleep while his eager substitute piloted the train, the boiler primed, and a deluge overwhelmed the young driver, who stuck to his post till the run and the ordeal were ended. Possibly this helped to spoil a locomotive engineer, but went to make a great master of the new motive power. Steam is half an Englishman, said Emerson. The temptation is strong to say that workaday electricity is half an American. Edison's own account of the incident is very laughable. The engine was one of a number leased to the Grand Trunk by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy. It had bright brass bands all over, the woodwork beautifully painted, and everything highly polished, which was the custom up to the time old Commodore Vanderbilt stopped it on his roads. After running about fifteen miles, the fireman couldn't keep his eyes open. This event followed an all-night dance of the trainman's fraternal organization, and he agreed to permit me to run the engine. I took charge, reducing the speed to about twelve miles an hour, and brought the train of seven cars to her destination at the Grand Trunk Junction safely. But something occurred which was very much out of the ordinary. 
I was very much worried about the water, and I knew that if it got low the boiler was likely to explode. I hadn't gone twenty miles before the black damp mud blew out of the stack and covered every part of the engine, including myself. I was about to awaken the fireman to find out the cause of this when it stopped. Then I approached a station where the fireman always went out to the cow catcher, opened up the oil cup on the steam chest, and poured oil in. I started to carry out the procedure when, upon opening the oil cup, the steam rushed out with a tremendous noise, nearly knocking me off the engine. I succeeded in closing the oil cup and got back in the cab and made up my mind that she would pull through without oil. I learned afterward that the engineer always shut off steam when the fireman went out to oil. This point I failed to notice. My powers of observation were very much improved after this occurrence. Just before I reached the junction, another outpour of black mud occurred, and the whole engine was a sight, so much that when I pulled into the yard, everybody turned to see it, laughing immoderately. I found the reason of the mud was that I carried so much water it passed over into the stack, and this washed out all the accumulated soot. One afternoon, about a week before Christmas, Edison's train jumped the track near Utica, a station on the line. Four old Michigan Central cars with rotten sills collapsed in the ditch and went all to pieces, distributing figs, raisins, dates, and candies all over the track and the vicinity. Hating to see so much waste, Edison tried to save all he could by eating it on the spot, but as a result, our family doctor had the time of his life with me in this connection. An absurd incident described by Edison throws a vivid light on the free and easy condition of early railroad travel and on the southern extravagance of the time. In 1860, just before the war broke out, there came to the train one afternoon in Detroit two fine-looking young men accompanied by a colored servant. They bought tickets for Port Huron, the terminal point for the train. After leaving the junction just outside of Detroit, I brought in the evening papers. When I came opposite to the young man, one of them said, Boy, what have you got? I said, Papers. All right. He took them and threw them out the window, and turning to the colored man said, Nicodemus, pay this boy. I told Nicodemus the amount, and he opened a satchel and paid me. The passengers didn't know what to make of the transaction. I returned with the illustrated papers and magazines. These were seized and thrown out of the window, and I was told to get my money of Nicodemus. I then returned with all the old magazines and novels I had not been able to sell, thinking perhaps this would be too much for them. I was small and thin, and the layer reached above my head, and was all I could possibly carry. I had prepared a list, and knew the amount in case they bit again. When I opened the door, all the passengers roared with laughter. I walked right up to the young men. One asked me what I had. I said, magazines and novels. He promptly threw them out of the window, and Nicodemus settled. Then I came in with cracked hickory nuts, then popcorn balls, and finally molasses candy. All went out of the window. I felt like Alexander the Great. I had no more chance. I had sold all I had. Finally, I put a rope to my trunk, which is about the size of a carpenter's chest, and started to pull this from the baggage car to the passenger car. It was almost too much for my strength, but at last I got in front of those men. I pulled off my coat, shoes, and hat, and laid them on the chest. Then he asked, What have you got, boy? I said, Everything, sir, that I can spare that is for sale. The passengers fairly jumped with laughter. Nicodemus paid me twenty-seven dollars for this last sale, and threw the hole out of the door in the rear of the car. These men were from the south and I have always retained a soft spot in my heart for a southern gentleman. While Edison was a newsboy on the train, a request came to him one day to go to the office of E.B. Ward and Company, at that time the largest owners of steamboats on the Great Lakes. The captain of their largest boat had died suddenly, and they wanted a message taken to another captain who lived about fourteen miles from Ridgeway Station on the railroad. This captain had retired, taken up some lumber land, and had cleared part of it. Edison was offered fifteen dollars by Mr. Ward to go and fetch him, but it was a wild country and would be dark. 
Edison stood out for twenty-five, so that he could get the companionship of another lad. The terms were agreed to. Edison arrived at Ridgeway at 8.30 p.m., when it was raining and as dark as ink. Getting another boy with difficulty to volunteer, he launched out on his errand in the pitch-black night. The two boys carried lanterns, but the road was a rough path through dense forest. The country was wild, and it was a usual occurrence to see deer, bear, and coonskins nailed up on the sides of houses to dry. Edison had read about bears, but couldn't remember whether they were day or night prowlers. The farther they went, the more apprehensive they became, and every stump in the ravished forage looked like a bear. The other lad proposed seeking safety up a tree, but Edison demurred on the plea that bears could climb, and that the message must be delivered that night to enable the captain to catch the morning train. First one lantern went out, then the other. We leaned up against a tree and cried. I thought if I ever got out of that scrape alive, I would know more about the habits of animals and everything else, and be prepared for all kinds of mischance when I undertook an enterprise. However, the intense darkness dilated the pupils of our eyes so as to make them very sensitive, and we could just see at times the outlines of the road. Finally, just as a faint gleam of daylight arrived, we entered the captain's yard and delivered the message. In my whole life, I never spent such a night of horror as this, but I got a good lesson. An amusing incident of this period is told by Edison. When I was a boy, he says, the Prince of Wales, the late King Edward, came to Canada, 1860. Great preparations were made at Sarnia, the Canadian town opposite Port Huron. About every boy, including myself, went over to see the affair. The town was draped in flags most profusely, and carpets were laid on the crosswalks for the prince to walk on. There were arches, etc. A stand was built, raised above the general level, where the prince was to be received by the mayor. Seeing all these preparations, my idea of a prince was very high. But when he did arrive, I mistook the Duke of Newcastle for him, the Duke being a fine-looking man. I soon saw that I was mistaken, that the prince was a young stripling, and did not meet expectations. Several of us expressed our belief that a prince wasn't much, after all, and said that we were thoroughly disappointed. For this one boy was whipped. Soon the Canuck boys attacked the Yankee boys, and we were all badly licked. I myself got a black eye. That has always prejudiced me against that kind of ceremonial and folly. It is certainly interesting to note that in later years the prince for whom Edison endured the ignominy of a black eye made generous compensation in a graceful letter accompanying the gold Albert medal awarded by the Royal Society of Arts. Another incident of the period is as follows. After selling papers in Port Huron, which was often not reached until about 9.30 at night, I seldom got home before 11 or 11.30. About halfway home from the station in the town, and within 25 feet of the road in a dense wood, was a soldier's graveyard, where 300 soldiers were buried, due to a cholera epidemic which took place at Fort Gratiot nearby many years previously. At first we used to shut our eyes and run the horse past this graveyard, and if the horse stepped on a twig, my heart would give a violent movement, and it is a wonder that I haven't some valvular disease of that organ. But soon this running of the horse became monotonous, and after a while all fears of graveyards absolutely disappeared from my system. I was in the condition of Sam Houston, the pioneer and founder of Texas, who, it was said, knew no fear. Houston lived some distance from the town, and generally went home late at night, having to pass through a dark cypress swamp over a corduroy road. One night, to test his alleged fearlessness, a man stationed himself behind a tree and enveloped himself in a sheet. He confronted Houston suddenly, and Sam stopped and said, If you are a man, you can't hurt me. If you are a ghost, you don't want to hurt me. And if you are the devil, come home with me. I married your sister. It is not to be inferred, however, from some of the preceding statements, that the boy was of an exclusively studious bent of mind. He had then, as now, the keen enjoyment of a joke, 
and no particular aversion to the practical form. An incident of the time is in point. After breaking out of the war, there was a regiment of volunteer soldiers quartered at Fort Gratiot, the reservation extending to the boundary line of our house. Nearly every night we would hear a call, such as Corporal of the Guard Number 1. This would be repeated from sentry to sentry until it reached the barracks, when Corporal of the Guard Number 1 would come and see what was wanted. I and the little Dutch boy, after returning from the town after selling our papers, thought we would take a hand at military affairs. So one night, when it was very dark, I shouted for Corporal of the Guard Number 1. The second sentry, thinking it was the terminal sentry who shouted, repeated it to the third, and so on. This brought the corporal along the half-mile, only to find that he was fooled. We tried him three nights, but on the third night they were watching, and caught the little Dutch boy, took him to the lock-up at the fort, and shut him up. They chased me to the house. I rushed for the cellar. In one small apartment there were two barrels of potatoes, and a third one nearly empty. I poured these remnants into the other barrels, sat down, and pulled the barrel over my head, bottom up. The soldiers had awakened my father, and they were searching for me with candles and lanterns. The corporal was absolutely certain I came into the cellar, and couldn't see how I could have gotten out, and wanted to know from my father if there was no secret hiding place. On the assurance of my father, who said that there was not, he said it was most extraordinary. I was glad when they left, as I was cramped, and the potatoes were rotten that had been in the barrel, and violently offensive. The next morning I was found in bed, and received a good switching on the legs from my father, the first and only one I ever received from him, although my mother kept a switch behind the old Seth Thomas clock that had the bark worn off. My mother's ideas and mine differed at times, especially when I got experimenting and mussed up things. The Dutch boy was released next morning. End of chapter 3 Recording by Alana Jordan in the United States of America Chapter 4 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jude Cater Edison, His Life and Inventions By Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 4. The Young Telegraph Operator While a newsboy on the railroad, says Edison, I got very much interested in electricity, probably from visiting telegraph offices with a chum who had tastes similar to mine. It will also have been noted that he used the telegraph to get items for his little journal and to bulletin his special news of the Civil War along the line. The next step was natural and having with his knowledge of chemistry no trouble about setting up his batteries, the difficulties of securing apparatus were chiefly those connected with the circuits and the instruments. American youths today are given, if of a mechanical turn of mind, to amateur telegraphy or telephony, but seldom, if ever, have to make any part of the system constructed. In Edison's boyish days it was quite different, and telegraphic supplies were hard to obtain. But he and his chum had a line between their homes built of common stovepipe wire. The insulators were bottles set on nails driven into trees and short poles. The magnet wire was wound with rags for insulation, and pieces of spring brass were used for keys. With an idea of securing current cheaply, Edison applied the little that he knew about static electricity and actually experimented with cats, which he treated vigorously as frictional machines until the animals fled in dismay. And Edison had learned his first great lesson in the relative value of sources of electrical energy. The line was made to work, however, 
and additional to the messages that the boys interchanged edison secured practice in an ingenious manner his father insisted on eleven thirty as proper bedtime which left but a short interval after the long day on the train but each evening when the boy went home with a bundle of papers that had not been sold in the town his father would sit up reading the returnables edison therefore on some excuse left the papers with his friend but suggested that he could get the news from him by telegraph bit by bit the scheme interested his father and was put into effect the messages being written down and handed over for perusal this yielded good practice nightly lasting until twelve and one o'clock and was maintained for some time until mr edison became willing that his son should stay up for a reasonable time the papers were then brought home again and the boys amused themselves to their hearts content until the line was pulled down by a stray cow wandering through the orchard meantime better instruments had been secured and the rudiments of telegraphy had been fairly mastered the mixed train on which edison was employed as newsboy did the way freight work in shunting at the mount clemens station about half an hour being usually spent in the work one august morning in eighteen sixty two while the shunting was in progress and a laden box car had been pushed out of a siding edison who was loitering about the platform saw the little son of the station agent mr j u mackenzie playing with the gravel on the main track along which the car without a brakeman was rapidly approaching edison dropped his papers in his glazed cap and made a dash for the child whom he picked up and lifted to safety without a second to spare as the wheel of the car struck his heel and both were cut about the face and hands by the gravel ballast on which they fell the two boys were picked up by the train hands and carried to the platform and the grateful father at once offered to teach the rescuer whom he knew and liked the art of train telegraphy and to make an operator of him it is needless to say that the proposal was eagerly accepted edison found time for his new studies by letting one of his friends look after the newsboy work on the train for part of the trip reserving to himself the run between port huron and mount clemens that he was already well qualified as a beginner is evident from the fact that he had mastered the morse code of the telegraphic alphabet and was able to take to the station a neat little set of instruments he had just finished with his own hands at a gun shop in detroit this was probably a unique achievement in itself among railway operators of that day or of later times the drill of the student involved chiefly the acquisition of the special signals employed in railway work including the numerals and abbreviations applied to save time some of these have passed into the slang of the day seventy three being well known as the telegrapher's expression of compliments or good wishes while twenty three is an accident or death message and has been given broader popular significance as a general synonym for hoodoo all of this came easily to edison who had moreover as his herald showed an unusual familiarity with train movement along that portion of the grand trunk road three or four months were spent pleasantly and profitably by the youth in this course of study and edison took to it enthusiastically giving it no less than eighteen hours a day he then put up a little telegraph line from the station to the village a distance of about a mile and opened an office in a drug store but the business was naturally very small the telegraph operator at port huron knowing of his proficiency and wanting to get into the united states military telegraph corps where the pay in those days of the civil war was high succeeded in convincing his brother-in-law mr m walker that young edison could fill the position edison was of course well acquainted with the operators along the road and at the southern terminal and took up his new duties very easily the office was located in a jewelry store where newspapers and periodicals were also sold edison was to be found at the office both day and night sleeping there i became quite valuable to mr walker after working all day i worked at the office nights as well for the reason that press report came over one of the wires until three a m and i would cut in and copy it as well as i could to become more rapidly proficient 
The goal of the rural telegraph operator was to be able to take press. Mr. Walker tried to get my father to apprentice me at $20 per month, but they could not agree. I then applied for a job on the Grand Trunk Railroad as railway operator and was given a place, nights, at Stratford Junction, Canada. Apparently his friend Mackenzie helped him in the matter. The position carried a salary of $25 per month. No serious objections were raised by his family, for the distance from Port Huron was not great, and Stratford was near Bayfield, the old home from which the Edisons had come, so that there were doubtless friends or even relatives in the vicinity. This was in 1863. Mr. Walker was an observant man, who has since that time installed a number of waterwork systems and obtained several patents of his own. He describes the boy of sixteen as engrossed intensely in his experiments and scientific reading, and somewhat indifferent for this reason, to his duties as operator. This office was not particularly busy, taking from fifty to seventy-five dollars a month, but even the messages taken in would remain unsent on the hook while Edison was in the cellar below, trying to solve some chemical problem. The manager would see him studying sometimes an article in such a paper as The Scientific American, and then disappearing to buy a few sundries for experiments. Returning from the drugstore with his chemicals, he would not be seen again until required by his duties, or until he had found out for himself, if possible, in this offhand manner, whether what he had read was correct or not. When he had completed his experiment, all interest in it was lost, and the jars and wires would be left to any fate that might befall them. In like manner, Edison would make free use of the watchmaker's tools that lay on the little table in the front window, and would take the wire players there without much thought as to their value, as distinguished from a lineman's tools. The one idea was to do quickly what he wanted to do, in the same swift, almost headlong trial of anything that comes to hand, while the fervor of a new experiment is felt, has been noted at all stages of the inventor's career. One is reminded of Palissy's recklessness, when, in his efforts to make the enamel melt on his pottery, he used the very furniture of his home for firewood. Mr. Edison remarks the fact that there was very little difference between the telegraph of that time and of today except the general use of the old Morse register with the dots and dashes recorded by indenting paper strips that could be read and checked later at leisure if necessary. He says, The telegraph men couldn't explain how it worked, and I was always trying to get them to do so. I think they couldn't. I remember the best explanation I got was from an old Scotch line repairer employed by the Montreal Telegraph Company, which operated the railroad wires. He said that if you had a dog like a dachshund, long enough to reach from Edinburgh to London, if you pulled his tail in Edinburgh, he would bark in London. I could understand that, but I never could get it through me what went through the dog or over the wire. Today, Mr. Edison is just as unable to solve the inner mystery of electrical transmission. Nor is he alone. At the banquet given to celebrate his jubilee in 1896 as professor at Glasgow University, Lord Kelvin, the greatest physicist of our time, admitted with tears in his eyes and the note of tragedy in his voice that when it came to explaining the nature of electricity, he knew just as little as when he had begun as a student, and felt almost as though his life had been wasted when he tried to grapple with the great mystery of physics. Another episode of this period is curious in its revelation of the tenacity with which Edison has always held to some of his oldest possessions with a sense of personal attachment. While working at Stratford Junction, he says, I was told by one of the freight conductors that in the freight house at Goodrich there were several boxes of old broken-up batteries. I went there and found over 80 cells of the well-known Grove nitric acid battery. The operator there, who was also agent, when asked by me if I could have the electrodes of each cell, made of sheet platinum, gave his permission readily, thinking they were of tin. I removed them all, amounting to several ounces. 
platinum even in those days was very expensive costing several dollars an ounce and i owned only three small strips i was overjoyed at this acquisition and those very strips and the reworked scrap are used to this day in my laboratory over forty years later. It was at Stratford that Edison's inventiveness was first displayed. The hours of work of a night operator are usually from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., and to ensure attention while on duty it is often provided that the operator every hour from 9 p.m. until relieved by the day operator shall send in the signal 6 to the train dispatcher's office. Edison reveled in the opportunity for study and experiment given him by his long hours of freedom in the daytime, but needed sleep just as any healthy youth does. Confronted by the necessity of sending in this watchman's signal as evidence that he was awake and on duty, he constructed a small wheel with notches on the rim and attached to it the clock in such a manner that the night watchman could start it when the line was quiet, and at each hour the wheel revolved and sent in accurately the dots required for the sixing. The invention was a success, the device being, indeed, similar to that of the modern district messenger box, but it was soon noticed that, in spite of the regularity of the report, S.F. could not be raised even if a train message were sent immediately after. Detection and a reprimand came in due course, but were not taken very seriously. A serious occurrence that might have resulted in accident drove him soon after from Canada, although the youth could hardly be held to blame for it. Edison says, This night job just suited me, as I could have the whole day to myself. I had the faculty of sleeping in a chair any time for a few minutes at a time. I taught the night yardman my call so I could get a half hour's sleep now and then between trains, and in case the station was called, the watchman would awaken me. One night I got an order to hold a freight train, and I replied that I would. I rushed out to find the signalman, but before I could find him and get the signal set, the train ran past. I ran to the telegraph office and reported that I could not hold her. The reply was, Hell! The train dispatcher, on the strength of my message that I would hold the train, had permitted another to leave the last station in the opposite direction. There was a lower station near the junction where the day operator slept. I started for it on foot. The night was dark, and I fell into a culvert and was knocked senseless. Owing to the vigilance of the two engineers on the locomotives who saw each other approaching on the straight single track, Nothing more dreadful happened than a summons to the thoughtless operator to appear before the general manager at Toronto. On reaching the manager's office, his trial for neglect of duty was fortunately interrupted by the call of two Englishmen, and while their conversation proceeded, Edison slipped quietly out of the room, hurried to the Grand Trunk Freight Depot, found a conductor he knew taking out a freight train for Sarnia, and then was not happy until the ferry boat from Sarnia had landed him once more on the Michigan shore. The Grand Trunk still owes Mr. Edison the wages due him at the time he thus withdrew from its service, but the claim has never been pressed. The same winter of 1863-64, while at Port Huron, Edison had a further opportunity of displaying his ingenuity. An ice jam had broken the light telegraph cable laid in the bed of the river across to Sarnia, and thus communication was interrupted. The river is three-quarters of a mile wide and could not be crossed on foot, nor could the cable be repaired. Edison at once suggested using the steam whistle of the locomotive, and by manipulating the valve, conversed the long and short outbursts of shrill sound into the Morse code. An operator on the Sarnia shore was quick enough to catch the significance of the strange whistling, and messages were thus sent in wireless fashion across the ice flows in the river. It is said that such signals were also interchanged by military telegraphers during the war, and possibly Edison may have heard of the practice. But be that as it may, he certainly showed ingenuity and resource in applying such a method to meet the necessity. It is interesting to note that at this point the Grand Trunk now has its St. Clair Tunnel, through which the trains are hauled under the riverbed by electric locomotives. 
Edison had now begun unconsciously the roaming and drifting that took him during the next five years all over the Middle States, and that might well have wrecked the career of anyone less persistent and industrious. It was a period of his life corresponding to the Wanderhare of the German artisan, and it was an easy way of gratifying a taste for travel without the risk of privation. Today there is little temptation to the telegrapher to go to distant parts of the country on the chance that he may secure a livelihood at the quay. The ranks are well filled everywhere, and of late years the telegraph as an art or industry has shown relatively slight expansion, owing chiefly to the development of telephony. Hence, if vacancies occur, there are plenty of operators available, and salaries have remained so low as to lead to one or two formidable and costly strikes that unfortunately took no account of the economic conditions of demand and supply. But in the days of the Civil War, there was a great dearth of skillful manipulators of the key. About 1,500 of the best operators in the country were at the front on the federal side alone, and several hundred more had enlisted. This created a serious scarcity, and a nomadic operator going to any telegraphic center would be sure to find a place open waiting for him. At the close of the war, a majority of those who had been with the two opposed armies remained at the quay under more peaceful surroundings. But the rapid development of the commercial and railroad systems fostered a new demand, and then for a time it seemed almost impossible to train new operators fast enough. In a few years, however, the telephone sprang into vigorous existence, dating from 1876, drawing off some of the most adventurous spirits from the telegraph field and the deterrent influence of the telephone on the telegraph had made itself felt by 1890. The expiration of the leading Bell telephone patents five years later accentuated even more sharply the check that had been put on telegraphy, as hundreds and thousands of independent telephone companies were then organized, growing a vast network of toll lines over Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, and other states in affording cheap, instantaneous means of communication without any necessity for the intervention of an operator. It will be seen that the times have changed radically since Edison became a telegrapher, and that in this respect a chapter of electrical history had been definitely closed. There was a day when the art offered a distinct career to all of its practitioners, and young men of ambition and good family were eager to begin even as messenger boys and were ready to undergo a severe ordeal of apprenticeship with the belief that they could ultimately attain positions of responsibility and profit. At the same time, operators have always been shrewd enough to regard the telegraph as a stepping stone to other careers in life. A bright fellow entering the telegraph service today finds the experience he may gain therein valuable, but he soon realizes that there are not enough good-paying official positions to go around so as to give each worthy man a chance after he has mastered the essentials of the art. He feels, therefore, that to remain at the key involves either stagnation or deterioration, and that after, say, twenty-five years of practice, he will have lost ground as compared with friends who started out in other occupations. The craft of an operator, learned without much difficulty, is very attractive to a youth, but a position at the key is no place for a man of mature years. His services, with rare exceptions, grow less valuable as he advances in age and nervous strain breaks him down. On the contrary, men engaged in other professions find, as a rule, that they improve in advance with experience, and that age brings larger rewards and opportunities. The list of well-known Americans who have been graduates of the key is indeed an extraordinary one and there is no department of our national life in which they have not distinguished themselves. The contrast in this respect between them and their European colleagues is highly significant. In Europe, the telegraph systems are all under government management. The operators have strictly limited spheres of promotion, and at the best, the transition from one kind of employment to another is not made so easily as in the New World. But in the United States, we have seen Rufus Bullock become governor of Georgia, and Ezra Cornell governor of New York. Marshall Jewell was postmaster general of President Grant's cabinet, 
and Daniel Lamont was Secretary of State in President Cleveland's. General T. T. Eckert, past President of the Western Union Telegraph Company, was Assistant Secretary of War under President Lincoln. And Robert J. Wynne, afterward a Consul General, served as Assistant Postmaster General. A very large proportion of the presidents and leading officials of the great railroad systems are old telegraphers, including Messrs. W. C. Brown, President of the New York Central Railroad, and Marvin Hewitt, President of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. In industrial and financial life, there have been Theodore N. Vail, President of the Bell Telephone System, L. C. Wire, late President of the Adams Express, A. B. Chandler, President of the Postal Telegraph and Cable Company, Sir W. Van Home, identified with Canadian development, Robert C. Clowry, President of the Western Union Telegraph Company, D. H. Bates, Manager of the Baltimore and Ohio Telegraph for Robert Garrett, and Andrew Carnegie, the greatest iron master the world has ever known, as well as its greatest philanthropist. In journalism, there have been leaders like Edward Rosewater, founder of the Omaha Bee, W. J. Elverson of the Philadelphia Press, and Frank A. Munsey, publisher of a half-dozen big magazines. George Kennan has achieved fame in literature, and Guy Carleton and Henry D. Suchet have been successful as dramatists. These are but typical of hundreds of men who could be named who have risen from work at the key to become recognized leaders in differing spheres of activity. But roving has never been favorable to the formation of steady habits. The young men who thus floated about the country from one telegraph office to another were often brilliant operators, noted for speed in sending and receiving, but they were undisciplined, were without the restraining influences of home life, and were so highly paid for their work that they could indulge freely in dissipation if inclined that way. Subjected to nervous tension for hours together at the key, many of them unfortunately took to drink, and having ended one engagement in a city by a debauch that closed the doors of the office to them, would drift away to the nearest town, and there securing work, would repeat the performance. At one time, indeed, these men were so numerous and so much in evidence as to constitute a type that the public was disposed to accept as representative of the telegraphic fraternity. But as the conditions creating him ceased to exist, the tramp operator also passed into history. It was, however, among such characters that Edison was very largely thrown in these early days of aimless drifting, to learn something perhaps of their nonchalant philosophy of life, sharing bed and board with them under all kinds of adverse conditions, but always maintaining a stoic abstemiousness, and never feeling other than a keen regret at the waste of so much genuine ability and kindliness on the part of those knights errant of the key, whose inevitable fate might so easily have been his own. Such a class or group of men can always be presented by an individual type, and this is assuredly best embodied in Melton F. Adams, one of Edison's earliest and closest friends, to whom reference will be made in later chapters, and whose life has been so full of adventurous episodes that he might well be regarded as the modern Gil Blass. That career is certainly well worth telling as another story, to use the Kipling phrase. Of him, Edison says, Adams was one of a class of operators never satisfied to work at any place for any great length of time. He had wanderlust. After enjoying hospitality in Boston in 1868-69 on the floor of my hall bedroom, which was a paradise for the entomologist, while the boarding house itself was run on the banting system of flesh reduction, he came to me one day and said, "'Goodbye, Edison.' I have got sixty cents, and I am going to San Francisco. And he did go. How? I never knew, personally. I learned afterward that he got a job there, and then, within a week, they had a telegrapher's strike. He got a big torch and sold patent medicine on the streets at night to support the strikers. Then he went to Peru as partner of a man who had a grizzly bear, which they proposed entering against a bull in the bull ring in that city. The grizzly was killed in five minutes, and so the scheme died. 
Then Adams crossed the Andes and started a market report bureau in Buenos Aires. This didn't pay, so he started a restaurant in Pernambuco, Brazil. There he did very well, but something went wrong, as it always does to a nomad. So he went to the Transvaal and ran a panorama called Paradise Lost in the Kaffir Kraals. This didn't pay, and he became the editor of a newspaper then went to England to raise money for a railroad in Cape Colony. Next I heard of him in New York, having just arrived from Bogota, United States of Columbia, with a power of attorney and $2,000 from a native of that republic, who had applied for a patent for tightening a belt to prevent it from slipping on a pulley, a device which he thought a new and great invention, but which was in use ever since machinery was invented. I gave Adams then a position as salesman for electrical apparatus. This he soon got tired of, and I lost sight of him. Adams, in speaking of this episode, says that when he asked for transportation expenses to St. Louis, Edison pulled out of his pocket a ferry ticket to Hoboken and said to his associates, I'll give him that, and he'll get there all right. This was in the early days of electric lighting but down to the present moment the peregrinations of this versatile genius of the key have never ceased in one hemisphere or the other, so that as Mr. Adams himself remarked to the authors in April 1908, the life has been somewhat variegated, but never dull. The fact remains also that throughout this period, Edison, while himself a very Ishmael, never ceased to study, explore, experiment. Referring to this beginning of his career, he mentions a curious fact that throws light on his ceaseless application. After I became a telegraph operator, he says, I practiced for a long time to become a rapid reader of print, and got so expert I could sense the meaning of a whole line at once. This faculty, I believe, should be taught in schools, as it appears to be easily acquired. Then one can read two or three books in a day, whereas if each word at a time only is sensed, reading is laborious. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Edison: His Life and Inventions》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison: His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin — Chapter Five Arduous Years in the Central West In 1903, when accepting the position of honorary electrician to the International Exposition held in St. Louis in 1904, to commemorate the centenary of the Louisiana Purchase, Mr. Edison spoke in his letter of the Central West as a region where, as a young telegraph operator, I spent many arduous years before moving east. The term of probation thus referred to did not end until 1868, and while it lasted, Edison's wanderings carried him from Detroit to New Orleans, and took him, among other cities, to Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Louisville, and Memphis, some of which he visited twice in his peregrinations to secure work. From Canada, after the episodes noted in the last chapter, he went to Adrian, Michigan, and of what happened there Edison tells a story typical of his wanderings for several years to come. After leaving my first job at Stratford Junction, I got a position as operator on the Lake Shore and Michigan Southern at Adrian, Michigan, in the division superintendent's office. As usual, I took the night trick, which most operators disliked, but which I preferred, as it gave me more leisure to experiment. I had obtained from the station agent a small room, and had established a little shop of my own. One day, the day operator wanted to get off, and I was on duty. About nine o'clock the superintendent handed me a dispatch, which he said was very important, and I must get off at once. The wire at the time was very busy, and I asked if I should break in. I got orders to do so, and acting under those orders of the superintendent, 
I broke in and tried to send the dispatch. But the other operator would not permit it, and the struggle continued for ten minutes. Finally, I got possession of the wire and sent the message. The superintendent of the telegraph, who then lived in Adrian and went to his office in Toledo every day, happened that day to be in the Western Union office uptown, and it was the superintendent I was really struggling with. In about twenty minutes he arrived livid with rage, and I was discharged on the spot. I informed him that the general superintendent had told me to break in and send the dispatch, but the general superintendent then and there repudiated the whole thing. Their families were socially close, so I was sacrificed. My faith in human nature got a slight jar. Edison then went to Toledo and secured a position at Fort Wayne on the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago Railroad, now leased to the Pennsylvania system. This was a day job, and he did not like it. He drifted two months later to Indianapolis, arriving there in the fall of 1864, when he was at first assigned to duty at the Union Station at a salary of $75 a month for the Western Union Telegraph Company, whose service he now entered, and with which he has been destined to maintain highly important and close relationships throughout a large part of his life. Superintendent Wallach appears to have treated him generously and to have loaned him instruments, a kindness that was greatly appreciated. For twenty years later, the inventor called on his old employer, and together they visited the scene where the borrowed apparatus had been mounted on a rough board in the depot. Edison did not stay long in Indianapolis, however, resigning in February 1865 and proceeding to Cincinnati. The transfer was probably due to trouble caused by one of his early inventions, embodying what has been characterized by an expert as probably the most simple and ingenious arrangement of connections for a repeater. His ambition was to take press report, but finding, even after considerable practice, that he broke frequently, he adjusted two embossing Morse registers, one to receive the press matter, and the other to repeat the dots and dashes at a lower speed, so that the message could be copied leisurely. Hence he could not be rushed or broken in receiving, while he turned out copy that was a marvel of neatness and clearness. All was well so long as ordinary conditions prevailed, but when an unusual pressure occurred the little system fell behind, and the newspapers complained of the slowness with which reports were delivered to them. It is easy to understand that with matter received at a rate of 40 words per minute, and worked off at 25 words per minute, a serious congestion or delay would result, and the newspapers were more anxious for news than they were for fine penmanship. Of this device Mr. Edison remarks, Together we took press for several nights, my companion keeping the apparatus in adjustment, and I copying. The regular press operator would go to the theater, or take a nap, only finishing the report after 1 a.m., one of the newspapers complained of bad copy toward the end of the report, that is, from 1 to 3 a.m., and requested that the operator taking the report up to 1 a.m., which was ourselves, take it all, as the copy then was perfectly unobjectionable. This led to an investigation by the manager, and the scheme was forbidden. This instrument, many years afterwards, was applied by me for transferring messages from one wire to any other wire simultaneously, or after any interval of time. It consisted of a disk of paper, the indentations being formed in a volute spiral, exactly as in the disk phonographs today. It was this instrument which gave me the idea of the phonograph while working on the telephone. Arrived in Cincinnati, where he got employment in the Western Union Commercial Telegraph Department at a wage of $60 per month, Edison made the acquaintance of Milton F. Adams, already referred to as Facile Princeps, the typical telegrapher in all his more sociable and brilliant aspects. Speaking of that time, Mr. Adams says, I can well recall when Edison drifted in to take a job. He was a youth of about eighteen years, decidedly unprepossessing in dress, and rather uncouth in manner. I was twenty-one and very duddish. He was quite thin in those days, and his nose was very prominent, giving a Napoleonic look to his face, although the curious resemblance did not strike me at the time. The boys did not take to him cheerfully, and he was lonesome. I sympathized with him, and we became close companions. As an operator, he had no superiors and very few equals. Most of the time he was monkeying with the batteries and circuits, and devising things to make the work of telegraphy less irksome. 
He also relieved the monotony of office work by fitting up the battery circuits to play jokes on his fellow operators and to deal with the vermin that infested the premises. He arranged in the cellar what he called his rat paralyzer, a very simple contrivance consisting of two plates, insulated from each other and connected from the main battery. They were so placed that when a rat passed over them, the four feet on one plate and the hind feet on the other completed the circuit, and the rat departed this life electrocuted. Shortly after Edison's arrival at Cincinnati came the close of the Civil War and the assassination of President Lincoln. It was natural that telegraphers should take an intense interest in the general struggle, for not only did they handle all the news relating to it, but many of them were one time or another personal participants. For example, one of the operators in the Cincinnati office was George Ellsworth, who was telegrapher for Morgan, the famous Southern guerrilla, and was with him when he made his raid into Ohio and was captured near the Pennsylvania line. Ellsworth himself made a narrow escape by swimming the Ohio River with the aid of an army mule. Yet we can well appreciate the unimpressionable way in which some of the men did their work from an antidote that Mr. Edison tells of that awful night of Friday, April 14, 1865. I noticed, he says, an immense crowd gathering in the street outside a newspaper office. I called the attention of the other operators to the crowd and we sent a messenger boy to find out the cause of the excitement. He returned in a few minutes and shouted, Lincoln's shot! Instinctively, the operators looked from one face to another to see which man had received the news. All the faces were blank, and every man said he had not taken a word about the shooting. Look over your files, said the boss, to the man handling the press stuff. For a few moments we waited in suspense, and then the man held up a sheet of paper containing a short account of the shooting of the president. The operator had worked so mechanically that he had handled the news without the slightest knowledge of its significance. Mr. Adams says that at the time the city was unfet on account of the close of the war. The name of the assassin was received by telegraph, and it was noted with a thrill of horror that it was the brother of Edwin Booth and that of Junius Brutus Booth, the latter of whom was then playing at the old National Theater. Booth was hurried away into seclusion and the next morning the city that had been so gay overnight with bunting was draped with mourning. Edison's diversions in Cincinnati were chiefly those already observed. He read a great deal, but spent most of his leisure in experiment. Mr. Adams remarks, Edison and I were very fond of tragedy. Forrest and John McCullough were playing at the National Theater, and when our capital was sufficient, we would go to see these eminent tragedians alternate in Othello and Iago. Edison always enjoyed Othello greatly, aside from an occasional visit to the Llewellyn Garden over the Rhine, with a glass of beer and a few pretzels consumed while listening to the excellent music of a German band, the theatre was the sum and substance of our innocent dissipation. The Cincinnati office, as a central point, appears to have been attractive to many of the clever young operators who graduated from it to positions of larger responsibility. Some of them were conspicuous for their skill and versatility. Mr. Adams tells this interesting story as an illustration. L. C. Weir, or Charlie as he was known, at that time agent for the Adams Express Company, had the remarkable ability of taking messages and copying them twenty-five words behind the sender. One day he came into the operating room, and passing a table he heard Louisville calling Cincinnati. He reached over to the key and answered the call. My attention was arrested by the fact that he walked off after responding, and the sender happened to be a good one. Weir coolly asked for a pen, and when he sat down, the sender was just one message ahead of him with date, address, and signature. Charlie started in, and, in a beautiful, large, round hand, copied that message. The sender went right along, and when he finished with six messages, closed his key. When Weir had done with the last one, the sender began to think that after all there had been no receiver, as Weir did not break, but simply gave his okay. He afterward became president of the Adams Express, and was certainly a wonderful operator. The operating room referred to was on the fifth floor of the building with no elevators. Those were the early days of trade unionism and telegraphy, and the movement will probably never quite die out in the craft, which has always shown so much solidarity. While Edison was in Cincinnati, a delegation of five union operators went over from Cleveland to form a local branch, and the occasion was one of great conviviality. 
Night came, but the Unionists were conspicuous by their absence, although more circuits than one were intolerant of delay and clamorous for attention, eight local Unionists being away. The Cleveland report wire was in special need, and Edison, almost alone in the office, de devoted himself to it through the night and until three o'clock the next morning when he was relieved. He had previously been getting eighty dollars a month, and had eked this out by copying plays for the theater. His rating was that of a plug, or inferior operator, but he was determined to lift himself into the class of first-class operators, and kept up the practice of going into the office at night to copy press, acting willingly as a substitute for any operator who wanted to get off a few hours, which often meant all night. Speaking of this special ordeal, for which he had thus been unconsciously preparing, Edison says, My copy looked fine if viewed as a whole, as I could write a perfectly straight line across the wide sheet, which was not ruled. There were no flourishes, but the individual letters would not bear close inspection. When I missed understanding a word, there was no time to think what it was, so I made an illegible one to fill in, trusting to the printers to sense it. I knew they could read anything, although Mr. Bloss, an editor of the Inquirer, made such bad copy that one of his editorials was pasted up on the notice board in the telegraph office with an offer of one dollar to any man who could read twenty consecutive words. Nobody ever did it. When I got through, I was too nervous to go home, so waited the rest of the night for the day manager, Mr. Stevens, to see what was to be the outcome of this union formation and of my efforts. He was an austere man, and I was afraid of him. I got the morning papers, which came out at 4 a.m., and the press report read perfectly, which surprised me greatly. I went to work on my regular day wire to Portsmouth, Ohio, and there was considerable excitement, but nothing was said to me. Neither did Mr. Stevens examine the copy on the office hook, which I was watching with great interest. However, about 3 p.m. he went to the hook, grabbed the bunch, and looked at it as a whole without examining it in detail, for which I was thankful. Then he jabbed it back on the hook, and I knew I was all right. He walked over to me and said, Young man, I want you to work the Louisville wire nights. Your salary will be $125. Thus I got from the plug classification to that of a first-class man. But no sooner was this promotion secured than he started again on his wandering southward, while his friend Adams went north, neither having any difficulty in making the trip. The boys in those days had extraordinary facilities for travel. As a usual thing, it was only necessary for them to board a train and tell the conductor they were operators. Then they would go as far as they liked. The number of operators was small, and they were in demand everywhere. It was in this way Edison made his way south as far as Memphis, Tennessee, where the telegraph service at that time was under military law, although the operators received $125 a month. Here again Edison began to invent and to improve on existing apparatus, with the result of having once more to move on. The story may be told in his terse language. I was not the inventor of the auto repeater, but while in Memphis I worked on one. Learning that the chief operator, who was a protege of the superintendent, was trying in some way to put New York and New Orleans together for the first time since the close of the war, I redoubled my efforts, and at two o'clock one morning I had them speaking to each other. The office of the Memphis Avalanche was in the same building. The paper got wind of it and sent messages. A column came out in the morning about it, but when I went to the office in the afternoon to report for duty, I was discharged without explanation. The superintendent would not even give me a pass to Nashville, so I had to pay my fare. I had so little money left that I nearly starved to Cater, Alabama, and had to stay there three days before going north to Nashville. Arrived in that city, I went to the telegraph office, got money enough to buy a little solid food, and secured a pass to Louisville. I had a companion with me who was also out of a job. I arrived at Louisville on a bitterly cold day, with ice in the gutters. I was wearing a linen duster, and was not much to look at, but I got a position at once, working on a press wire. My traveling companion was less successful, on account of his record. They had a limit even in those days, when the telegraph office was so demoralized. Some reminiscences of Mr. Edison are of interest as bearing not only upon the demoralized telegraph service, but the conditions from which the New South had to emerge while working out its salvation. The telegraph was still under military control, not having been turned over to its original owners, the Southern Telegraph Company. 
In addition to the regular force, there was an extra force of two or three operators, and some stranded ones, who were a burden for us, for the board was high. One of these derelicts was a great source of worry to me, personally. He would come in at all hours and either throw ink around or make a lot of noise. One day he built a fire in the grate and started to throw pistol cartridges into the flames. These would explode, and I was twice hit by the bullets, which left a black and blue mark. Another night he came in from some part of the building with a lot of stationery with Confederate states printed at the head. He was a fine operator and wrote a beautiful hand. He would take a sheet of paper, write capital A, and then take another sheet and make the A differently, and so on through the alphabet, each time crumpling the paper up in his hands and throwing it on the floor. He would keep this up until the room was nearly flush with the table. Then he would quit. Everything at that time was wide open. Disorganization reigned supreme. There was no head to anything. One night myself and a companion would go over to a gorgeously furnished faro bank and get our midnight lunch. Everything was free. There was over twenty kino rooms running. One of them I visited was in a Baptist church, the man with the wheel being in the pulpit and the gamblers in the pews. While there, a manager of the telegraph office was arrested for something I never understood and incarcerated in a military prison about a half mile from the office. The building was in plain sight from the office and four stories high. He was kept strictly incommunicado. One day, thinking he might be confined in a room facing the office, I put my arm out of the window and kept signaling dots and dashes by the movement of the arm. I tried this several times for two days. Finally he noticed it, and putting his arm through the bars of the window, he established communication with me. He thus sent several messages to his friends, and was afterwards set free. Another curious story told by Edison concerns a fellow operator on night duty at Chattanooga Junction. At the time, he was at Memphis. When it was reported that Hood was marching on Nashville, one night a Jew came into the office about eleven o'clock in great excitement, having heard the Hood rumor. He, being a large sutler, wanted to send a message to save his goods. The operator said it was impossible, that orders had been given to send no private messages. Then the Jew wanted to bribe my friend, who steadfastly refused for the reason, as he told the Jew, that he might be court-martialed and shot. Finally, the Jew got up to eight hundred dollars. The operator swore him to secrecy and sent the message. Now, there was no such order about private messages, and the Jew, finding it out, complained to Captain Van Duzer, chief of telegraphs, who investigated the matter, and while he would not discharge the operator, laid him off indefinitely. Van Duzer was so lenient that if an operator were discharged, all the operator had to do was wait three days, and then go back and sit on the stoop of Van Duzer's office all day, and he would be taken back. But Van Duzer swore he would never give in, in this case. He said that if the operator had taken $800 and sent the message at the regular rate, which was 25 cents, it would have been all right, as the Jew would be punished for trying to bribe a military officer. But when the operator took the 800 and then set the message deadhead, he couldn't stand it, and he would never relent. A third typical story of this period deals with a cipher message from Thomas. Mr. Edison narrates it as follows. When I was an operator in Cincinnati, working out the Louisville wire lines for a time, one night a man over the, on the Pittsburgh wire yelled out, D.I. Cipher, which meant that there was a cipher message from the War Department at Washington and that it was coming, and he yelled out, Louisville. I immediately started to call up that place. It was just at the change of shift in the office. I could not get Louisville, and the cipher message began to come. It was taken by the operator at the other table, direct from the War Department. It was for General Thomas at Nashville. I called for about 20 minutes and notified them that I could not get Louisville. I kept at it for about 15 minutes longer and notified them that there was still no answer from Louisville. They then notified the War Department that they could not get Louisville. Then we tried to get by all kinds of roundabout ways, but in no case could anybody get them at the office. Soon a message came from the War Department to send immediately for the manager of the Cincinnati office. He was brought to the office, and several messages were exchanged, the contents of which, of course, I do not know. But the matter appeared to be very serious, and as they were afraid of General Hood, of the Confederate Army, who was then attempting to march on Nashville, and it was very important that this cipher, of about 1,200 words or so, 
should be got through immediately to General Thomas. I kept on calling up to twelve or one o'clock, but no Louisville. About one o'clock the operator at the Indianapolis office got a hold of an operator on a wire which ran from Indianapolis to Louisville along the railroad, who happened to come into his office. He arranged with this operator to get a relay of horses, and the message was sent through Indianapolis to this operator, who then engaged horses to send the dispatches to Louisville, and find out the trouble, and to get the dispatches through without delay to General Thomas. In those days the telegraph fraternity was rather demoralized, and the discipline was very lax. It was found out a couple of days afterward that there were three night operators at Louisville. One of them had gone over to Jeffersonville, and had fallen off a horse and broken his leg, and was in a hospital. By a remarkable coincidence, another of the men had been stabbed in the Keno room, and was also in hospital, while the third operator had gone to Cynthiana to see a man hanged, and had got left by the train. Young Edison remained in Louisville for about two years, quite a long stay for one with such nomadic instincts. It was there that he perfected the peculiar vertical style of writing which, beginning with him in telegraphy, later became so much of a fad with teachers of penmanship and in the schools. He says of this form of writing, a current example of which is given above, I developed this style in Louisville while taking press reports. My wire was connected to the blind side of a repeater at Cincinnati, so that if I missed a word or sentence, or if the wire worked badly, I could not break in and get the last words, because the Cincinnati man had no instrument by which he could hear me. I had to take what came. When I got the job, the cable across the Ohio River at Covington, connecting with the line at Louisville, had a variable leak in it, which caused the strength of the signaling current to make violent fluctuations. I obviated this by using several relays, each with a different adjustment, working several sounders, all connected with one sounding plate. The clatter was bad, but I could read it with fair ease. When, in addition to this infernal leak, the wires north to Cleveland worked badly, it required a large amount of imagination to get the sense of what was being sent. An imagination requires an appreciable time for this exercise, and as the stuff was coming at a rate of thirty-five to forty words a minute, it was very difficult to write down what was coming and to imagine what wasn't coming. Hence it was necessary to become a very rapid writer, so I started to find the fastest style. I found that the vertical style, with each letter separate and without any flourishes, was the most rapid, and that the smaller the letter, the greater the rapidity. As I took on an average from eight to fifteen columns of news report every day, it did not take long to perfect this method. Mr. Edison has adhered to this characteristic style of penmanship down to the present time. As a matter of fact, the conditions at Louisville at that time were not much better than they had been at Memphis. The telegraph operating room was in a deplorable condition. It was on the second story of a dilapidated building on the principal street of the city, with the battery room in the rear, behind which was the office of the agent of the Associated Press. The plastering was about one-third gone from the ceiling. A small stove, used occasionally in the winter, was connected to the chimney by a tortuous pipe. The office was never cleaned. The switchboard for manipulating the wires was about thirty-four inches square. The brass connections on it were black with age and with the arcing effects of lightning, which to young Edison seemed particularly partial to Louisville. It would strike on the wires, he says, with an explosion like a cannon shot, making that office no place for an operator with heart disease. Around the dingy walls were a dozen tables, the ends next to the wall. They were about the size of those seen in old-fashioned country hotels for holding the wash bowl and pitcher. The copper wires connecting the instruments to the switchboard were small, crystallized, and rotten. The battery room was arranged with old record books and message bundles, and 100 cells of nitric acid battery, arranged on a stand in the center of the room. This stand, as well as the floor, was almost eaten through by the destructive action of the powerful acid. Grim and uncompromising as the description reads, it was typical of the equipment in those remote days of the telegraph at the close of the war. Illustrative of the length to which telegraphers would, could go at a time when there was so much in demand, Edison tells the following story. When I took the position there, there was a great shortage of operators. One night at 2 a.m., another operator and I were on duty. I was taking press report, and the other man was working the New York wire. We heard a heavy tramp, tramp, tramp on the rickety stairs. 
Suddenly the door was thrown open with great violence, dislodging it from one of the hinges. There appeared in the doorway one of the best operators we had, who worked daytime and was of a very quiet disposition, except when intoxicated. He was a great friend of the manager of the office. His eyes were bloodshot and wild. One sleeve had been torn away from his coat. Without noticing either of us, he went up to the stove and kicked it over. The stovepipe fell, dislocated at every joint. It was half full of exceedingly fine soot, which floated out and filled the room completely. This produced a momentary respite to his labors. When the atmosphere was cleared sufficiently to see, he went around and pulled every table away from the wall, piling them on top of the stove in the middle of the room. Then he proceeded to pull the switchboard away from the wall. It was held tightly by screws. He succeeded, finally, and when it gave way he fell with the board, and striking on the table, cut himself so he soon became covered with blood. He then went to the battery room and knocked all the batteries off on the floor. The nitric acid soon began to combine with the plaster in the room below, which was the public receiving room for messengers and bookkeepers. The excess acid poured through and ate up the accounting books. After having finished everything to his satisfaction, he left. I told the other operator to do nothing. We would leave things just as they were and wait until the manager came. In the meantime, as I knew all the wires coming through to the switchboard, I rigged up a temporary set of instruments so that the New York business could be cleared up, and we also got the remainder of the press matter. At about seven o'clock, the day men began to appear. They were told to go downstairs and wait the coming of the manager. At eight o'clock, he appeared, walking around, went into the battery room, and then came to me, saying, Edison, who did this? I told him that Billy L. had come in full of soda water and invented the ruin before him. He walked backward and forward about a minute, then coming up to my table, put his fist down and said, If Billy L. ever does that again, I will discharge him. It was needless to say that there were other operators who took advantage of that kind of discipline, and I had many calls at night after that, but none with such destructive effects. This was one aspect of life as it presented itself to the sensitive and observant young operator in Louisville. But there was another, more intellectual side, in the contact afforded with journalism and its leaders, and the information taken in almost unconsciously as to the political and social movements of the time. Mr. Edison looks back on this with great satisfaction. I remember, he says, the discussions between the celebrated poet and journalist, George D. Prentice, then editor of the Courier Journal, and Mr. Tyler of the Associated Press. I believe Prentice was the father of the humorous paragraph of the American newspaper. He was poetic, highly educated, and a brilliant talker. He was very thin and small. I don't think he weighed over 125 pounds. Tyler was a graduate of Harvard, and had a very clear enunciation, and a sharp contrast to Prentice. He was a large man. After the paper had gone to press, Prentice would generally come over to Tyler's office and start talking. Having while in Tyler's office heard them arguing on the immortality of the soul, etc., I asked permission of Mr. Tyler if, after finishing the press matter, I might come in and listen to the conversation, which I did many times after. One thing I could never comprehend was that Tyler had a sideboard with liquors and generally crackers. Prentice would pour out half a glass of what they call corn whiskey and would dip the crackers in it and eat them. Tyler's took it sans food. One teaspoon of that stuff would have put me to sleep. Mr. Edison throws out a curious sidelight on the origin of the comic column in the modern American newspaper, the telegraph giving to a new joke or good story the ubiquity and instantaneity of an important historical event. It was the practice of the press operators all over the country at that time, when a lull occurred, to start in and send jokes or stories the day men had collected, and these were copied and pasted up on the bulletin board. Cleveland was the originating office for press, which it received from New York and sent it out simultaneously to Milwaukee, Chicago, Toledo, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Dayton, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Vincennes, Terre Haute, St. Louis, and Louisville. Cleveland would call first on Milwaukee, if he had anything. If so, he would send it, and Cleveland would repeat it to all of us. Thus any joke or story originating anywhere in that area was known the next day all over. The pressmen would come in and copy anything that could be published, which was about 
I collected, too, quite a large scrapbook of it, but unfortunately have lost it. Edison tells an amusing story of his own pursuits at the time. Always an omnivorous reader, he had some difficulty in getting a sufficient quantity of literature for home consumption, and was in the habit of buying books at auctions and at second-hand stores. One day, at an auction room, he secured a stack of twenty unbound volumes of the North American Review for two dollars. These he had bound and delivered at the telegraph office. One morning, when he was free as usual, at three o'clock, he started off at a rapid pace with ten volumes on his shoulder. He found himself very soon the subject of a fusillade. When he stopped, a breathless policeman grabbed him by the throat and ordered him to drop his parcel and explain matters as a suspicious character. He opened the package, showing the books, somewhat to the disgust of the officer, who imagined he had caught a burglar sneaking away in the dark alley with his booty. Edison explained that being deaf he had heard no challenge, and therefore had kept moving, and the policeman remarked apologetically that it was fortunate for Edison that he was not a better shot. The incident is curiously relevatory of the character of the man, for it must be admitted that, while literary telegraphers are by no means scarce, there are very few who would spend scant savings on back numbers of a ponderous review at an age when tragedy, beer, and pretzels are far more enticing. Through all his travels, Edison has preserved those books, and has them now in his library at Llewellyn Park on Orange Mountain, New Jersey. Drifting after a time from Louisville, Edison made his way as far north as Detroit, but, like the famous Duke of York, soon made his way back again. Possibly the severer discipline after the happy-go-lucky regime in the southern city had something to do with this restlessness, which again manifested itself, however, on his return thither. The end of the war had left the South a scene of destruction and desolation, and many men who had fought bravely and well found it hard to reconcile themselves to the grim task of reconstruction. To them it seemed better to let ill alone and to seek other clime where conditions would be less onerous. At this moment, a great deal of exaggerated talk was current as to the sunny life and easy wealth of Latin America, and under its influences many unreconstructed Southerners made their way to Mexico, Brazil, Peru, or the Argentine. Telegraph operators were naturally in touch with this movement, and Edison's fertile imagination was readily inflamed by the glowing idea of all these vague possibilities. Again, he threw up his steady work, and, with a couple of sanguine young friends, made his way to New Orleans. They had the notion of taking positions in the Brazilian government telegraphs, as an advertisement had been inserted in some paper stating that operators were wanted. They had timed their departure from Louisville so as to catch a specially charted steamer, which was to leave New Orleans for Brazil on a certain day, and to convey a large number of Confederates and their families, who were disgusted with the United States and were going to settle in Brazil where slavery still prevailed. Edison and his friends arrived in New Orleans just at the time of the Great Riot, when several hundred Negroes were killed, and the city was in the hands of a mob. The government had seized the steamer chartered for Brazil, in order to bring in troops from the Yazoo River to New Orleans to stop the rioting. The young operators therefore visited another shipping office to make inquiries as to vessels for Brazil, and encountered an old Spaniard who sat in a chair near the steamer's agent's desk and to whom they explained their intentions. He had lived and worked in South America, and was very emphatic in his assertion, as he shook his yellow, bonied finger at them, that the worst mistake that they could possibly make would be to leave the United States. He would not leave on any account, and they, as young Americans, would always regret it if they forsook their native land, whose freedom, climate, and opportunities could not be equaled anywhere on the face of the globe. Such sincere advice as this could not be disdained and Edison made his way north again. One cannot resist speculation as to what might have happened to Edison himself, and to the development of electricity had he made this proposed plunge into the enervating tropics. It will be remembered that at a somewhat similar crisis in life, young Robert Burns entertained seriously the idea of forsaking Scotland for the West Indies. That he did not go was certainly better for Scottish verse, to which he contributed later so many immortal lines and it was probably better for himself, even if he died a gauger. It was simply impossible to imagine Edison working out the phonograph, telephone, and incandescent lamp under the tropical climes he sought. Some years later, 
he was informed that both his companions had gone to Veracruz, Mexico, and had died there of yellow fever. Work was soon resumed in Louisville, where the dilapidated old office occupied at the close of the war had been exchanged for one much more comfortable and luxurious in its equipment. As before, Edison was allotted to press work, and remembers very distinctly taking the presidential message and veto of the District of Columbia bill by President Johnson. As the matter was received over the wire, he paragraphed it so that each printer had exactly three lines, thus enabling the matter to be set up very expeditiously in the newspaper offices. This earned him the gratitude of the editors, a dinner, and all the newspaper exchanges he wanted. Edison's accounts of the sprees and debauches of the other night operators in the loosely managed offices enable one to understand how even a little steady application to the work in hand would be appreciated. On one occasion, Edison acted as treasurer for his bibulous companions, holding the stake, so to speak, in order that the supply of liquor might last longer. One of the mildest mannered of the party took umbrage at the parsimony of the treasurer and knocked him down, whereupon the others in the party set upon the assailant and mauled him so badly that he had to spend three weeks in the hospital. At another time, two of his companions, sharing the temporary hospitality of his room, smashed most of the furniture and went to bed with their boots on. Then his kindly good nature rebelled. I felt that this was running hospitality into the ground, so I pulled them out and left them on the floor to cool off from their alcoholic trance. Edison seems on the whole to have been fairly comfortable and happy in Louisville, surrounding himself with books and experimental apparatus, and even inditing a treatise on electricity. But his very thirst for knowledge and new facts again proved his undoing. The instruments in the handsome new offices were fastened in their proper places, and the operators were strictly forbidden to remove them, or to use the batteries except on regular work. This prohibition meant little to Edison, who had access to no other instruments except those of the company. I went one night, he says, into the battery room to obtain some sulfuric acid for experimenting. The car boy tipped over, the acid ran out, went through to the manager's room below, and ate up his desk and all the carpet. The next morning I was summoned before him, and told what the company wanted was operators, not experimenters. I was at liberty to take my pay and get out. The fact that Edison is a very studious man, an insatiate lover and reader of books, is well known to his associates, but the surprise is often expressed at his fund of miscellaneous information. This, it will be seen, is partly explained by his work for years as a press reporter. He says of this, The second time I was in Louisville, they had moved into a new office, and the discipline was now good. I took the press job. In fact, I was a very poor sender, and therefore made the taking of press report a specialty. The newspaper men allowed me to come over, after going to press at 3 a.m., and get all the exchanges I wanted. These I would take home and lay at the foot of my bed. I never slept more than four or five hours, so that I would awake at nine or ten and read these papers until dinner time. I thus kept posted, and knew from their activity every member of Congress, and what committees they were on, and about all the topical doings, as well as the prices of breadstuffs, and all the primary markets. I was in a much better position than most operators to call on my imagination to supply missing words or sentences, which were frequent in those days of old, rotten wires, badly insulated, especially on stormy nights. Upon such occasions I had to supply in some cases one-fifth of the whole matter, pure guessing. But I got caught only once. There had been some kind of convention in Virginia, in which John Minor Botts was the leading figure. There was a great excitement about it, and two votes had been taken at the convention on the two days. There was no doubt that the vote the next day would go a certain way. A very bad storm came up about ten o'clock, and my wire worked very badly. Then there was a cessation of all signals. Then I made out the words, minor bots. The next was a New York item. I filled in a paragraph about the convention and how the vote had gone, as I was sure it would. But the next day I learned that instead of there having been a vote, the convention had adjourned without action until the day after. In like manner, it was at Louisville that Mr. Edison got an insight into the manner in which great political speeches are more frequently reported than the public suspects. The Associated Press had a shorthand man traveling with President Johnson when he made a celebrated swing around the circle in a private train, delivering hot speeches in deference of his conduct. The man engaged me to write out the notes from his reading. 
he came in loaded and on the verge of incoherence. We started in, but about every two minutes I would have to scratch out whole paragraphs and insert the same thing said in another and better way. He would frequently change words, always to the betterment of the speech. I couldn't understand this, and when he got through I had copied about three columns. I asked him why these changes, if he read from notes. Sonny, he said, if these politicians had their speeches published as they deliver them, a great many shorthand writers would be out of a job. The best shorthanders and the holders of good positions are those who could take a lot of rambling, incoherent stuff and make a rattling good speech out of it. Going back to Cincinnati and beginning his second term there as an operator, Edison found the office in new quarters and with greatly improved management. He was again put on night duty, much to his satisfaction. He rented a room in the top floor of an office building, bought a cot and an oil stove, a foot lathe, and some tools. He cultivated the acquaintance of Mr. Summers, superintendent of telegraph of the Cincinnati and Indianapolis Railroad, who gave him permission to take such scrap apparatus as he might desire, which was of no use to the company. With Mr. Summers, on one occasion, he had an opportunity to indulge his always strong sense of humor. Summers was a very witty man, he says, and fond of experimenting. We worked on a self-adjusting telegraph relay, which would have been very valuable if we could have got it. I soon became the possessor of a second-hand room corf induction coil, which, although it would only give a small spark, would twist the arms and clutch the hands of a man so he could not let go of the apparatus. One day we went down to the roundhouse of the Cincinnati and Indianapolis Railroad and connected up the long wash tank in the room with the coil, one electrode being connected to the earth. Above this wash room was a flat roof. We bored a hole through the roof and could see the men as they came in. The first man, as he entered, dipped his hands in the water. The floor being wet, he formed a circuit, and up went his hands. He tried it the second time with the same result. He then stood against the wall with a puzzled expression. We surmised that he was waiting for someone else to come in, which occurred shortly after, with the same result. Then they went out, and the place was soon crowded, and there was considerable excitement. Various theories were broached to explain the curious phenomena. We enjoyed the sport immensely. It must be remembered that this was over forty years ago, when there was no popular instruction in electricity, and when its possibilities for practical joking were known to very few. Today, such a crowd of working men would be sure to include at least one student of a night school, or a correspondence course who could explain the mystery offhand. Note has been made of the presence of Ellsworth in the Cincinnati office, and his service with the Confederate guerrilla Morgan, for whom he had tapped federal wires, read military messages, sent false ones, and done serious mischief generally. It is well known that one operator can recognize another by the way in which he makes his signals. It is his style of handwriting. Ellsworth possessed, in a remarkable degree, the skill of imitating these peculiarities, and thus he deceived the Union operators easily. Edison says that while apparently a quiet man in bearing, Ellsworth, after the excitement of fighting, found the tameness of a telegraph office obnoxious, and that he became a bad gunman in the panhandle of Texas where he was killed. We soon became acquainted, says Edison, of this period in Cincinnati, and he wanted me to invent a secret method of sending dispatches so that an intermediate operator could not tap the wire and understand it. He said that if it could be accomplished, he could sell it to the government for a large sum of money. This suited me, and I started in and succeeded in making such an instrument, which had in it the germ of my quadruplex, now used throughout the world, permitting the dispatch of four messages over one wire simultaneously. By the time I had succeeded in getting the apparatus to work, Ellsworth suddenly disappeared. Many years afterwards, I used this little device again for the same purpose. At Menlo Park, New Jersey, I had my laboratory. There were several Western Union wires cut into the laboratory and used by me in experimenting at night. One day I sat near an instrument, which I had left connected during the night. I soon found it was a private wire between New York and Philadelphia, and I heard among a lot of stuff a message that surprised me. A week after that, I had occasion to go to New York, and, visiting the office of the lessee of the wire, I asked him if he hadn't sent such and such a message. The expression that came over his face was a sight. He asked me how I knew of any message. I told him the circumstances, and suggested he had better cipher such communications, or put on a secret sounder. 
The result of the interview was that I installed from him my old Cincinnati apparatus, which was used thereafter for many years. Edison did not make a very long stay in Cincinnati this time, but went home after a while to Port Huron. Soon, tiring of idleness and isolation, he sent a cry from Macedonia to his old friend Milt Adams, who was in Boston, and whom he wished to rejoin if he could get work promptly in the East. Edison himself gives the details of this eventful move, when he went east to grow up with the new art of electricity. I had left Louisville the second time, and went home to see my parents. After stopping home for some time, I got restless, and thought I would like to work in the east. Knowing that a former operator named Adams, who had worked with me in the Cincinnati office, was in Boston, I wrote him that I wanted a job there. He wrote back that if I came on immediately, he would get me a job in the Western Union office. I had helped out the Grand Trunk Railroad telegraph people by a new device when they lost one of the two submarine cables they had across the river, making the remaining cable act just as well for their purpose, as if they had had two. I thought that I was entitled to a pass, which they conceded, and I started for Boston. After leaving Toronto, a terrific blizzard came up, and the train got snowed under in a cut. After staying there twenty-four hours, the train men made snowshoes of fence-rail splits and started out to find food, which they did about a half-mile away. They found a roadside inn, and by means of snowshoes all the passengers were taken to the inn. The train reached Montreal four days late. A number of the passengers and myself went to the military headquarters to testify in favor of a soldier who was on furlough and was two days late, which was a serious matter with military people, I learned. We willingly did this, for this soldier was a great storyteller, and made the time pass quickly. I met here a telegraph operator named Stanton, who took me to his boarding house, the most cheerless I have ever been in. Nobody got enough to eat, the bedclothes were too short and too thin, it was twenty-eight degrees below zero, the wash water was frozen solid. The board was cheap, being only a dollar fifty per week. Stanton said that the usual livestock accompaniment of operators' boarding houses was absent. He thought the intense cold had caused them to hibernate. Stanton, when I was working at Cincinnati, left his position and went out on the Union Pacific to work at Julesburg, which was a cattle town at that time and very rough. I remember seeing him off on a train, never expecting to see him again. Six months later, while working press wire in Cincinnati, about 2 a.m., there was flung in the middle of the operating room a large tin box. It made a report just like a pistol, and we all jumped up startled. In walked Stanton. Gentlemen, he said, I have just returned from a pleasure trip to the land beyond the Mississippi. All my wealth is contained in my metallic traveling device, and you are welcome to it. The case contained one paper collar. He sat down, and I noticed that he had a woolen comforter around his neck, with his coat buttoned closely. The night was intensely warm. He then opened his coat, and revealed the fact that he had nothing on but the bare skin. Gentlemen, said he, you see before you an operator who has reached the limit of impecuniosity. Not far from the limit of impecuniosity was Edison himself, as he landed in Boston in 1868 after this wintry ordeal. This chapter is run to undue length, but it must not close without one citation from high authority as to the service of the military telegraph corps so often referred to in it. General Grant, in his memoirs, describing the movements of the Army of the Potomac, lays stress on the service of his telegraph operators and says, Nothing could be more complete than the organization and discipline of this body of brave and intelligent men. Insulated wires were wound upon reels, two men and a mule detailed to each wheel. A pack saddle was provided with a rack, like a sawbuck, placed crossways, so that the wheel would revolve freely. There was a wagon provided with a telegraph operator, battery, and instruments for each division, corps, and army, and for my headquarters. Wagons were also loaded with light poles supplied with an iron spike at each end to hold the wires up. The moment troops were in a position to go into camp, the men would put up these wires. Thus, in a few minutes longer time than it took a mule to walk the length of its coil, telegraphic communication would be effected between all the headquarters of the army. No orders ever had to be given to establish the telegraph. End of chapter 5
Chapter six of Edison His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. Chapter six. Milton Adams was working in the office of the Franklin Telegraph Company in Boston when he received Edison's appeal from Port Huron, and with characteristic impetuosity at once made it his business to secure a position for his friend. There was no opening in the Franklin office, so Adams went over to the Western Union office and asked the manager, Mr. George F. Milliken, if he did not want an operator who, like young Lokenvar, came out of the West. What kind of copy does he make? was the cautious response. I passed Edison's letter through the window for his inspection. Milliken read it, and a look of surprise came over his countenance, as he asked me if he could take it off the line like that. I said he certainly could, and that there was nobody who could stick him. Milliken said that if he was that kind of an operator, I could send for him, and I wrote to Edison to come on, as I had a job for him in the main office of the Western Union. Meantime, Edison had secured his pass over the Grand Trunk Railroad and spent four days and nights on the journey, suffering extremes of cold and hunger. Franklin's arrival in Philadelphia finds its parallel in the very modest debut of Adam's friend in Boston. It took only five minutes for Edison to get the job, for Superintendent Milliken, a fine type of telegraph official, saw quickly through the superficialities and realized that it was no ordinary young operator he was engaging. Edison himself tells the story of what happened. The manager asked me when I was ready to work. Now, I replied, I was then told to return at 5.30 p.m., and punctually at that hour I entered the main operating room and was introduced to the night manager. The weather being cold and being clothed poorly, my peculiar appearance caused much mirth. As I afterward learned, the night operators had consulted together how they might put up a job on the J from the Woolly West. I was given a pen and assigned to the New York number 1 wire. After waiting an hour, I was told to come over to a special table and take a special report for the Boston Herald. The conspirators having arranged to have one of the fastest senders in New York send the dispatch and salt the new man. I sat down unsuspiciously at the table, and the New York man started slowly. Soon he increased his speed, to which I easily adapted my pace. This put my rival on his mettle, and he put on his best powers, which, however, were soon reached. At this point I happened to look up, and saw the operators all looking over my shoulder, with their faces shining with fun and excitement. I knew then that they were trying to put a job on me, but I kept my own counsel. The New York man then commenced to slur over his words, running them together and sticking the signals. But I had been used to this style of telegraphy and taking report, and was not in the least discomfited. Finally, when I thought the fun had gone far enough, and having about completed the special, I quietly opened the key and remarked telegraphically to my New York friend, Say, young man, change off and send with your other foot. This broke the New York man all up, and he turned the job over to another man to finish. Edison had a distaste for taking press report, due to the fact that it was steady, continuous work, and interfered with the studies and investigations that could be carried on in the intervals of ordinary commercial telegraphy. He was not lazy in any sense. While he had no very lively interest in the mere routine work of a telegraph office, he had the profoundest curiosity as to the underlying principles of electricity that made telegraphy possible, and he had an unflagging desire and belief in his own ability to improve the apparatus he handled daily. The whole intellectual atmosphere of Boston was favorable to the development of the brooding genius in this shy, awkward, studious youth utterly indifferent to clothes and personal appearance, but ready to spend his last dollar on books and scientific paraphernalia. It is a matter of record that he did once buy a new suit for thirty dollars in Boston. But the following Sunday, while experimenting with acids in his little workshop, the suit was spoiled. This is what I get for putting so much money in a new suit, was the laconic remark of the youth, who was more than delighted to pick up a complete set of Faraday's works about the same time. Adams says that when Edison brought home these books at 4 a.m., he read steadily until breakfast time. Then he remarked enthusiastically, Adams, I got so much to do and life is so short, I'm going to hustle. Thereupon he started on a run for breakfast. Edison himself says, 
It was in Boston I bought Faraday's works. I think I must have tried about everything in those books. His explanations were simple. He used no mathematics. He was the master experimenter. I don't think there were many copies of Faraday's works sold in those days. The only people who did anything in electricity were the telegraphers and the opticians making simple school apparatus to demonstrate the principles. One of these firms was Palmer and Hall, whose catalogue of 1850 showed a miniature electric locomotive made by Mr. Thomas Hall and exhibited in operation the following year at the Charitable Mechanics Fair in Boston. In 1852, Mr. Hall made for a Dr. A. L. Henderson of Buffalo, New York, a model line of railroad with electric motor engine, telegraph line, and electric railroad signals, together with a figure operating the signals at each end of the line automatically. This was in reality the first example of railroad trains moving by telegraph signals, a practice now so common and universal as to attract no comment. To show how little some fundamental methods can change in fifty years, it may be noted that Hall conveyed the current to his tiny car through forty feet of rail, using the rail as a conductor, just as Edison did more than thirty years later in his historic experiments for Villard at Menlo Park, and just as a large proportion of American trolley systems do this at the present moment. It was among such practical, investigating folk as these that Edison was very much at home. Another notable man of this stamp, with whom Edison was thrown in contact, was the late Mr. Charles Williams, who, beginning his career in the electrical field in the 40s, was at the height of activity as a maker of apparatus when Edison arrived in the city, and who afterward, as an associate of Alexander Graham Bell, enjoyed the distinction of being the first manufacturer in the world of telephones. At his Court Street workshop, Edison was a frequent visitor. Telegraph repairs and experiments were going on constantly, especially on the early fire alarm telegraphs of Farmer and Gamewell, and with the aid of one of the men there, probably George Anders, Edison worked out into an operative model his first invention, a vote recorder, the first Edison patent, for which papers were executed on October 11, 1868, and which was taken out June 1, 1869, number 90,646. The purpose of this particular device was to permit a vote in the National House of Representatives to be taken in a minute or so, complete lists being furnished of all members voting on the two sides of any question. Mr. Edison, in recalling the circumstances, says, Roberts was the telegraph operator who was the financial backer to the extent of $100. The invention, when completed, was taken to Washington. I think it was exhibited before a committee that had something to do with the Capitol. The chairman of the committee, after seeing how quickly and perfectly it worked, said, Young man, if there is any invention on earth we don't want down here, it is this. One of the greatest weapons in the hands of a minority to prevent bad legislation is filibustering on votes, and this instrument would prevent it. I saw the truth of this, because as press operator I had taken miles of congressional proceedings, and to this day an enormous amount of time is wasted during each session of the House in foolishly calling the members' names and recording and then adding their votes, when the whole operation can be done in almost a moment by merely pressing a particular button at each desk. For filibustering purposes, however, the present methods are most admirable. Edison determined from that time forth to devote his inventive faculties only to things for which there was a real, genuine demand, something that subserved the actual necessities of humanity. The first patent was taken out for him by the late Honorable Carol D. White, afterward U.S. Commission of Labor, and a well-known publicist, then practicing patent law in Boston. He describes Edison as an uncouth in manner, a chewer rather than a smoker of tobacco, but full of intelligence and ideas. Footnote. The general scheme of a fire alarm telegraph system embodies a central office to which notice can be sent from any number of signal boxes of the outbreak of a fire in the district covered by the box, the central office in turn calling out the nearest fire engines and warning the fire department in general of the occurrence. Such fire alarms can be exchanged automatically or by operators and are sometimes associated with a large fire alarm bell or whistle. Some boxes can be operated by the passing public. Others need special keys. The box mechanism is usually of the ratchet, step-by-step -step movement, familiar in district messenger call boxes. End footnote. 
Edison's curiously practical, though imaginative mind, demanded realities to work upon, things that belong to human nature's daily food, and he soon harked back to telegraphy, a domain in which he was destined to succeed, and over which he was to reign supreme as an inventor. He did not, however, neglect chemistry, but indulged his taste in that direction freely, although we have no record that this work was anything more, at that time, than the carrying out of experiments outlined in the books. The foundations were being laid for the remarkable chemical knowledge that later on grappled successfully with so many knotty problems in the realm of chemistry, notably with the incandescent lamp and the storage battery. Of one incident in his chemical experiments he tells the following story. I had read, in a scientific paper, the method of making nitroglycerin, and was so fired by the wonderful properties it was said to possess, that I determined to make some of the compound. We tested what we considered a very small quantity, but this produced such terrible and unexpected results that we became alarmed, the fact dawning on us that we had a very large white elephant in our possession. At 6 a.m. I put the explosive into a sarsaparilla bottle, tied a string to it, wrapped it up in a paper, and gently let it down in the sewer, corner of State and Washington Streets. The associate in this was a man whom he had found endeavoring to make electrical apparatus for sleight-of-hand performances. In the Boston Telegraph office at that time, as perhaps at others, there were operators studying to enter college. Possibly some were already in attendance at Harvard University. This condition was not unusual at one time. The first electrical engineer graduated from Columbia University, New York, followed up his studies while a night operator, came out brilliantly at the head of his class. Edison says of these scholars that they paraded their knowledge rather freely, and it was his delight to go to the second-hand bookstores on Cornhill and study up questions that he could spring upon them when he got an occasion. With those engaged on night duty, he got midnight lunch from an old Irishman called the Cake Man, who appeared regularly with his wares at twelve midnight. The office was on the ground floor, and had been a restaurant previous to its occupation by the Western Union Telegraph Company. It was literally loaded with cockroaches, which lived between the wall and the board running around the room at the floor, and which came out after the lunch. These were such a bother on my table that I pasted two strips of tin foil on the wall at my desk, connecting one piece to the positive side of a, the big battery supplying current to the wires, and the negative pole to the other strip. The cockroaches moving up on the wall would pass over the strips. The moment they got their legs across both strips, there was a flash of light, and the cockroaches went up into gas. This automatic electrocuting device attracted so much attention and got half a column in an evening paper that the manager made me stop it. The reader will remember that a similar plan of campaign against rats was carried out by Edison while in the West. About this time, Edison had a narrow escape from injury, which might easily have shortened his career, and he seems to have provoked the trouble more or less innocently by using a little elementary chemistry. After being in Boston several months, he says, working New York Wire 1, I was requested to work the press wire, called the Milk Route, as there were so many towns on it taking press simultaneously. New York office had reported great delays on the wire, due to operators constantly interrupting, or breaking, as it was called, to have words repeated which they failed to get. And New York claimed that Boston was one of the worst offenders. It was a rather hard position for me, for I took the report without breaking, and it would prove the previous Boston operator incompetent. The results made the operators have some hard feelings against me. He was put back on the wire and did much better after that. It seems that the office boy was down on this man. One night he asked me if I could tell him how to fix a key so it would not break, even if the circuit breaker was open, and also so it could not be easily detected. I told him to jab a penful of ink on the platinum points, so that there was sugar enough to make it sufficiently thick to hold up while the operator tried to break. The current was still going through the ink, so he could not break. The next night about 1 a.m., this operator, on the press wire, while I was standing near a house printer, studying it, pulled out a glass insulator, then used upside down as a substitute for an ink bottle, and threw it with great violence at me, just missing my head. It would certainly have killed me if it had not missed. The cause of the trouble was that this operator was doing his best he could not to break, but being compelled to, opened the key, and found he couldn't. The press matter came right along and he couldn't stop it. The office boy had put the ink in a few minutes before, when the operator had turned his head during a law. He blamed me instinctively as the cause of the trouble. Later on we became good friends. He took his meals at the same emaciator that I did. 
his main object in life seemed to be acquiring the art of throwing up wash pitchers and catching them without breaking them. About one-third of his salary was used in paying for pitchers. One day a request reached the Western Union Telegraph Office in Boston from the principal of a select school for young ladies, to the effect that she would like someone to be sent up to the school to exhibit and describe the Morse telegraph to her children. There had always been a warm interest in Boston for, in the life and work of Morse, who had been born there at Charlestown, barely a mile from the birthplace of Franklin, and this request for a little lecture on Morse's telegraph was quite natural. Edison, who was always ready to earn some extra money for his experiments, and was already known as the best informed operator in the office, accepted the invitation. What happened is described by Adams as follows. We gathered up a couple of sounders, a battery, and a sonic wire, and at the appointed time called on her to do the stunt. Her schoolroom was about 20 feet by 20 feet, not including a small platform. We rigged up the line between the two ends of the room, Edison taking the stage while I was at the other end of the room. All being in readiness, the principal was told to bring in her children. The door opened, and in came about twenty young ladies, elegantly gowned, not one of whom was under seventeen. When Edison saw them, I thought he would faint. He called me on the line and asked me to come to the stage and explain the mysteries of the Morse system. I replied that I thought that he was in the right place, and told him to get busy with his talks on dots and dashes. Always modest, Edison was so overcome he could hardly speak, but he managed to say, finally, that his friend, Mr. Adams, was better equipped with cheek than he was. We would change places, and he would do the demonstrating while I explained the whole thing. This caused the bevy to turn to see who, where the lecturer was. I went to the stage, saying something, and we did some telegraphing over the line. I guess it was satisfactory. We got the money, which was the main point to us. Edison tells the story in a similar manner, but insists that it was he who saved the situation. I managed to say that I would work the apparatus, and Mr. Adams would do, make the explanations. Adams was so embarrassed that he fell over an ottoman. The girls tittered, and this increased his embarrassment until he couldn't say a word. The situation was so desperate that for a reason I could never explain, I started in myself, and talked and explained better than I had ever did before or since. I can talk to two or three persons but when there are more, they radiate some unknown form of influence which paralyzes my vocal cords. However, I got out of this scrape, and many times afterwards, when I chanced with other operators to meet some of the young ladies on their way home from school, they would smile and nod, much to the mystification of the operators, who were ignorant of this episode. Another amusing story of this period of impecuniosity and financial strain is thus told by Edison. My friend Adams was working in the Franklin Telegraph Company, which competed with the Western Union. Adams was laid off, and as his financial resources had reached absolute zero centigrade, I undertook to let him sleep in my hall bedroom. I generally had hall bedrooms because they were cheap and I needed money to buy apparatus. I also had the pleasure of his genial company at the boarding house about a mile distant, but at the sacrifice of some apparatus. One morning, as we were hastening to breakfast, we came in to Tremont Row, and saw a large crowd in front of two small gents furnishing goods stores. We stopped to ascertain the cause of the excitement. One store put up a paper sign in the display window which said, Three hundred pairs of stockings received this day. Five cents a pair. No connection with the store next door. Presently, the other store put up a sign stating that they had received three hundred pairs, price three cents per pair, and stated that they had no connection with the store next door. Nobody went in. The crowd kept increasing. Finally, when the price had reached three pairs for one cent, Adam says to me, I can't stand this any longer. Give me a cent. I gave him a nickel, and he elbowed his way in, and throwing the money on the counter, the store being filled with women clerks, he said, Give me three pairs. The crowd was breathless, and a girl took down a box and drew out three pairs of baby socks. Oh, said Adams, I want men's size. Well, sir, we do not permit one to pick sizes for that amount of money. And the crowd roared, and this broke up the sales. It was generally supposed that Edison did not take up work on the stock ticker until after his arrival a little later in New York. But he says, After the vote recorder, I invented a stock ticker, and started a ticker service in Boston, and had 30 or 40 subscribers, and it operated from a room over the gold exchange. 
This was about a year after Callahan started in New York. To say the least, this evidenced great ability and enterprise on part of the youth. The dealings in gold during the Civil War and after its close had brought gold indicators into use, and these had soon been followed by stock tickers, the first of which was introduced in New York in 1867. The success of this new but primitively crude class of apparatus was immediate. Four manufacturers were soon busy trying to keep pace with the demands for it from brokers, and the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company formed to exploit the system, which soon increased its capital from 200000 to 300000 paying 12 cent dividends on the latter amount. Within its first year, the capital was again increased to $1 million, and the dividends of 10% were easily paid on that sum also. It is needless to say that such facts became quickly known among the operators, from whose ranks, of course, the new employees were enlisted, and it was a common ambition among the more ingenious to produce a new stock ticker. From the beginning, each phase of electrical development, indeed each step in mechanics, has been accompanied by the well-known phenomenon of invention, namely the attempt of the many to perfect and refine and even reinvent where one or two daring spirits have led the way. The figures of capitalization and profit just mentioned were relatively much larger in the 60s than they are today, and to enterprising young operators they spelled illimitable wealth. Edison was, however, about the only one in Boston of whom history makes record as achieving any tangible result in this new art, and he soon longed for the larger telegraphic opportunity of New York. His friend, Milt Adams, went west with quenchless zest for that kind of roving life and aimless adventure of which the serious-minded Edison had already had more than enough of. Realizing that to New York he must look for further support in his efforts, Edison, deep in debt for his embryonic inventions, but with high hope and courage, now made the next monumentous step in his career. He was far riper in experience and practice of his art than any other telegrapher of his age, and had acquired, moreover, no little knowledge of the practical business of life. Note has been made above of his invention of a stock ticker in Boston, and of his establishing a stock quotation circuit. This was by no means all, and as a fitting close to this chapter, he may be quoted as to some other work and its perils in experimentation. I was also engaged in putting up private lines upon which I used an alphabetical dial instrument for telegraphing between business establishments, a forerunner of modern telephony. This instrument was very simple and practical, and anyone could work it after a few minutes' explanation. I had these instruments made at Mr. Hamplet's, who had a little shop where he was engaged in experimenting with electric clocks. Mr. Hamlet was the father and introducer in, after years of the Western Union telegraph system, of time distribution. My laboratory was the headquarters for the men, and also of tools and supplies for these private lines. They were put up cheaply, as I used the roofs of houses, just as the Western Union did. It never occurred to me to ask permission from the owners. All we did was to go to the store, etc., say we were telegraph men and wanted to go up on the wires on the roof. Permission was always granted. In this laboratory, I had a large induction coil, which I borrowed to make some experiments with. One day I got a hold of both electrodes of the coil, and it clinched my hand on them so I couldn't let go. The battery was on the shelf. The only way I could get free was to back off and pull the coil, so that the battery wires would pull the cells off the shelf and thus break the circuit. I shut my eyes and pulled, but the nitric acid splashed all over my face and ran down my back. I rushed to a sink, which was only half big enough, and got in as well as I could and wiggled around for several minutes to permit the water to dilute the acid and stop the pain. My face and back were streaked with yellow. The skin was thoroughly oxidized. I did not go on the street by daylight for two weeks, as the appearance of my face was dreadful. The skin, however, peeled off, and new skin replaced it without any damage. End of chapter 6《Start a Recording Intro》Chapter 7 of Edison, His Life and Inventions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ray Christensen Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dreyer and Thomas Comerford Martin 
Chapter 7 The Stock Ticker The letters and figures used in the language of the tape, said a well-known Boston stock speculator, are very few, but they spell ruin in 99 million ways. It is not to be inferred, however, that the modern stock ticker has anything to do with the making or losing of fortunes. There were regular daily stock market reports in London newspapers in 1825, and New York soon followed the example. As far back as 1692, Houghton issued in London a weekly review of financial and commercial transactions, upon which Macaulay based the lively narrative of stock speculation in the 17th century given in his famous history. That which the ubiquitous stock ticker has done is to give instantaneously to the news of what the stock market is doing so that at every minute thousands of miles apart brokers, investors, and gamblers may learn the exact conditions. The existence of such facilities is to be admired rather than deplored. News is vital to Wall Street, and there is no living man on whom the things in Wall Street are without effect. Financial history of the United States and of the world, as shown by the prices of government bonds and general securities, has been told daily for 40 years on these narrow strips of paper tape, of which thousands of miles are yearly run through the tickers of the New York alone. It is true that the record of the chattering little machine made in cannibalistic abbreviations on the tape can drive a man suddenly to the very verge of insanity with joy or despair. But if there be blame for that, it attaches to the American spirit of speculation and not to the ingenious mechanism which reads and registers the beating of the financial pulse. Edison came first to New York in 1868 with his early stock printer which he tried unsuccessfully to sell. He went back to Boston and quite undismayed got up a duplex telegraph. Toward the end of my stay in Boston, he says, I obtained a loan of money amounting to $800 to build a particular kind of duplex telegraph for sending two messages over a single wire simultaneously. The apparatus was built and I left the Western Union employ and went to Rochester, New York to test the apparatus on the lines of the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph between that city and New York. But the assistant at the other end could not be made to understand anything. Notwithstanding, I had written out a very minute description of just what to do. After trying for a week, I gave it up and returned to New York with but a few cents in my pocket. Thus, he who has never speculated in a stock in his life was destined to make the beginnings of his own fortune but by providing for others the apparatus that should bring to the eye all over a great city the momentary fluctuations of stocks and bonds. No one could have been in dire poverty than he when the steamboat landed him in New York in 1869. He was in debt and his few belongings in books and instruments had to be left behind. He was not far from starving. Mr. W. S. Mallory, an associate of many years, quotes directly from him on this point. Some years ago, we had a business negotiation in New York, which made it necessary for Mr. Edison and me to visit the city five or six times within a comparatively short period. It was our custom to leave Orange about 11 a.m. on arrival in New York to get our lunch before keeping the appointments, which were usually made for two o'clock. Several of these lunches were at Domonico's, Sherry's, and other places of similar character. But one day, while en route, Mr. Edison said, I have been to lunch with you several times now today. I am going to take you to lunch with me and give you the finest lunch you have ever had. When we arrived at Hoboken, we took the downtown ferry across the Hudson. And when we arrived on the Manhattan side, Mr. Edison led the way to Smith and McNeil's, opposite Washington Market and well known to old New Yorkers. We went inside and as soon as the waiter appeared, Mr. Edison ordered apple dumplings and a cup of coffee for himself. He consumed his share of the lunch with the greatest possible pleasure. Then as soon as he'd finished, he went to the cigar counter and purchased cigars. 
As we walked to keep the appointment, he gave me the following reminiscence. When he left Boston and decided to come to New York, he had only money enough for the trip. After leaving the boat, his first thought was of breakfast, but he was without money to obtain it. However, in passing a wholesale tea house, he saw a man tasting tea. So he went in and asked the taster if he might have some of the tea. This the man gave him, and thus he obtained his first breakfast in New York. He knew a telegraph operator here, and on him he depended a loan to tide him over until such time as he should secure a position. During the day, he succeeded in locating this operator, but found that he also was out of a job and that the best he could do was loan him one dollar, which he did. This small sum of money represented both food and lodging until time as work could be obtained. Edison said that as a result of the time consumed and the exercise in walking while he found his friend, he was extremely hungry and that he gave most serious consideration as to what he should buy in the way of food and what particular kind of food would be most satisfying and filling. The result was that at Smith and McNeil's he decided to, on apple dumplings and a cup of coffee, that which he never ate anything more appetizing. It was not long before he was at work and was able to live in a normal manner. During the Civil War, with its enormous increase in the national debt and the volume of paper money, gold had gone to a high premium and, as ever, by its fluctuations in the price of the value of other commodities it was determined. This led to the creation of a gold room in Wall Street, where the precious metal could be dealt in, while for dealings in stock there also extended the regular board and the open board and the long room. Devoted to one but the leading object of speculation, the gold room was the very focus of all the financial and gambling activity of the time, and its quotations governed trade and commerce. At first notations in chalk and on blackboard sufficed. But seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, vice president and actual presiding officer of the Gold Exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the Gold Indicator. At first, notations in chalk on the blackboard sufficed. But seeing their inadequacy, Dr. S. S. Laws, vice president and actual presiding officer of the Gold Exchange, devised and introduced what was popularly known as the Gold Indicator. This exhibited merely the prevailing price of gold, but as its quotations changed from instant to instant, it was in a most literal sense the sonores of the neighboring eyes. One indicator looked upon the gold room, the other opened toward the street. Within the exchange, the face could easily be seen high up on the west wall of the room, and the machine was operated by Mr. Mersasso, the official registrar of the gold board. Dr. Laws, who afterward became president of the State University of Missouri, was an inventor of unusual ability and attainments. In his early youth, he had earned his livelihood in a tool factory, and apparently with his savings, he went to Princeton, where he studied electricity under no less a teacher than the famous Joseph Henry. At the outbreak of the war in 1861, he was president of one of the Presbyterian Synodical Colleges of the South, whose buildings passed into the hands of the government. Going to Europe, he returned to New York in 1863 and became interested with a relative in financial matters. His connection with the gold exchange soon followed when it was organized. The indicating mechanism he devised was electrical, controlled at central by two circuit closed keys, and was a prototype of all the later and modern step-by-step -step printing telegraphs upon which the distribution of financial news depended. The fraction drum of the indicator could be driven in either direction, known as the advantage and retrograde movements, and was divided and marked into eighths. It geared into a unit drum, which as do speed indicators and cyclometers. Four electrical pulsations were required to move the drum the distance between the fractions. The general operation was simple, and in normally active times, the mechanism and the registrar were equal to all emergencies. But it is obvious that the recorder had to be carried away to the broker's office and other places by messengers, and the delay, confusion, and mistakes soon suggested that Dr. Laws 
the desirability of having a number of indicators at such scatter points, operated by a master transmitter and dispersing with the regiments of noisy boys. He secured this privilege of distribution and resigning from the exchange devoted his exclusive attention to the gold reporting telegraph which he patented and for which at the end of 1866 he had scarcely 50 subscribers. His indicators were small oblong boxes in the front of which was a long slot allowing the dial as they traveled past inside to show the numerals consisting the quotation the dials or wheels being arranged in a row horizontally overlapping each other as in modern fare registers which are now seen on most trolley cars. It was not long before there were 300 subscribers, but the very success of this device brought competition and improvements. Mr. E. A. Callahan, an ingenious printing telegraph operator, saw that there were unexhaustible possibilities in the idea and his foresight and inventiveness made him the father of the ticker in connection with which he was thus, like laws, one of the first to grasp and exploit the underlying principle of the central station as a universal source of supply. The genius of this invention, Mr. Callahan was told in an interesting way. In 1867, on the site of the present Mills building on Broadway Street, opposite the stock exchange of today was an old building which had been cut up to subverse the necessities of its occupants, all engaged in the dealing of gold and stocks. It had one main entrance from the street to a hallway from which entrance to the offices of two prominent broker firms was obtained. Each firm had its own army of boys numbering from 12 to 15 whose duties were to ascertain the latest quotations from the different exchanges. Each boy devoted his attention to some particularly active stock pushing each other to get into those narrow quarters, yelling out the prices at the door, and pushing back for later ones. The hustle made this doorway to me a most undesirable refuge from an April shower. I was simply whirled into the street. I naturally thought that much of this noise and confusion might be dispersed, and that the prices might be furnished through some system of telegraphy which would not require the employment of skilled operators. The conception of the stock ticker dates from this incident. Mr. Callahan's first idea was to distribute gold quotations and to this end he devised an indicator. It consisted of two dials mounted separately, each revolved by an electromagnet so that the desired figures were brought to an aperture in the case enclosing the apparatus as in the laws system. Each shaft with its dial was provided with two ratcheted wheels, one the reverse of the other. One was used in connection with the propelling lever, which was provided to a pawl to fit into the teeth of the reversed ratcheted wheel in the, on its forward movement. It was thus made impossible for either dial to go by a momentum beyond its limit. Learning that Dr. Laws, with the skillful aid of F. L. Pope, was already active in the same direction, Mr. Callahan, with ready wit, transformed his indicator into a ticker that would make a printed record. The name of the ticker came through the casual remark of a, an observer to whom the noise was the most striking feature of the mechanism. Mr. Callahan removed the two dials and substituting type wheels turned the movements face to face so that each type wheel could imprint its characters upon a paper tape in two lines. Three wires stranded together from the central office to each instrument of these, one furnished the current for the alphabet wheel, one for the figure wheel, and one for the mechanism that took care of inking and printing on the tape. Callahan made the further innovation of insulating his circuit wires. Although the cost was then 40 times as great as that of bare wires, it will be understood that electromagnets were the ticker's actuating agency. The ticker apparatus was placed under a neat glass shade and mounted on a shelf. 25 instruments were energized from one circuit, and the quotations were supplied from a central at 18 New Street. The Gold and Stott Telegraph Company was promptly organized to supply to brokers the system, which was very rapidly adopted throughout the financial district of New York at the southern tip of Manhattan Island. Quotations were transmitted by Morse Telegraph from the floor of the stock exchange to the central and thence distributed to the subscribers. Success with the stock news system was instantaneous.
It was at this juncture that Edison reached New York and, according to his own statement, found shelter at night in the battery room of the Gold Indicator Company, having meantime applied for a position as an operator with the Western Union. He had to wait a few days, and during this time he seized the opportunity to study the indicators and the complicated general transmitter in the office, controlled from the keyboard of the operator on the floor of the Gold Exchange. What happened next has been the basis of many inaccurate stories, but is dramatic enough as told in Mr. Edison's own version. On the third day of my arrival and while sitting in the office, the complicated general instrument for sending on all the lines and which made a very great noise suddenly came to a stop with a crash. Within two minutes, over 300 boys, a boy from every broker in the street, rushed upstairs and crowded the long aisle and office that hardly had room for 100, all yelling that such and such a broker's wire was out of order and to fix it at once. It was pandemonium, and the man in charge became so excited that he lost control of all knowledge he ever had. I went to the indicator and, having studied it thoroughly, knew where the trouble ought to be and found it one of the innumerable contact springs had broken off and fallen down between two gear wheels and stopped the instrument, but it was not very noticeable. As I went out to tell the man in charge what the matter was, Dr. Laws appeared in the scene, the most excited person I had seen. He demanded of the man the cause of the trouble, but the man was speechless. I ventured to say that I knew what the problem was, and he said, fix it, fix it, be quick. I removed the spring and set the contact wheels at zero, and the line, battery, and inspecting men all scattered through the financial district to set the instruments. In about two hours, things were working again. Dr. Laws came in to ask my name and what I was doing. I told him, and he asked me to come to his private office the following day. His office was filled with stacks of books, all relating to metaphysics and kindred matters. He asked me a great many questions about the instruments and his system, and I showed him how he could simplify things generally. He then requested that I should call next day. On arrival, he stated at once that he had decided to put me in charge of the whole plant and that my salary would be $300 per month. This was such a violent jump from anything I had ever seen before that it rather paralyzed me for a while. I thought it was too much to be lasting but I determined to try and live up to the salary. If 20 hours a day of hard work would do it, I kept this position, made many improvements, devised several stock tickers until the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company consolidated with the Gold Indicator Company. Certainly few changes in fortune have ever been more sudden and dramatic in any notable career than this which thus placed an ill-clad, unkempt, half-starved, eager lad in a position of such responsibility in days when the fluctuations in the price of gold at every instant meant fortune or ruin to thousands. Edison, barely 21 years old, was a keen observer of the stirring events around him. Wall Street is at any time an interesting study, but it was never at a more agitated and sensational period of its history than at this time. Edison's arrival in New York coincided with an act of speculation in gold which may, indeed, be said to have provided him with an occupation, and was soon followed by the attempt of Mr. J. Gould and his associates to corner the gold market, precipitating the panic of Black Friday, September 24, 1869. Securing its important duties and the precious metals, and thus assisting to create an artificial stringency in the gold market, the government had made it a practice to revive the situation by selling a million of gold each month. The metal was thus restored into circulation. In some manner, President Grant was persuaded that general conditions and the movement of the crops would be helped if the sale of gold were suspended for a time, and this put into effect. He went to visit an old friend in the Pennsylvania remote from railroads and telegraphs. The gold pool had acquired control of $10 million in gold and drove the price upward rapidly from 144 toward their goal of 200. On Black Friday, they purchased another $28 million at 160, and still the price went up. The financial and commercial interests of the country were in panic, but the pool persevered in its effort to corner gold. With a profit of many millions contingent on success, 
Yielding a frantic request, President Grant, who returned to Washington, caused Secretary Boutwell of the Treasury to throw four million dollars of gold into the market. Relief was instantaneous. The corner was broken, but the harm had been done. Edison's remarks shed a vivid sidelight on this extraordinary episode. On Black Friday, he says, we had a very exciting time with the indicators. The Gould and Fisk crowd had cornered gold and had run the quotations up faster than the indicator could follow. The indicator was composed of several wheels. On the circumference of each wheel were the numerals and one wheel had fractions. It worked in the same way as an ordinary counter. One wheel made ten revolutions and at the tenth it advanced the adjacent wheel and this in its turn having gone ten revolutions advanced the next wheel and so on. On the morning of Black Friday the indicator was quoting 150 premium whereas the bids by Gould's agents in the gold room were 165 for five millions or any part. We had a paperweight at the transmitter to speed it up and by one o'clock reached the right quotation. The excitement was prodigious. New York as well as Broad Street was jammed with excited people. I sat on top of the Western Union Telegraph booth to watch the surging crazy crowd. One man came to the booth, grabbed a pencil, and attempted to write a message to Boston. The first stroke went clear off the blank. He was so excited that he had the operator write the message for him. Amid great excitement, Spire, the banker, went crazy and it took five men to hold him and everybody lost their head. The Western Union operator came to me and said, Shake, Edison, we are okay. We've got a cent. I felt very happy because we were poor. These occasions are very enjoyable to a poor man, but they rarely occur. There is a calm sense of detachment about this description that has been possessed by the narrator even in the most anxious moments of his career. He was determined to see all that could be seen and, quitting his perch on the telegraph booth, sought the more secluded headquarters of the pool forces. A friend of mine was an operator who worked in the office of Belden and Company, 60 Broadway, which were headquarters for Fisk. Mr. Gould was uptown in the Erie office in the Grand Opera House. The firm on Broad Street, Smith and Gould and Martin, was the other branch. All were connected with wires. Gould seemed to be in charge, Fisk being the executive downtown. Fisk wore a velvet corduroy coat and a very peculiar vest. He was very chipper and seemed to be light-hearted and happy. Sitting around the room were about a dozen fine-looking men. All had the complexion of cadavers. There was a basket of champagne. Hundreds of boys were rushing and paying checks, all checks being payable to Belden and Company. When James Brown of Brown Brothers and Company broke the corner by selling five million gold, all payments were repudiated by Smith, Gould, and Martin, but they continued to receive checks at Belden and Companies for some time until the street got wind of the game. There was some kind of conspiracy with the government people which I could not make out, but I heard messages that opened my eyes as to the ramifications of Wall Street. Gold fell to 132 and it took us all night to get the indicator back to that quotation. All night long the streets were full of people. Every broker's office was brilliantly lighted all night and all hands were at work. The clearing house for gold had been swamped and all was mixed up. No one knew if he was bankrupt or not. Edison in those days rather liked the modest coffee shops and mentions visiting one. When on the New York number one wire that I worked in Boston there was an operator named Jerry Brost at the other end. He was a first-class receiver and rapid sender. We made up a scheme to hold this wire so he changed one letter of the alphabet and as soon as I got used to it and finally we changed three letters. If any operator tried to receive from Brost he couldn't do it so Brost and I always worked together. Brost did less talking than any operator I ever knew. Never having seen him I went while in New York to call upon him. I did all the talking. He would listen, stroke his beard, and say nothing. In the evening I went over to an all-night lunch house in the printing house square in a basement, Oliver's. Night editors included Horace Greeley and Henry Raymond of the New York Times took their midnight lunch there. When I went with Brost and the other operator, they pointed out two or three men who were then celebrated in the newspaper world. The night was intensely hot and close. 
After getting our lunch and upon reaching the sidewalk, Brost opened his mouth and said, That's a great place. A plate of cakes, a cup of coffee, and a Russian bath for 10 cents. This was about 50% of his conversation for two days. The work of Edison on the gold indicator had thrown him into close relationships with Mr. Franklin L. Pope, the young telegraph engineer then associated with Dr. Laws, and afterward a distinguished expert and technical writer who became president of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers in 1886. Each recognized the special ability of the other, and barely a week after the famous events of Black Friday, the announcement of their partnership appeared in the Telegrapher of October 1, 1869. This was the first professional card, if it may be so described, ever issued in America by a form of electrical engineers, and is here reproduced. It is probable that the advertisement, one of the largest in the Telegrapher, and appearing frequently, was not paid for at full rates, as the publisher, Mr. J. N. Ashley, became a partner in the firm and not altogether a sleeping one when it came to the division of profits, which at times were considerable. In order to be near his new friend, Edison boarded the Pope at Elizabeth, New Jersey for some time, living the strenuous life and the performance of his duties. Associated with Pope and Ashley, he followed up his work on telegraph printers with marked success. While with them, I devised a printer to print gold quotations instead of indicating them the lines were started and the whole was sold out to the Gould and Stock Telegraph Company. My experimenting was all done in that small shop of Dr. Bradley, located near the station of the Pennsylvania Railroad in New Jersey City. Every night I left for Elizabeth on the 1 a.m. train, then walked half a mile to Mr. Pope's house and up at 6 a.m. for breakfast to catch the 7 a.m. train. This continued for all winter and many were the occasions when I was nearly frozen in the Elizabeth Walk. This Dr. Bradley appears to have been the first in this country to make electrical measurements of precision with a galvanometer, but was an old school experimenter who had worked for years on an experiment without commercial value. He was also extremely irascible, and when on one occasion the connecting wire would not come out of one of the binding posts of a new and costly galvanometer, he jerked the instrument to the floor and then jumped on it. He must have been, however, a man of originality, as evidenced by his attempt to age whiskey by electricity, an attempt that has often been made. The hobby he had at the time I was there, says Edison, was the aging of raw whiskey by passing strong electric currents through it. He had arranged 20 jars with platinum electrodes held in place by hard rubber. When all was ready, he filled the cells with whiskey, connected the battery, locked the door of the small room to which he had placed, and gave positive orders that no one should enter. He then disappeared for three days. On the second day, we noticed a terrible smell in the shop, as if from some dead animal. The next day, the doctor arrived, and noticing the smell, asked what was dead. We all thought something had gotten into his whiskey room and died. He opened it and was nearly overcome. The hard rubber he used was, of course, full of sulfur, and this being attacked by a nauseous hydrogen had produced sulfide hydrogen gas in torrents, displacing all the air in the room. Sulfuride hydrogen is, as is well known, the gas given off by rotten eggs. Another glimpse of this period of development is afforded by an interesting article on the stock reporting telegraph in the Electrical World of March 4, 1899, by Mr. Ralph W. Pope the well-known secretary of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, who had as a youth an active and intimate connection with that branch of the electrical industry. In the course of his article, he mentions the curious fact that Dr. Laws at first, in receiving quotations from the exchanges, was so distrustful of the Morris system that he installed long lines of speaking tubes as a more satisfactory and safe device than the telegraph wires. As to the relations of that time, Mr. Pope remarks, The rivalry between the two concerns resulted in consolidation, Dr. Law's enterprise being absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, while the Law stock printer was relegated to the scrap heap and the museum competition in the field did not, however, cease. Messrs. Pope and Edison invented a one-wire printer 
and started a system of gold printers devoted to the recording of gold quotations and sterling exchange only. It was intended more specifically for importers and exchange brokers and was furnished at a lower price than the indicator service. The building and equipment of private telegraph lines was also entered upon. This business was subsequently absorbed by the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, which was probably at this time at the height of its prosperity. The financial organization of the company was peculiar and worthy of attention. Each subscriber for a machine paid in $100 for the privilege of securing an instrument. For the service he paid $25 weekly. In case he retired or failed, he could transfer his right and employees were constantly on the alert for purchasable rights, which could be disposed of at a profit. It was occasionally worth the profit to convince a man that he did not actually own the machine which had been placed in his office. The Western Union Telegraph Company secured a majority of its stock and General Marshall Lefferts was elected president. A private line department was established and the business taken over from Pope, Edison, and Ashley was rapidly enlarged. At this juncture, General Lefferts, as president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, requested Edison to go to work on improving the stock ticker. Furnishing the money and the well-known universal ticker in widespread use in this day was one result. Mr. Edison gives a graphic picture of the startling efforts of his fortunes. I made a great many inventions. One was the special ticker used for many years outside of New York in other large cities. This was made exceedingly simple, as they did not have the experts we had in New York to handle anything complicated. The same ticker was used on the London Stock Exchange. After I had made a great number of inventions and obtained patents, the general seemed anxious that the matter should be closed up. One day I exhibited and worked on a successful device whereby if a ticker should get out of unison in a broker's office and commence to print wild figures, it could be brought in unison from the central station, which saved the labor of many men and much trouble to the broker. He called me into his office and said, Now, young man, I want to close up the matter of your inventions. How much do you think you should receive? I had made up my mind that taking into consideration the time and the killing pace I was working at, I should be entitled to $5,000, but could get along with $3,000. When the psychological moment arrived, I hadn't the nerve to name such a large sum, so I said, Well, General, suppose you make me offer. Then he said, How would $40,000 strike you? This caused me to come as near fainting as I had ever got. I was afraid he would hear my heart beat. I managed to say that I thought it was fair. All right, I will have a contract drawn. Come around in three days and sign it, and I will give you the money. I arrived on time, but had been doing some considerable thinking on the subject. The sum seemed to be very large for the amount of work, for at that time I determined the value by the time and trouble, and not by what the invention was worth to others. I thought there was something unreal about it. However, the contract was handed to me. I signed without reading it. Edison was then handed the first check he'd ever received, one for $40,000 drawn on the Bank of New York at the corner of William and Wall Street. On going to the bank and passing in the check of the paying teller, some brief remarks were made to him, which in his deafness he did not understand. The check was handed back to him and Edison, fancying for a moment that in some way he had been cheated, went outside to the large steps to let the cold sweat evaporate. He then went back to the general, who with his secretary had a good laugh over the matter, told him the check must be endorsed, and sent him with a young man to identify him. The ceremony of identification performed with the paying teller, who was quite merry over the incident. Edison was given the amount in bundles of small bills, until there certainly seemed to be a one cubit foot. Unaware that he was the victim of a practical joke, Edison proceeded gravely to stow away the money in his overcoat pockets and all his other pockets. He then went to Newark and sat up all night with the money for fear it might be stolen. Once more he sought help next morning, when the general laughed heartily and telling the clerk that the joke must be not carried any further, and enabled him to deposit the currency in the bank and open an account. Thus, in an inconceivably brief time, had Edison passed from poverty to independence. 
made a deep impression as to his originality and ability on important people and brought out valuable inventions, lifting himself at one bound out of the ruck of mediocrity and away from the deadening drudgery of a key. Best of all, he was enterprising, one of the leaders and pioneers for whom the world is always looking. And to use his own criticism of himself, he had too sanguine a temperament to keep money in solitary confinement. Quiet self-possession, he seized his opportunity, began to buy machinery, rented a shop, and got to work. Moving quickly into a larger shop, numbers 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, New Jersey, he secured large orders from General Lefferitz to build stock tickers and employed 50 men. As business increased, he put on a night force and was his own foreman on both shifts. Half an hour of sleep three or four times in the 24 hours was all he needed in those days. When one invention succeeded, another with dazzling rapidity, and when he worked with the new fierce eruptive energy of a great volcano, throwing out new ideas incessantly with spectacular effect on the arts to which they related. It has always been a theory with Edison that we need sleep altogether too much, but on the other hand, he never until long past 50 knew or practiced the slightest moderation in his work or in the use of strong coffee and black cigars. He has moreover, while of tender and kindly disposition, never hesitated to use men up as freely as a Napoleon or Grant, seeing only the goal of a complete invention or perfect device to attain which all else must become subsidiary. He gives a graphic picture of his first methods as a manufacturer. Nearly all of my men were on piecework, and I allowed them to make good wages and never cut until the pay became absurdly high as they got more expert. I kept no books. I had two hooks. All the bills and accounts I owned I jabbed on one hook, and the memorandum of all who owed me I put on the other. When some of the bills fell due and I couldn't deliver tickets to get a supply of money, I gave a note. When the notes were due, a messenger came around from the bank with the note and a protest pinned to it for $1.25. Then I would go to New York and get an advance or pay the note if I had the money. This method of giving notes for my accounts and having all notes protested I kept up for over two years, yet my credit was fine. Every store I traded with was always glad to furnish goods perhaps in amazed admiration of my system of doing business, which was certainly new. After a while, Edison got a bookkeeper whose vagrancies made him look back with regret on the earlier primitive method. The first three months I had him go over all the books to find out how much we made. He reported $3,000. I gave a supper to some of my men to celebrate this, only to be told two days afterward that he made a mistake and we had lost $500. And then a few days after that, he came to me again and said he was all mixed up, and now he found we'd made over $7,000. Edison changed bookkeepers, but never thereafter counted anything real profit until he had paid all his debts and had the profits in the bank. The factory work at this time related chiefly to stock tickers, principally the Universal, of which at one time 1,200 were in use. Edison's connections with this particular device was very close while it lasted. In a review of the ticker art, Mr. Callahan stated, with rather grudging praise, that a ticker at the present time, 1901, would be considered as impractical and unsaleable if it were not provided with a unison device. And he goes on to remark, the first unison on stock tickers was one used on the Laws printer, footnote two. It was a crude and unsatisfactory piece of mechanism and necessitated doubling of the battery in order to bring it into action. It was short-lived. The Edison unison compromised a lever with a free end traveling on a spiral or worm on the type wheel shaft until it met a pin at the end of the worm, thus obstructing the shaft and leaving the type wheels at the zero point until released by the printing lever. This device is too well known to require a further description. It is not applicable to any instrument using two independently moving type wheels, but on nearly, if not all, other instruments will be found in use. The stock ticker has enjoyed the devotion of many brilliant inventors, G.M. Phelps, H. Van Hovenberg, A.A. A. Knudsen, 
G. B. Scott, S. D. Field, John Burry, and remains in extensive use as an application for which no substitute or competitor has been found. In New York, the two great stock exchanges have deemed it necessary to own and operate a stock ticker service for the sole benefit of their members. And down to the present moment, the process of improvement has gone on, impelled by the increasing volume of business to be reported. It is significant of Edison's work, now dimmed and overlaid by later advances, that at the very outset he recognized the vital importance of the interchangeability in the construction of this delicate and sensitive apparatus. But the difficulties of these early days were almost insurmountable. Mr. R. W. Pope says of the universal machines that they were simple and substantial and generally satisfactory, but adds, these instruments were supposed to have been made with interchangeable parts, but as a matter of fact, the instances in which these parts would fit were very few. The instruction book prepared for the use of the inspector states that the parts should not be tinkered or bent as they are accurately made and interchangeable. The difficulties encountered in fitting them properly doubtless gave rise to a story that Mr. Edison had stated there were three degrees of interchangeability. This was interpreted to mean first the parts will fit, second they will almost fit, third they do not fit and can't be made to fit. Footnote 2. This I invented as well. T-A-E. This early shop affords an illustration of the manner in which Edison has made a deep impression on the personnel of the electrical arts. At a single bench, there worked three men since rich or prominent. One was Sigmund Bergman, for a time partner with Edison in his lighting developments in the United States, and now head and principal owner of the electrical works in Berlin, employing 10,000 men. The next man adjacent was John Crusey, afterward engineer of the great General Electric Works at Schenectady. A third was Schuckert, who left the bench to settle up with his father's little estate in Nuremberg, stayed there and founded electrical factories, which became the third largest in Germany, their proprietor dying very wealthy. I gave them good training as to working hours and hustling, says their quadrum master, and this is equally true as applies to many scores of others working in companies bearing Edison's name or organized under Edison patents. It is curiously sufficient in this connection that of the 21 presidents of the National Society, the American Institute of the Electrical Engineers, founded in 1884, eight have been intimately associated with Edison, namely Norvin Green and F. L. Polk as business colleagues of the days of which we now write, while Messrs. Frank J. Sprague, T. C. Martin, A. E. Kenley, S. S. Wheeler, John W. Lieb, Jr., and Lewis Ferguson have all been at one time or another in Edison employ. The remark was once made that if a famous American teacher sat at one end of a log and a student at the other end, the elements of a successful university were present. It is equally true that in Edison and the many men who have graduated from his stern school of endeavor, America has had its foremost seat of electrical engineering. End of chapter 7. End of Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dreyer and Thomas Cromford Martin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin Chapter 8 Automatic, Duplex, and Quadruplex Telegraphy Work of various kinds poured in upon the young manufacturer, busy also with his own schemes and inventions, which soon began to follow so many distinct lines of inquiry that it ceases to be easy or necessary for the historian to treat them all in chronological sequence. Some notions of his ceaseless activity may be formed from the fact that he started no fewer than three shops in Newark during 1870 and 1871. 
and while directing these was also engaged by the men who controlled the automatic telegraph company of new york which had a circuit to washington to help it out of its difficulties Quote, soon after starting the large shop ten and twelve ward street newark i rented shop room to the inventor of a new rifle i think it was the burden in any event it was a rifle which was subsequently adopted by the british army the inventor employed a toolmaker who was the finest and best toolmaker i had ever seen i noticed that he worked pretty near the whole of the twenty-four hours this kind of application i was looking for he was getting twenty one dollars fifty cents per week and was also paid for overtime i asked him if he could run the shop i don't know try me he said all right i will give you sixty dollars per week to run both shifts he went at it his executive ability was greater than that of any other man i have yet seen his memory was prodigious conversation laconic and movements rapid he doubled the production inside three months without materially increasing the payroll by increasing the cutting speeds of tools and by the use of various devices when in need of rest he would lie down on a workbench sleep twenty or thirty minutes and wake up fresh as this was just what i could do i naturally conceived great pride in having such a man in charge of my work but almost everything has trouble connected with it he disappeared one day and although i sent men everywhere that it was likely he could be found he was not discovered after two weeks he came into the factory in a terrible condition as to clothes and face he sat down and turning to me said edison it's no use this is the third time i can't stand prosperity put my salary back and give me a job i was very sorry to learn that it was whiskey that spoiled such a career i gave him an inferior job and kept him for a long time unquote. edison had now entered definitely upon that career as an inventor which has left so deep an imprint on the records of the united states patent office where from his first patent in eighteen sixty nine up to the summer of nineteen ten no fewer than one thousand three hundred twenty eight separate patents have been applied for in his name averaging thirty two every year and one about every eleven days with a substantially corresponding number issued the height of this inventive activity was attained about eighteen eighty two in which year no fewer than one hundred forty one patents were applied for and seventy five granted to him or nearly nine times as many as in eighteen seventy six when invention as a profession may be said to have been adopted by this prolific genius it will be understood of course that even these figures do not represent the full measure of active invention as in every process and at every step there were many discoveries that were not brought to patent registration but remained trade secrets and furthermore that in practically every case the actual patented invention followed from one to a dozen or more gradually developing forms of the same idea an englishman named george little had brought over a system of automatic telegraphy which worked well on a short line but was a failure when put upon the longer circuits for which automatic methods are best adapted the general principle involved in automatic or rapid telegraphs except the photographic ones is that of preparing the message in advance for dispatch by perforating narrow strips of paper with holes work which can be done either by hand punches or by typewriter apparatus a certain group of perforations corresponds to a morse group of dots and dashes for a letter of the alphabet when the tape thus made ready is run rapidly through a transmitting machine electrical contact occurs wherever there is a perforation permitting the current from the battery to flow into the line and thus transmit signals correspondingly at the distant end these signals are received sometimes on ink writing recorder as dots and dashes or even as typewriting letters but in many of the earlier systems like that of bain the record at the higher rates of speed was affected by chemical means 
a tell-tale stain being made on the travelling strip of paper by every spurt of incoming current. Solutions of potassium iodide were frequently used for this purpose, giving a sharp blue record, but fading away too rapidly. The little system had perforating apparatus operated by electromagnets. Its transmitting machine was driven by a small electromagnetic motor, and the record was made by electrochemical decomposition. The writing member being a minute platinum roller instead of the more familiar iron stylus. Moreover, a special type of wire had been put up for the single circuit of 280 miles between New York and Washington. This is believed to have been the first compound wire made for telegraphic or other signaling purposes, the object being to secure greater lightness with textile strength and high conductivity. It had a steel core with a copper ribbon wound spirally around it and tinned to the core wire. But the results obtained were poor, and in their necessity the parties in interest turned to Edison. Mr. E. H. Johnson tells of the conditions. Quote, General W. J. Palmer and some New York associates had taken up the little automatic system and had expended quite a sum in its development, when, thinking that they had reduced it to practice, they got Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad to send his superintendent of telegraph over to look into and report upon it. Of course he turned it down. The syndicate was appalled at this report, and in this extremity General Palmer thought of the man who had impressed him as knowing it all by the telling of telegraphic tales as a means of whiling away lonesome hours on the plains of Colorado, where they were associated in railroad building. So this man, it was I, was sent for to come to New York and assuage their grief if possible. My report was that the system was sound fundamentally that it contained the germ of a good thing, but needed working out. Associated with General Palmer was one Colonel Josiah C. Reef, then Eastern Bond Agent for the Kansas Pacific Railroad. The Colonel was always resourceful, and didn't fail in this case. He knew of a young fellow who was doing some good work for Marshall Lefferts, and who it was said was a genius at invention, and a very fiend for work. His name was Edison, and he had a shop out of Newark, New Jersey. He came and was put in my care for the purpose of a mutual exchange of ideas and for a report by me as to his competency in the matter. This was my introduction to Edison. He confirmed my views of the automatic system. He saw its possibilities as well as the chief obstacles to be overcome, viz. the sluggishness of the wire, together with the need of mechanical betterment of the apparatus, and he agreed to take the job on one condition, namely, that Johnson would stay and help, as he was the man with ideas. Mr. Johnson was accordingly given three months' leave from Colorado Railroad Building, and has never seen Colorado since." Unquote. Applying himself to the difficulties with wanted energy, Edison devised new apparatus, and solved the problem to such an extent that he and his assistants succeeded in transmitting and recording 1,000 words per minute between New York and Washington, and 3,500 words per minute to Philadelphia. Ordinary manual transmission by key is not in excess of 40 to 50 words a minute. Stated very briefly, Edison's principal contribution to the commercial development of the automatic was based on the observation that in a line of considerable length, electrical impulses become enormously extended or sluggish due to a phenomenon known as self-induction, which with ordinary Morse work is in a measure corrected by condensers. But in the automatic, the aim was to deal with impulses following each other from 25 to 100 times as rapidly as in Morse lines, and to attempt to receive and record intelligibly such a lightning-like succession of signals would have seemed impossible. But Edison discovered that by utilizing a shunt around the receiving instrument with a soft iron core, the self-induction would produce a momentary and instantaneous reversal of the current at the end of each impulse, and thereby give an absolutely sharp definition to each signal. 
This discovery did away entirely with sluggishness, and made it possible to secure high speeds over lines of comparatively great lengths. But Edison's work on the automatic did not stop with this basic suggestion, for he took up and perfected the mechanical construction of the instruments, as well as the perforators, and also suggested numerous electrosensitive chemicals for the receivers, so that the automatic telegraph, almost entirely by reason of his individual work, was placed on a plane of commercial practicability. The long line of patents secured by him in this art is an interesting exhibit of the development of a germ to a completed system, not, as is usually the case, by numerous inventors working over considerable periods of time, but by one man evolving the successive steps at a white heat of activity. The system was put in commercial operation, but the company, now encouraged, was quite willing to allow Edison to work out his idea of an automatic that would print the message in bold Roman letters instead of in dots and dashes, with consequent gain in speed in delivery of the message after its receipt in the operating room, it being obviously necessary in the case of any message received in Morse characters to copy it in script before delivery to the recipient. A large shop was rented in Newark, equipped with $25,000 worth of machinery, and Edison was given full charge. Here he built their original type of apparatus, as improved, and also pushed his experiments on the letter system so far that at a test between New York and Philadelphia, 3,000 words were sent in one minute and recorded in Roman type. Mr. D. N. Craig, one of the early organizers of the Associated Press, became interested in this company, whose president was Mr. George Harrington, formerly Assistant Secretary of the United States Treasury. Mr. Craig brought with him at this time, the early 70s, from Milwaukee a Mr. Scholes, who had a wooden model of a machine to which had been given the then new and unfamiliar name of Typewriter. Craig was interested in the machine and put the model in Edison's hands to perfect. Quote, this typewriter proved a difficult thing, says Edison, to make commercial. The alignment of the letters was awful. One letter would be one sixteenth of an inch above the others, and all the letters wanted to wander out of line. I worked on it till the machine gave fair results. Some were made and used in the office of the automatic company. Craig was very sanguine that some day all business letters would be written on a typewriter. He died before that took place, but it gradually made its way. The typewriter I got into commercial shape is now known as the Remington. About this time, I got an idea I could devise an apparatus by which four messages could simultaneously be sent over a single wire without interfering with each other. I now had five shops, and with experimenting on this new scheme I was pretty busy. At least I did not have ennui." Unquote. A very interesting picture of Mr. Edison at this time is furnished by Mr. Patrick B. Delaney, a well-known inventor in the field of automatic and multiplex telegraphy, who at that time was a chief operator of the Franklin Telegraph Company in Philadelphia. His remark about Edison is that, quote, his ingenuity inspired confidence, and wavering financiers stiffened up when it became known that he was to develop the automatic, unquote, is a noteworthy evidence of the manner in which the young inventor had already gained a firm footing. He continues, quote, Edward H. Johnson was brought on from the Denver and Rio Grande Railway to assist in the practical introduction of automatic telegraphy on a commercial basis and about this time, in 1872, I joined the enterprise. Fairly good results were obtained between New York and Washington, and Edison, indifferent to theoretical difficulties, set out to prove high speeds between New York and Charleston, South Carolina, the compound wires being hitched up to one of the southern and Atlantic wires from Washington to Charleston for the purpose of experimentation. Johnson and I went to the Charleston end to carry out Edison's plans, which were rapidly unfolded by telegraph every night from a loft on Lower Broadway, New York. We could only get the wire after all business was cleared, usually about midnight. 
and for months in the quiet hours that wire was subjected to more electrical acrobatics than any other wire ever experienced. When the experiments ended, Edison's system was put into regular commercial operation between New York and Washington, and did fine work. If the single wire had not broken about every other day, the venture would have been a financial success, but moisture got in between the copper ribbon and the steel core, setting up galvanic action which made short work of the steel. The demonstration was, however, sufficiently successful to impel J. Gould to contract to pay about four million dollars in stock for the patents. The contract was never completed so far as the four million dollars were concerned, but Gould made good use of it in getting control of the Western Union." Unquote. One of the most important persons connected with the automatic enterprise was Mr. George Harrington, to whom we have above referred, and with whom Mr. Edison entered into close confidential relations, so that the inventions made were held jointly under a partnership deed covering, quote, any inventions or improvements that may be useful or desired in automatic telegraphy, unquote. Mr. Harrington was assured at the outset by Edison that while the little perforator would give on the average only seven or eight words per minute, which was not enough for commercial purposes, he could devise one giving fifty or sixty words, and that while the little solution for the receiving tape cost fifteen dollars to seventeen dollars per gallon, he could furnish a ferric solution costing only five or six cents per gallon. In every respect, Edison made good, and in a short time the system was a success. Quote, Mr. Little having withdrawn his obsolete perforator, his ineffective resistance, his costly chemical solution, to give place to Edison's perforator, Edison's resistance and devices, and Edison's solution costing a few cents per gallon. But, continues Mr. Harrington in a memorable affidavit, the inventive efforts of Mr. Edison were not confined to automatic telegraphy, nor did they cease with the opening of that line to Washington." Unquote. They all led up to the quadruplex. Flattered by their success, Messrs. Harrington and Reef, who owned with Edison the foreign patents for the new automatic system, entered into an arrangement with the British Postal Telegraph Authorities for a trial of the system in England, involving its probable adoption if successful. Edison was sent to England to make the demonstration in 1873, reporting there to Colonel George E. Gorod, who had been an associate in the United States Treasury with Mr. Harrington, and was now connected with the new enterprise. With one small satchel of clothes, three large boxes of instruments, and a bright fellow telegrapher named Jack Wright, he took voyage on the Jumping Java, as she was humorously known, of the Cunard Line. The voyage was rough, and the little Java justified her reputation by jumping all over the ocean. Quote, At the table, says Edison, there were never more than ten or twelve people. I wondered at the time how it could pay to run an ocean steamer with so few people. But when we got into calm water and could see the green fields, I was astounded to see the number of people who appeared. There were certainly two or three hundred. I learned afterward that they were mostly going to the Vienna Exposition. Only two days could I get on deck, and on one of these a gentleman had a bad scalp wound from being thrown against the iron wall of a small smoking-room erected over a freight hatch." Unquote. Arrived in London, Edison set up his apparatus at the Telegraph Street headquarters, and sent his companion to Liverpool with the instruments for that end. The condition of the test was that he was to send from Liverpool and receive in London, and to record at the rate of one thousand words per minute, five hundred words to be sent every half hour for six hours. Edison was given a wire and batteries to operate with, but a preliminary test soon showed that he was going to fail. Both wire and batteries were poor, and one of the men detailed by the authorities to watch the test remarked quietly, in a friendly way, quote, you are not going to have much show. They are going to give you an old Bridgewater Canal wire that is so poor we don't work it, and a lot of sand batteries at Liverpool." Unquote. Footnote. The sand battery is now obsolete. In this type, 
the cell containing the elements was filled with sand, which was kept moist with an electrolyte. The situation was rather depressing to the young American, thus encountering, for the first time, the stolid conservatism and opposition to change that characterizes so much of official life and methods in Europe. Quote, I thanked him, says Edison, and hoped to reciprocate somehow. I knew I was in a hole. I had been staying at a little hotel in Covent Garden called the Hummums, and got nothing but roast beef and flounders, and my imagination was getting into a coma. What I needed was pastry. That night I found a French pastry shop in High Holborn Street and filled up. My imagination got all right. Early in the morning I saw Gorod, stated my case, and asked if he would stand for the purchase of a powerful battery to send to Liverpool. He said yes. I went immediately to Apps on the Strand and asked if he had a powerful battery. He said he hadn't, that all he had was Tyndall's Royal Institution battery, which he supposed would not serve. I saw it, one hundred cells, and getting the price, one hundred guineas, hurried to Gorod. He said, go ahead. I telegraphed to the man in Liverpool. He came on, got the battery to Liverpool set up and ready, just two hours before the test commenced. One of the principal things that made the system a success was that the line was put to earth at the sending end through a magnet, and the extra current from this, passed to the line, served to sharpen the recording waves. This new battery was strong enough to pass a powerful current through the magnet without materially diminishing the strength of the line current. Unquote. The test under these more favorable circumstances was a success. Quote, the record was as perfect as copper plate, and not a single remark was made in the time lost column. Unquote. Edison was now asked if he thought he could get a greater speed through submarine cables with this system than with the regular methods, and replied that he would like a chance to try it. For this purpose, 2,200 miles of Brazilian cable, then stored under water in tanks at the Greenwich Works of the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company near London, was placed at his disposal from 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. Quote, This just suited me, as I preferred night work. I got my apparatus down and set up, and then to get a preliminary idea of what the distortion of the signal would be, I sent a single dot, which should have been recorded upon my automatic paper by a mark about one thirty-second of an inch long. Instead of that, it was twenty-seven feet long. If I ever had any conceit, it vanished from my boots up. I worked on this cable more than two weeks, and the best I could do was two words per minute which was only one-seventh of what the guaranteed speed of the cable should be when laid. What I did not know at the time was that a coiled cable, owing to induction, was infinitely worse than when laid out straight, and that my speed was as good as, if not better than, with the regular system, but no one told me this." Unquote. While he was engaged on these tests, Colonel Garode came down one night to visit him at the Lonely Works, spent a vigil with him, and toward morning wanted coffee. There was only one little inn nearby, frequented by longshoremen and employees from the soap works and cement factories, a rough lot, and there at daybreak they went as soon as the other customers had left for work. Quote, the place had a bar and six bare tables, and was simply infested with roaches. The only things that I ever could get were coffee made from burnt bread, with brown molasses cake. I ordered these for Garode. The taste of the coffee, the insects, etc., were too much. He fainted. I gave him a big dose of gin, and this revived him. He went back to the works and waited until six when the day men came, and telegraphed for a carriage. He lost all interest in the experiments after that, and I was ordered back to America." Unquote. Edison states, however, that the automatic was finally adopted in England and used for many years, indeed is still in use there, but they took whatever was needed from his system, and he, quote, has never heard a cent from them, unquote. Arduous work was at once resumed at home on duplex and quadruplex telegraphy, 
just as though there had been no intermission or discouragement over dots twenty-seven feet long. A clue to his activity is furnished in the fact that in 1872 he had applied for 38 patents in the class of telegraphy, and 25 in 1873, several of these being for duplex methods, on which he had experimented. The earlier apparatus had been built several years prior to this, as shown by a curious little item of news that appeared in the Telegrapher of January 30, 1869. Quote, T. A. Edison has resigned his situation in the Western Union office, Boston, and will devote his time to bringing out his inventions. Unquote. Oh, the supreme, splendid confidence of youth! Six months later, as we have seen, he had already made his mark, and the same journal in October 1869 could say, quote, Mr. Edison is a young man of the highest order of mechanical talent, combined with good scientific electrical knowledge and experience. He has already invented and patented a number of valuable and useful inventions, among which may be mentioned the best instrument for double transmission yet brought out, unquote not bad for a novice of twenty-two. It is natural, therefore, after his intervening work on indicators, stock tickers, automatic telegraphs, and typewriters, to find him harking back to duplex telegraphy, if, indeed, he can be said to have dropped it in the interval. It has always been one of the characteristic features of Edison's method of inventing that work in several lines has gone forward at the same time, no one line of investigation has ever been enough to occupy his thoughts fully, or to express it otherwise, he has found rest in turning from one field of work to another, having absolutely no recreations or hobbies, and not needing them. It may also be said that, once entering it, Mr. Edison has never abandoned any field of work. He may change the line of attack, he may drop the subject for a time, but sooner or later the notebooks or the patent office will bear testimony to the reminiscent outcroppings of latent thought on the matter. His attention has shifted chronologically and by process of evolution from one problem to another, and some results are found to be final, but the interests of the man in the thing never dies out. No one sees more vividly than he the fact that in the interplay of the arts one industry shapes and helps another, and that no invention lives to itself alone. The path to the quadruplex lay through work on the duplex, which, suggested first by Moses G. Farmer in 1852, had been elaborated by many ingenious inventors, notably in this country by Stearns, before Edison once again applied his mind to it. The different methods of such multiple transmission, namely the simultaneous dispatch of the two communications in opposite directions over the same wire, or the dispatch of both at once in the same direction, gave plenty of play to ingenuity. Prescott's Elements of the Electric Telegraph, a standard work in its day, described, quote, a method of simultaneous transmission invented by T. A. Edison of New Jersey in 1873, unquote, and says of it, quote, its peculiarity consists in the fact that the signals are transmitted in one direction by reversing the polarity of a constant current, and in the opposite direction by increasing or decreasing the strength of the same current, unquote. Herein lay the germ of the Edison quadruplex. It is also noted that, quote, in 1874, Edison invented a method of simultaneous transmission by induced currents, which has given very satisfactory results in experimental trials, unquote. Interest in the duplex as a field of invention dwindled, however, as the quadruplex loomed up, for while the one doubled the capacity of a circuit, the latter created three phantom wires, and thus quadruplexed the working capacity of any line to which it was applied. As will have been gathered from the above, the principle embodied in the quadruplex is that of working over the line with two currents, 
from each end that differ from each other in strength or nature, so that they will affect only instruments adapted to respond to just such currents and no others, and, by so arranging the receiving apparatus as not to be affected by the currents transmitted from its own end of the line, Thus, by combining instruments that respond only to variation in the strength of current from the distant station, with instruments that respond only to the change in the direction of current from the distant station, and by grouping a pair of these at each end of the line, the quadruplex is the result. Four sending and four receiving operators are kept busy at each end, or eight in all. Aside from other material advantages, it is estimated that at least from $15 million to $20 million has been saved by the Edison quadruplex merely in the cost of line construction in America. The quadruplex has not as a rule the same working efficiency that four separate wires have. This is due to the fact that when one of the receiving operators is compelled to break the sending operator for any reason, the break causes the interruption of the work of eight operators instead of two, as would be the case in a single wire. The working efficiency of the quadruplex, therefore, with the apparatus in good working condition, depends entirely upon the skill of the operators employed to operate it. But this does not reflect upon or diminish the ingenuity required for its invention. Speaking of the problem involved, Edison said some years later to Mr. Upton, his mathematical assistant, that, quote, he always considered he was only working from one room to another. Thus, he was not confused by the amount of wire or the thought of distance, unquote. The immense difficulties of reducing such a system to practice made it readily conceived especially when it is remembered that the line itself, running across hundreds of miles of country, is subject to all manner of atmospheric conditions, and varies from moment to moment in its ability to carry current, and also when it is borne in mind that the quadruplex requires at each end of the line a so-called artificial line, which must have the exact resistance of the working line, and must be varied with the variations in resistance of the working line. At this juncture, other schemes were fermenting in his brain, but the quadruplex engrossed him. Quote, this problem was of most difficult and complicated kind, and I bent all my energies toward its solution. It required a peculiar effort of the mind, such as the imagining of eight different things moving simultaneously on a mental plane, without anything to demonstrate their efficiency. Unquote. It is perhaps hardly to be wondered at that when notified he would have to pay twelve and a half per cent extra if his taxes in Newark were not at once paid, he actually forgot his own name when asked for it suddenly at the city hall, lost his place in the line, and, the fatal hour striking, had to pay the surcharge after all. So important an invention as the quadruplex could not long go begging but there were many difficulties connected with its introduction, some of which are best described in Mr. Edison's own words. Quote, Around 1873, the owners of the Automatic Telegraph Company commenced negotiations with Jay Gould for the purchase of the wires between New York and Washington, and the patents for the system, then in successful operation. Jay Gould at that time controlled the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company and was competing with the Western Union and endeavoring to depress Western Union stock on the exchange. About this time, I invented the quadruplex. I wanted to interest the Western Union Telegraph Company in it with a view of selling it, but was unsuccessful until I made an arrangement with the chief electrician of the company so that he could be known as a joint inventor and receive a portion of the money. At that time, I was very short of money, and needed it more than glory. This electrician appeared to want glory more than money, so it was an easy trade. I brought my apparatus over, and was given a separate room with a marble-tiled floor, which, by the way, was a very hard kind of floor to sleep on, 
and started in putting on the finishing touches. After two months of very hard work, I got a detail at regular times of eight operators, and we got it working nicely from one room to another over a wire which ran to Albany and back. Under certain conditions of weather, one side of the quadruplex would work very shakily, and I had not succeeded in ascertaining the cause of the trouble. On a certain day, when there was a board meeting at the company, I was to make an exhibition test. The day arrived. I had picked the best operators in New York, and they were familiar with the apparatus. I arranged that if a storm occurred, and the bad side got shaky, they should do the best they could and draw freely on their imaginations. They were sending old messages. About one o'clock everything went wrong, as there was a storm somewhere near Albany, and the bad side got shaky. Mr. Orton, the president, and William H. Vanderbilt, and the other directors came in. I had my heart trying to climb up around my esophagus. I was paying a sheriff five dollars a day to withhold judgment, which had been entered against me in a case which I had paid no attention to, and if the quadruplex had not worked before the president, I knew I was to have trouble and might lose my machinery. The New York Times came out next day with a full account. I was given $5,000 as part payment for the invention, which made me easy, and I expected the whole thing would be closed up. But Mr. Orton went on an extended tour just about that time. I had paid for all the experiments on the quadruplex and exhausted the money, and I was again in straits. In the meantime, I had introduced the apparatus on the lines of the company, where it was very successful. At that time, the general superintendent of the Western Union was General T. T. Eckert, who had been assistant secretary of war with Stanton. Eckert was secretly negotiating with Gould to leave the Western Union and take charge of the Atlantic and Pacific, Gould's company. One day Eckert called me into his office and made inquiries about money matters. I told him Mr. Orton had gone off and left me without means and I was in straits. He told me I would never get another cent, but that he knew a man who would buy it. I told him of my arrangement with the electrician and said I could not sell it as a whole to anybody, but if I got enough for it I would sell all my interest in any share I might have. He seemed to think his party would agree to this. I had a set of quadruplex over in my shop, 10 and 12 Ward Street, Newark, and he arranged to bring him over next evening to see the apparatus. So the next morning Eckert came over with Jay Gould and introduced him to me. This was the first time I had ever seen him. I exhibited and explained the apparatus, and they departed. The next day Eckert sent for me, and I was taken up to Gould's house which was near the Windsor Hotel, Fifth Avenue. In the basement he had an office. It was in the evening, and we went in by the servants' entrance, as Eckert probably feared that he was watched. Gould started in at once and asked me how much I wanted. I said, Make me an offer. Then he said, I will give you $30,000. I said, I will sell any interest I may have for that money, which was something more than I thought I could get. The next morning I went with Gould to the office of his lawyers, Sherman and Sterling, and received a check for $30,000, with a remark by Gould that I had got the steamboat Plymouth Rock, as he had sold her for $30,000 and had just received the check. There was a big fight on between Gould's company and the Western Union, and this caused more litigation. The electrician, on account of the testimony involved, lost his glory. The judge never decided the case, but went crazy a few months afterwards. Unquote. It was obviously a characteristically shrewd move on the part of Mr. Gould to secure an interest in the quadruplex as a factor in his campaign against the Western Union, and as a decisive step toward his control of that system by the subsequent merger that included not only the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company, but the American Union Telegraph Company. Nor was Mr. Gould less appreciative of the value of Edison's automatic system. Referring to matters that will be taken up later in the narrative, Edison says, quote, After this, Gould wanted me to help install the automatic system in the Atlantic and Pacific Company, of which General Eckert had been elected president. 
the company having bought the automatic telegraph company. I did a lot of work for this company, making automatic apparatus in my shop at Newark. About this time, I invented a district messenger call box system, and organized a company called the Domestic Telegraph Company, and started in to install the system in New York. I had great difficulty in getting subscribers, having tried several canvassers, who, one after another, failed to get subscribers. When I was about to give up, a test operator named Brown, who was on the automatic telegraph wire between New York and Washington, which passed through my Newark shop, asked permission to let him try and see if he couldn't get subscribers. I had very little faith in his ability to get any, but I thought I would give him a chance, as he felt certain of his ability to succeed. He started in, and the results were surprising. Within a month he had procured two hundred subscribers, and the company was a success. I have never quite understood why six men should fail absolutely while the seventh man should succeed. Perhaps hypnotism would account for it. This company was sold out to the Atlantic and Pacific Company. Unquote. As far back as 1872, Edison had applied for a patent on district messenger signal boxes, but it was not issued until January 1874, another patent being granted in September of the same year. In this field of telegraph application, as in others, Edison was a very early comer, his only predecessor being the fertile and ingenious Callahan of stock ticker fame. The first president of the Gold and Stock Telegraph Company, Elisha W. Andrews, had resigned in 1870 in order to go to England to introduce the stock ticker in London. He lived in Englewood, New Jersey, and the very night he had packed his trunk, the house was burglarized. Calling on his nearest friend the next morning for even a pair of suspenders, Mr. Andrews was met with regrets of inability, because the burglars had also been there. A third and fourth friend in the vicinity was appealed to with the same disheartening reply of a story of wholesale spoliation. Mr. Callahan began immediately to devise a system of protection for Englewood, but at that juncture a servant girl, who had been for many years with a family on the heights in Brooklyn, went mad suddenly and held an aged widow and her daughter as helpless prisoners for twenty-four hours without food or water. This incident led to an extension of the protective idea, and very soon a system was installed in Brooklyn with one hundred subscribers. Out of this grew in turn the district messenger system, for it was just as easy to call a messenger as to sound a fire alarm or summon the police. Today, no large city in America is without a service of this character, but its function was sharply limited by the introduction of the telephone. Returning to the automatic telegraph, it is interesting to note that so long as Edison was associated with it as a supervising providence, it did splendid work, which renders the later neglect of automatic or rapid telegraphy the more remarkable. Reed's standard telegraph in America bears astonishing testimony to this point in 1880 as follows, quote, The Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company had 22 automatic stations. These included the chief cities on the seaboard, Buffalo, Chicago, and Omaha. The through business during nearly two years was largely transmitted in this way. Between New York and Boston, 2,000 words a minute have been sent. The perforated paper was prepared at the rate of 20 words per minute. Whatever its demerits, this system enabled the Atlantic and Pacific Company to handle a much larger business during 1875 and 1876 than it could otherwise have done with its limited number of wires in their then condition. Unquote. Mr. Reed also notes as a very thorough test of the perfect practicability of the system that it handled the President's message, December 3, 1876, of 12,600 words with complete success. This long message was filed at Washington at 1.05 and delivered in New York at 2.07. The first 9,000 words were transmitted in 45 minutes. The perforated strips were prepared in 30 minutes by 10 persons and duplicated by 9 copyists. But today, nearly 35 years later, 
telegraphy in America is still practically on a basis of hand transmission. Of this period, and his association with J. Gould, some very interesting glimpses are given by Edison. Quote, While engaged in putting in the automatic system, I saw a great deal of Gould, and frequently went uptown to his office to give information. Gould had no sense of humor. I tried several times to get off what seemed to me a funny story, but he failed to see any humor in them. I was very fond of stories, and had a choice lot, always kept fresh, with which I could usually throw a man into convulsions. One afternoon, Gould started in to explain the great future of the Union Pacific Railroad, which he then controlled. He got a map, and had an immense amount of statistics. He kept at it for over four hours, and got very enthusiastic. Why he should explain to me, a mere inventor, with no capital or standing, I couldn't make out. He had a peculiar eye, and I made up my mind that there was a strain of insanity somewhere. This idea was strengthened shortly afterward, when the Western Union raised the monthly rental of the stock tickers. Gould had one in his house office which he watched constantly. This he had removed, to his great inconvenience, because the price had been advanced a few dollars. He railed over it. This struck me as abnormal. I think Gould's success was due to abnormal development. He certainly had one trait that all men must have who want to succeed. He collected every kind of information and statistics about his schemes and had all the data. His connection with men prominent in official life, of which I was aware, was surprising to me. His conscience seemed to be atrophied, but that may be due to the fact that he was contending with men who never had any to be atrophied. He worked incessantly until twelve or one o'clock at night. He took no pride in building up an enterprise. He was after money, and money only. Whether the company was a success or a failure mattered not to him. After he had hammered the Western Union through his opposition company and had tired out Mr. Vanderbilt, the latter retired from control, and Gould went in and consolidated his company and controlled the Western Union. He then repudiated the contract with the automatic telegraph people, and they never received a cent for their wires or patents, and I lost three years of very hard labor. But I never had any grudge against him, because he was so able in his line, and as long as my part was successful, the money with me was a secondary consideration. When Gould got the Western Union, I knew no further progress in telegraphy was possible, and went into other lines." Unquote. The truth is that General Eckert was a conservative, even a reactionary, and being prejudiced, like many other American telegraph managers, against machine telegraphy, threw out all such improvements. The course of electrical history has been variegated by some very remarkable litigation, but none was ever more extraordinary than that referred to here as arising from the transfer of the Automatic Telegraph Company to Mr. J. Gould and the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company. The terms accepted by Colonel Reef from Mr. Gould on December 30, 1874, provided that the purchasing telegraph company should increase its capital to $15 million, of which the automatic interests were to receive $4 million for their patents, contracts, etc. The stock was then selling at about 25, and in the later consolidation with the Western Union, went in at about 60, so that the real purchase price was not less than one million dollars in cash. There was a private arrangement in writing with Mr. Gould that he was to receive one-tenth of the result to the automatic group and a tenth of the further results secured at home and abroad. Mr. Gould personally bought up and gave money and bonds for one or two individual interests on the above basis, including that of Harrington, who, in his representative capacity, executed assignments to Mr. Gould. But payments were then stopped, and the other owners were left without any compensation, although all that belonged to them in the shape of property and patents was taken over bodily into Atlantic and Pacific hands, and never again left them. Attempts at settlement were made in their behalf, and dragged wearily, due apparently to the fact that the plans were blocked by General Eckert, who had in some manner taken offense at a transaction effected without his active participation in all the details. 
Edison, who became, under the agreement, the electrician of the Atlantic and Pacific Telegraph Company, has testified to the unfriendly attitude assumed toward him by General Eckert as president. In a graphic letter from Menlo Park to Mr. Gould, dated February 2, 1877, Edison makes a most vigorous and impassioned complaint of his treatment, quote, which, acting cumulatively, was a long, unbroken disappointment to me, unquote. And he reminds Mr. Gould of promises made to him the day the transfer had been effected of Edison's interest in the quadruplex. The situation was galling to the busy, high-spirited young inventor, who, moreover, had to live, and it led to his resumption of work for the Western Union Telegraph Company, which was only too glad to get him back. Meantime, the saddened and perplexed automatic group was left unpaid, and it was not until 1906, on a bill filed nearly thirty years before, that Judge Hazel in the United States Circuit Court for the Southern District of New York found strongly in favor of the claimants, and ordered an accounting. The court held that there had been a most wrongful appropriation of the patents, including alike those relating to the automatic, the duplex, and the quadruplex, all being included in the general arrangement under which Mr. Gould had put his tempting bait of four million dollars. In the end, however, the complainant had nothing to show for all his struggle, as the master who made the accounting set the damages at one dollar. Aside from the great value of the quadruplex, saving millions of dollars, for a share in which Edison received thirty thousand dollars, the automatic itself is described as of considerable utility by Sir William Thompson in his juror report at the Centennial Exposition of 1876, recommending it for award. This leading physicist of his age, afterward Lord Kelvin, was an adept in telegraphy, having made the ocean cable talk, and he saw in Edison's American Automatic, as exhibited by the Atlantic and Pacific Company, a most meritorious and useful system. With the aid of Mr. E. H. Johnson, he made exhaustive tests, carrying away with him to Glasgow University the surprising records that he obtained. His official report closes thus, quote, the electromagnetic shunt with soft iron core invented by Mr. Edison, utilizing Professor Henry's discovery of electromagnetic induction in a single circuit to produce a momentary reversal of the line current at the instant when the battery is thrown off and so cut off the chemical marks sharply at the proper instant, is the electrical secret of the great speed he has achieved. The main peculiarities of Mr. Edison's automatic telegraph shortly stated in conclusion are 1. the perforator, 2. the contact maker, 3. the electromagnetic shunt, and 4. the ferric cyanide of iron solution. It deserves award as a very important step in land telegraphy." Unquote. The attitude thus disclosed toward Mr. Edison's work was never changed, except that admiration grew as fresh inventions were brought forward. To the day of his death, Lord Kelvin remained on terms of warmest friendship with his American co-laborer, with whose genius he thus first became acquainted at Philadelphia in the environment of Franklin. It is difficult to give any complete idea of the activity maintained at the Newark shops during these anxious, harassed years, but the statement that at one time no fewer than forty-five different inventions were being worked upon will furnish some notion of the incandescent activity of the inventor and his assistants. The hours were literally endless, and upon one occasion, when the order was in hand for a large quantity of stock tickers, Edison locked his men in until the job had been finished of making the machine perfect, and all the bugs taken out, which meant sixty hours of unintermitted struggle with the difficulties nor were the problems and inventions all connected with telegraphy. On the contrary, Edison's mind welcomed almost any new suggestion as a relief from the regular work in hand. Thus, quote, toward the latter part of 1875 in the Newark shop, I invented a device for multiplying copies of letters, which I sold to Mr. A. B. Dick of Chicago. And in the years since, it has been universally introduced throughout the world, it is called the mimeograph. 
I also invented devices for and introduced paraffin paper, now used universally for wrapping up candy, etc. Unquote. The mimeograph employs a pointed stylus, used as in writing with a lead pencil, which is moved over a kind of tough, prepared paper placed on a finely grooved steel plate. The writing is thus traced by means of a series of minute perforations in the sheet, from which, as a stencil, hundreds of copies can be made. Such stencils can be prepared on typewriters. Edison elaborated this principle in two other forms, one pneumatic and one electric, the latter being in essence a reciprocating motor. Inside the barrel of the electric pen, a little plunger carrying the stylus travels to and fro at a very high rate of speed due to the attraction and repulsion of the solenoid coils of wire surrounding it. And as the hand of the writer guides it, the pen thus makes its record in a series of very minute perforations in the paper. The current from a small battery suffices to energize the pen, and with the stencil thus made, hundreds of copies of the document can be furnished. As a matter of fact, as many as 3,000 copies have been made from a single mimeographic stencil of this character. End of chapter 8 Recording by Tisto T-Y-S-T-O dot com Chapter 9 of Edison, His Life and Inventions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heidi Preuss. Edison, His Life and Inventions by Frank Lewis Dyer and Thomas Comerford Martin. The Telephone, Motograph, and Microphone. A very great invention has its own dramatic history. Episodes full of human interest attend its development. The periods of weary struggle, the daring adventure along unknown paths, the clash of rival claimants, are closely similar to those which mark the revelation and subjugation of a new continent. At the close of the epoch of discovery, it is seen that mankind as a whole has made more than one great advance. But in the earlier stages one watched chiefly the confused vicissitudes of fortune of the individual pioneers. The great modern art of telephony has had thus in its beginnings its evolution and its present status as a universal medium of intercourse all the elements of surprise, mystery, swift creation of wealth, tragic interludes, and colossal battles that can appeal to the imagination and hold public attention. And in this new electrical industry, in laying its essential foundations, Edison has again been one of the dominant figures. As far back as 1837, the American, Page, discovered the curious fact that an iron bar, when magnetized and demagnetized at short intervals of time, emitted sounds due to the molecular disturbances in the mass. Philip Rees, a simple professor in Germany, utilized this principle in the construction of apparatus for the transmission of sound, but in the grasp of the idea he was preceded by Charles Borsol, a young French soldier in Algeria, who in 1854, under the title of Electrical Telephony, in a Parisian illustrated paper, gave a brief and lucid description as follows. We know that sounds are made by vibrations, and are made sensible to the ear by the same vibrations, which are reproduced by the intervening medium. But the intensity of the vibrations diminishes very rapidly with distance, so that even with the aid of speaking tubes and trumpets it is impossible to exceed somewhat narrow limits. Suppose a man speaks near a movable disc sufficiently flexible to lose none of the vibrations of the voice, that this disc alternately makes and breaks the connection with a battery. 
you may have at a distance another disc which will simultaneously execute the same vibrations. Anyone who is not deaf and dumb may use this mode of transmission, which would require no apparatus except an electric battery, two vibrating discs, and a wire. This would serve admirably for a portrayal of the Bell telephone, except that it mentions distinctly the use of the make-and-break method, i.e., where the circuit is necessarily opened and closed, as in telegraphy, although, of course, at an enormously higher rate, which has never proved practical. As far as is known, Borsell was not practical enough to try his own suggestion, and never made a telephone. About 1860, Rees built several forms of electrical telephonic apparatus, all imitating in some degree the human ear, with its auditory tube, tympanum, etc. The examples of the apparatus were exhibited in public not only in Germany, but in England. There is a variety of testimony to the effect that not only musical sounds, but stray words and phrases were actually transmitted with mediocre, casual success. It is impossible, however, to maintain the devices in adjustment for more than a few seconds, since the invention depended upon the make-and-break principle, the circuit being made and broken every time an impulse-creating sound went through it, causing the movement of the diaphragm on which the sound waves impinged. Rees himself does not appear to have been sufficiently interested in the marvelous possibilities of the idea to follow it up, remarking to the man who bought his telephonic instruments and tools that he had shown the world the way. In reality, it was not the way, although a monument erected in his memory at Frankfurt styles him the inventor of the telephone. As one of the American judges said in deciding in early litigation over the invention of the telephone, a hundred years of Rees would not have given the world the telephonic art for public use. Many others after Rees tried to devise practical make-and-break telephones, and all failed, although their success would have rendered them very valuable as means of fighting the Bell patent. But the method was a good starting point, even if it did not indicate the real path. If Rees had been willing to experiment with his apparatus so that it did not make him break, he probably would have been the true father of the telephone, besides giving it the name by which it is now known. It was not necessary to slam the gate open and shut. All that was required was to keep the gate closed and rattle the latch softly. Incidentally, it may be noted that Edison, in experimenting with the Reese transmitter, recognized at once the defect caused by the make-and-break action, and sought to keep the gap closed by the use, first, of one drop of water, and later, of several drops. But the water decomposed, and the incurable defect was still there. The Reese telephone was brought to America by Dr. P. H. Vanderweed, a well-known physicist in his day, and was exhibited by him before a technical audience at Cooper Union, New York, in 1868, and described shortly after in the technical press. The apparatus attracted attention, and a set was secured by Professor Joseph Henry for the Smithsonian Institution. There, the famous philosopher showed and explained it to Alexander Graham Bell, when that young and persevering Scotch genius went to get help and data as to the harmonic telegraphy upon which he was working, and as to transmitting vocal sounds. Bell took up immediately and energetically the idea that his two predecessors had dropped, and reached the goal. In 1875, Bell who, as a student and teacher of vocal physiology, had unusual qualifications for determining feasible methods of speech transmission, constructed his first pair of magnetotelephones for such a purpose. In February of 1876, his first telephone patent was applied for, and in March it was issued. 
The first published account of the modern speaking telephone was a paper read by Bell before the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Boston in May of that year. While at the Centennial Exposition at Philadelphia, the public first gained any familiarity with it. It was greeted at once with scientific acclaim and enthusiasm as a distinctly new and great invention, although at first it was regarded more as a scientific toy than as a commercially valuable device. By an extraordinary coincidence, the very day that Bell's application for a patent went into the United States Patent Office, a caveat was filed there by Alicia Gray of Chicago, covering the specific idea of transmitting speech and reproducing it in a telegraphic circuit through an instrument capable of vibrating responsively to all the tones of the human voice, and by which they are rendered audible. Out of this incident rose a struggle and a controversy whose echoes are yet heard as to the legal and moral rights of the two inventors, the assertion even being made that one of the most important claims of Gray, that on a liquid battery transmitter, was surreptitiously lifted into the Bell application, then covering only the magneto-telephone. It was also asserted that the filing of the Gray caveat antedated by a few hours the filing of the Bell application. All such issues, when brought to the American courts, were brushed aside, the Bell patent being broadly maintained in all its remarkable breadth and fullness, embracing an entire art. But Gray was embittered and chagrined, and to the last expressed his belief that the honor and glory should have been his. The path of Gray to the telephone was a natural one. A Quaker carpenter, who studied five years at Oberlin College, he took up electrical invention, and brought about many ingenious devices in rapid succession in the telegraphic field including the now universal needle annunciator for hotels, etc., the useful telautograph, automatic self-adjusting relays, private line printers, leading up to his famous harmonic system. This was based upon a principle that a sound produced in the presence of a reed or tuning fork responded to the sound, and acting as the armature of a magnet in a closed circuit, would by induction set up electrical impulses in the circuit and cause a distant magnet having a similarly tuned armature to produce the same tone or note. He also found that over the same wire at the same time another series of impulses corresponding to another note could be sent through the agency of a second set of magnets without in any way interfering with the first series of impulses. Building the principle into apparatus with a keyboard and vibrating reeds before his magnets, Dr. Gray was able not only to transmit music by his harmonic telegraph, but went so far as to send nine different telegraph messages at the same instant, each set of instruments depending on its selective note while any intermediate office could pick up the message for itself by simply tuning its relays to the keynote required. Theoretically, the system could be split up into any number of notes and semitones. Practically, it served as the basis of some real telegraphic work, but is not now in use. Anyone can realize, however, that it did not take so acute and ingenious a mind very long to push forward to the telephone, as a dangerous competitor with Bell, who had also, like Edison, been working assiduously in the field of acoustic and multiple telegraphs. Seen in retrospect, the struggle for the goal, at this moment, was one of the memorable incidents in electrical history. Among the interesting papers filed at the Orange Laboratory is a lithograph, the size of an ordinary patent drawing, headed, First Telephone on Record. The claim thus made goes back to the period when all was war, and when dispute was hot and rife as to the actual invention of the telephone. 
The device shown, made by Edison in 1875, was actually included in the caveat filed January 14, 1876, a month before Bell or Gray. It shows a little solenoid arrangement, with one end of the plunger attached to the diaphragm of a speaking or resonating chamber. Edison states that while the device is crudely capable of use as a magnetotelephone, he did not invent it for transmitting speech, but as an apparatus for analyzing the complex waves arising from various sounds. It was made in pursuance of his investigations into the subject of harmonic telegraphs. He did not try the effect of sound waves produced by the human voice until Bell came forward a few months later. But he found then that this device, made in 1875, was capable of use as a telephone. In his testimony and public utterances, Edison has always given Bell credit for the discovery of the transmission of articulate speech by talking against a diaphragm placed in front of an electromagnet but it is only proper here to note, in passing, the curious fact that he had actually produced a device that could talk prior to 1876, and it was therefore very close to Bell, who took the one great step further. A strong characterization of the value and importance of the work done by Edison in the development of the carbon transmitter will be found in the decision of Judge Brown in the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, sitting in Boston on February 27, 1901, declaring void the famous Berliner patent of the Bell Telephone System. Footnote 5. See Federal Reporter. Volume 109, page 976, and following pages. Bell's patent of 1876 was of an all-embracing character, which only the make-and-break principle, if practical, could have escaped. It was pointed out in the patent that Bell discovered the great principle that electrical undulations induced by the vibrations of a current produced by sound waves can be represented graphically by the same sinusoidal curve that expresses the original sound vibrations themselves, or, in other words, that a curve representing sound vibrations will correspond precisely to a curve representing electrical impulses produced or generated by those identical sound vibrations, as, for example, when the latter impinge upon a diaphragm acting as an armature of an electromagnet, and which by movement to and fro sets up the electric impulses by induction. To speak plainly, the electric impulses correspond in form and character to the sound vibrations which they represent. This reduced to a patent claim governed the art as firmly as a papal bull for centuries enabled Spain to hold the Western world. The language of the claim is the method of an apparatus for transmitting vocal or other sounds telegraphically as herein described by causing electrical undulations similar in form to the vibrations of the air accompanying said vocals or other sounds substantially as set forth. It was a long time, however, before the inclusive nature of this grant over every possible telephone was understood and recognized, and litigation for and against the patent lasted during its entire life. At the outset, the commercial value of the telephone was little appreciated by the public, and Bell had great difficulty in securing capital. But among far-sighted inventors there was an immediate rush to the gold fields. Bell's first apparatus was poor, the results being described by himself as unsatisfactory and discouraging which was almost as true of the devices he exhibited at the Philadelphia Centennial. The newcomers, like Edison, Berliner, Blake, Hughes, Grant, Gray, Dolbeer, and others, brought a wealth of ideas, a fund of mechanical ingenuity, and an inventive ability which soon made the telephone 
one of the most notable gains of the century, and one of the most valuable additions to human resources. The work that Edison did was, as usual, marked by infinite variety of method, as well as by the power to seize on the one needed element of practical success. Every one of the six million telephones in use in the United States, and of the other millions in use throughout the world, bears the imprint of his genius, as at one time the instruments bore his stamped name. For years his name was branded on every Bell telephone set, and his patents were a mainstay of what has been popularly called the Bell Monopoly. Speaking of his own efforts in this field, Mr. Edison says, in 1876, I started again to experiment for the Western Union and Mr. Orton. This time it was the telephone. Bell invented the first telephone, which consisted of the present receiver, used both as a transmitter and a receiver, the magnetotype. It was attempted to introduce it commercially, but it failed on account of its faintness and extraneous sounds which came in on its wires from various causes. Mr. Orton wanted me to take hold of it and make it commercial. As I had also been working on a telegraph system employing tuning forks simultaneously with both Bell and Gray, I was pretty familiar with the subject. I started in and soon produced the carbon transmitter, which is now universally used. Tests were made between New York and Philadelphia, also between New York and Washington, using regular Western Union wires. The noises were so great that not a word could be heard with the bell receiver when used as a transmitter between New York and Newark, New Jersey. Mr. Orton and W. K. Vanderbilt and the Board of Directors witnessed and took part in the tests. The Western Union then put them on private lines. Mr. Theodore Pushkas of Budapest, Hungary, was the first man to suggest a telephone exchange, and soon after exchanges were established. The telephone department was put in the hands of Hamilton McKay Twombly, Vanderbilt's ablest son-in-law, who made a success of it. The Bell Company of Boston also started an exchange, and the fight was on the Western Union pirating the Bell receiver, and the Boston Company pirating the Western Union transmitter. About this time I wanted to be taken care of. I threw out hints of this desire, but when Mr. Orton sent for me, he had learned that inventors didn't do business by the regular process, and concluded he would close it right up. He asked me how much I wanted. I had made up my mind it was certainly worth $25,000, if it ever mounted to anything for central station work. So that was the sum I had in mind to stick to and get, ostensibly. Still, it had been an easy job, and only required a few months, and I felt a bit shaky and uncertain. So I asked him to make me an offer. He promptly said he would give me $100,000. All right, I said. It is yours on one condition, and that is that you do not pay it all at once, but pay me at the rate of $6,000 per year for seventeen years, the life of the patent. He seemed only too pleased to do this, and it was closed. My ambition was soon four times too large for my business capacity, and I knew that I would soon spend this money experimenting if I got it all at once, so I fixed it that I couldn't. I saved seventeen years of worry by this stroke. Thus modestly is told the debut of Edison in the telephone art, to which with his carbon transmitter he gave the valuable principle of varying the resistance of the transmitting circuit with changes in the pressure, as well as the vital practice of using the induction coil as a means of increasing the effective length of the talking circuit. Without these, Modern telephony would not and could not exist. See footnote 6. But Edison, in telephonic work, as in other directions, was remarkably fertile and prolific. His first inventions in the art, made in 1875-76, continue through many later years, including all kinds of carbon instruments, the water telephone, electrostatic telephone, 
condenser telephone, chemical telephone, various magneto telephones, inertia telephone, mercury telephone, voltaic pile telephone, musical transmitter, and the electromotograph, all were actually made and tested. Footnote 6. Briefly stated, the essential difference between Bell's telephone and Edison's is this. With the former, the sound vibrations impinge on a steel diaphragm arranged adjacent to the pole of a bar electromagnet, whereby the diaphragm acts as an armature, and, by its vibrations, induces very weak electric impulses in the magnetic coil. These impulses, according to Bell's theory, correspond in form to the sound wave, and passing over the line, energize the magnet coil at the receiving end, and by varying that magnetism, cause the receiving diaphragm to be similarly vibrated to reproduce the sounds. A single apparatus is therefore used at each end, performing the double function of transmitter and receiver. With Edison's telephone, a closed circuit is used, on which is constantly flowing a battery current, and included in that circuit is a pair of electrodes, one or both of which is carbon. These electrodes are always in contact with a certain initial pressure, so that current will always be flowing over the circuit. One of the electrodes is connected with the diaphragm on which the sound waves impinge, and the vibrations of this diaphragm causes the pressure between the electrodes to be correspondingly varied, and thereby affects a variation in the current, resulting in the production of impulses which actuate the receiving magnet. In other words, with Bell's telephone, the sound waves themselves generate the electric impulses, which are hence extremely faint. With the Edison telephone, the sound waves actuate an electric value, so to speak, and permit variations in a current of any desired strength. A second distinction between the two telephones is this. With the Bell apparatus, the very weak electric impulses generated by the vibration of the transmitting diaphragm pass over the entire line to the receiving end, and in consequence the permissible length of line is limited to a few miles under ideal conditions. With Edison's telephone, the battery current does not flow on the main line, but passes through the primary circuit of an induction coil by which corresponding impulses of enormously higher potential are set out on the main line to the receiving end. In consequence, the line may be hundreds of miles in length. No modern telephone system in use today lacks these characteristic features, the varying resistance and the induction coil. The principle of the electromotograph was utilized by Edison in more ways than one, first of all in telegraphy at this juncture. The well-known page patent, which had lingered in the patent office for years, had just been issued, and was considered a formidable weapon. It related to the use of a retractile spring to withdraw the armature lever from the magnet of a telegraph, or other relay or sounder and thus controlled the art of telegraphy except in simple circuits. There was no known way, remarks Edison, whereby this patent could be evaded, and its possessor would eventually control the use of what is known as the relay and sounder. And this was vital to telegraphy. Gould was pounding the Western Union on the stock exchange, disturbing its railroad contracts, and being advised by his lawyers that this patent was of great value, bought it. The moment Mr. Orton heard this, he sent for me and explained the situation, and wanted me to go to work immediately and see if I couldn't evade it, or discover some other means that could be used in case Gould sustained the patent. It seemed a pretty hard job, because there was no known means of moving a lever at the other end of a telegraph wire except by the use of a magnet. I said I would go at it that night. In experimenting some years previously, I had discovered a very peculiar phenomenon, and that was that if a piece of metal 
connected to a battery, was rubbed over a moistened piece of chalk, resting on metal, connected to the other pole. When the current was passed, the friction was greatly diminished. When the current was reversed, the friction was greatly increased over what it was when no current was passing. Remembering this, I substituted a small piece of chalk rotated by a small electric motor for the magnet and connecting a sounder to a metallic finger resting on the chalk. The combination claim of Page was made worthless. A hitherto unknown means was introduced in the electric art. Two or three of the devices were made and tested by the company's expert. Mr. Orton, after he had made me sign the patent application and got it in the patent office, wanted to settle for it at once. He asked my price. Again, I said, make me an offer. Again, he named a hundred thousand dollars. I accepted, providing he would pay it at the rate of six thousand dollars a year for seventeen years. This was done, and thus, with the telephone money, I received twelve thousand dollars yearly for that period from the Western Union Telegraph Company. A year or two later, the motograph cropped up again in Edison's work, in a curious manner. The telephone was being developed in England, and Edison made arrangements with Colonel Garraud, his old associate in the automatic telegraph, to represent his interests. A company was formed, a large number of instruments were made and sent to Garraud in London, and prospects were bright. When there came a threat of litigation from the owners of the Bell patent, and Garrod found he could not push the enterprise unless he could avoid using what was asserted to be an infringement of the bell receiver. He cabled for help to Edison, who sent back word telling him to hold the fort. I had recourse again, says Edison, to the phenomenon discovered by me years previous, that the friction of rubbing an electrode passing over a moist chalk surface was varied by electricity. I devised a telephone receiver which was afterwards known as the loud-speaking telephone, or chalk receiver. There was no magnet, simply a diaphragm and a cylinder of compressed chalk about the size of a thimble. A thin spring connected to the center of the diaphragm extended outwardly and rested on the chalk cylinder, and was pressed against it with a pressure equal to that which would be due to a weight of about six pounds. The chalk was rotated by hand. The volume of the sound was very great. A person talking into the carbon transmitter in New York had his voice so amplified that he could be heard one thousand feet away in an open field at Menlo Park. This great excess of power was due to the fact that the latter came from the person turning the handle. The voice, instead of furnishing all the power as with the present receiver, merely controlled the power just as an engineer working of value would control a powerful engine. I made six of these receivers and sent them in charge of an expert on the first steamer. They were welcomed and tested, and shortly afterwards I shipped a hundred more. At the same time I was ordered to send twenty young men, after teaching them to become expert. I set up an exchange around the laboratory of ten instruments. I would then go out and get each one out of order in every conceivable way, cutting the wires of one, short-circuiting another, destroying the adjustments of a third, putting dirt between the electrodes of a fourth, and so on. A man would be sent to each to find out the trouble, when he could find the trouble ten consecutive times, using five minutes each, he was sent to London. About sixty men were sifted to get twenty. Before all had arrived, the Bell Company there, seeing we could not be stopped, entered into negotiations for consolidation. One day I received a cable from Gourad, offering thirty thousand for my interest. I cabled back I would accept. When the draft came, I was astonished to find it was for thirty thousand pounds. I had thought it was dollars. In regard to this singular and happy conclusion, Edison makes some interesting comments as to the attitude of the courts towards inventors, and the differences between American and English courts. The men I sent over were used to establish telephone exchanges all over the continent, 
and some of them became wealthy. It was among this crowd in London that Bernard Shaw was employed before he became famous. The chalk telephone was finally discarded in favor of the bell receiver, the latter being more simple and cheaper. Extensive litigation with newcomers followed. My carbon transmitter patent was sustained and preserved the monopoly of the telephone in England for many years. Bell's patent was not sustained by the courts. Sir Richard Webster, now Chief Justice of England, was my counsel, and sustained all of my patents in England for many years. Webster has a marvelous capacity for understanding things scientific, and his address before the courts was lucidity itself. His brain is highly organized. My experience with the legal fraternity is that scientific subjects are distasteful to them, and that it is rare in this country, on account of the system of trying patent suits, for a judge to really reach the meat of the controversy. An inventor scarcely ever get a decision squarely and entirely in their favor. The fault rests, in my judgment, almost wholly with a system under which testimony to the extent of thousands of pages bearing on all conceivable subjects, many of them having no possible connection with the invention in dispute, is presented to an overworked judge in an hour or two of argument, supported by several hundred pages of briefs and the judge is supposed to extract some essence of the justice from this mass of conflicting, blind, and misleading statements. It is a human impossibility, no matter how able and fair-minded the judge may be. In England the case is different. There the judges are face to face with the experts and other witnesses. They get the testimony first-hand, and only so much as they need, and there are no long-winded briefs and arguments and the case is decided then and there, a few months perhaps after the suit is brought, instead of many years afterwards, as in this country. And in England, when a case is once finally decided, it is settled for the whole country, while here it is not so. Here a patent, having once been sustained, say in Boston, may have to be litigated all over again in New York, and again in Philadelphia and so on for all the federal circuits. Furthermore, it seems to me that scientific disputes should be decided by some court containing at least one or two scientific men, men capable of comprehending the significance of an invention and the difficulties of its accomplishment, if justice is ever to be given to an inventor. And I think also that this court should have the power to summon before it and examine by recognized experts in the special art who might be able to testify to the facts for or against the patent, instead of trying to gather the truth from the tedious essays of hired experts whose dispositions are really nothing but sworn arguments. The real gist of patent suits is generally very simple, and I have no doubt that any judge of fair intelligence assisted by one or more scientific advisers, could in a couple of days, at the most, examine all the necessary witnesses, hear all the necessary arguments, and actually decide an ordinary patent suit in a way that would more nearly be just than can now be done by an expenditure of a hundred times as much money and months and years of preparation. And I have no doubt that the time taken by the courts would be enormously less, because if a judge attempts to read the bulky records and briefs, that work alone would require several days. Acting as judges, inventors would not be apt to correctly decide a complicated law point, and on the other hand, it is hard to see how a lawyer can decide a complicated scientific point rightly. Some inventors complain of our patent office, but my own experience with the Patent Office is that the examiners are fair-minded and intelligent, and when they refuse a patent, they are generally right. But I think the whole problem lies with the system in vogue in the federal courts for trying patent suits, and in the fact, which cannot be disputed, that the federal judges, which but few exceptions, do not comprehend complicated scientific questions. To secure uniformity, 
in the several federal circuits and correct errors it has been proposed to establish a central court of patent appeals in washington this i believe in but this court should also contain at least two scientific men who would not be blind to the sophistry of paid experts refer to footnote seven men whose inventions would have created wealth of millions have been ruined and prevented from making any money whereby they could continue their careers as creators of wealth for the general good just because the experts befuddled the judge by their misleading statements as an illustration of the perplexing nature of expert advice in patent cases the reader will probably be interested in pursuing the following extracts from the opinion of judge dayton in the suit of bryce brothers co versus seneca glasgow tried in the united states circuit court northern district of west virginia reported in the federal reporter one forty page one sixty one on this subject of the validity of this patent a vast amount of conflicting technical perplexing and almost hypercritical discussion and opinion has been indulged both in the testimony and in the able and exhaustive arguments and briefs of counsel expert osborne for the defendant after setting forth minutely his superior qualifications mechanical education and great experience takes up in detail the patent claims and shows to his own entire satisfaction that none of them are new that all of them have been applied under one form or another in some twenty-two previous patents and in two other machines not patented to wit the central glass and kenny cobble ones that the whole machine is only an aggregation of well-known mechanical elements that any skilled designer would bring to his use in the construction of such a machine this certainly under ordinary conditions would settle the matter beyond peradventure for this witness is a very wise and learned man in these things and very positive but expert clark appears for the plaintiff and after setting forth just as minutely his superior qualifications mechanical education and great experience which appear fully equal in all respects to those of expert osborne proceeds to take up in detail the patent claims and shows to his entire satisfaction that all with possibly one exception are new show inventive genius and distinct advances upon the prior art in the most lucid and even fascinating way he discusses all the parts of this machine compares it with the others draws distinctions points out the merits of the one in controversy and the defects of all the others considers the twenty odd patents referred to by osborne and in the politest but neatest manner imaginable shows that expert osborne did not know what he was talking about and sums the whole matter up by declaring this invention of mr schrader's as embodied in the patent in suit a radical and wide departure from the cabal machine omitted on all sides to be the nearest prior approach to it a distinct and important advance in the art of engraving glassware and generally a machine for this purpose which has involved the exercise of the inventive faculty in the highest degree thus a more radical and irreconcilable disagreement between experts touching the same thing could hardly be found so it is with the testimony if we take that for the defendant the central glass company machine and especially the cunny cabal machine built and operated years before this patent issued and not patented are just as good just as effective and practical as this one and capable of turning out just as perfect work and as great a variety of it on the other hand if we take that produced by the plaintiff we are driven to the conclusion that these prior machines the product of the same mind are only progressive steps forward from utter darkness so to speak into full inventive sunlight which made clear to him the solution of the problem in this patented machine the shortcomings of the earlier machines are minutely set forth and the witnesses for the plaintiff are clear that they are neither practical nor profitable 
but this is not all of the trouble that confronts us in this case. Counsel of both sides, with the indomitable courage that must command admiration, a courage that has led them to a vast amount of study, investigation, and thought, that in fact has made them all experts, have dissected this record of 356 closely printed pages, applied all mechanical principles and laws to the facts as they see them, and, besides, have ransacked the law books and cited an enormous number of cases more or less in point, as illustration of their respective contentions. The courts find nothing more difficult than to apply an abstract principle to all cases of classes that may arise. The facts in each case so frequently create an exception to the general rule that such rule must be honored rather in its breadth than in its observance. Therefore, after a careful examination of these cases, it is no criticism of the courts to say that both sides have found abundant and about equal amount of authority to sustain their respective contentions, and, as a result, counsel have submitted, in briefs, a sum total of 225 closely printed pages, in which they have clearly, yet almost to a mathematical certainty, demonstrated on the one side that this Schrader machine is new and patentable, and on the other that it is old and not so. Under these circumstances, it would be unnecessary labor and a fruitless task for me to enter into any further technical discussion of the mechanical problems involved for the purpose of seeking to convince either side of its error. In cases of such perplexity as this, generally some incidents appear that speak more unerringly than do the tongues of the witnesses, and to some of these I propose to now refer. Mr. Bernard Shaw, the distinguished English author, has given a most vivid and amusing picture of this introduction of Edison's telephone to England describing the apparatus as a much too ingenious invention, being nothing less than a telephone of such stentorian efficiency that it bellowed your most private communications all over the house, instead of whispering them with some sort of discretion. Shaw, as a young man, was employed by the Edison Telephone Company, and was very much alive to his surroundings, often assisting in public demonstrations of the apparatus in a manner which I am persuaded laid the foundation of Mr. Edison's reputation. The sketch of the men sent over from America is graphic. Whilst the Edison Telephone Company lasted, it crowded the basement of a high pile of offices in Queen Victoria Street with American artificers. These deluded and romantic men gave me a glimpse of the skilled proletariat of the United States. They sang obsolete sentimental songs with genuine emotion, and their language was frightful, even to an Irishman. They worked with a ferocious energy, which was out of all proportion to the actual result achieved. Indomitably resolved to assert their republican manhood by taking no orders from a tall-hatted Englishman, whose stiff politeness covered his conviction that they were relatively to himself inferior and common persons. They insisted on being slave-driven with genuine American oaths by genuine free and equal American foremen. They utterly despised the artful slow British workman, who did as little for his wages as he possibly could, never hurried himself, and had a deep reverence for one whose pocket could be tapped by respectful behavior. Need I add that they were contemptuously wondered at by this same British workman as a parcel of outlandish adult boys who sweated themselves for their employer's benefit instead of looking out after their own interests? They adored Mr. Edison as the greatest man of all time in every possible department of science, art, and philosophy and execrated Mr. Graham Bell, the inventor of the rival telephone, as his satanic adversary, but each of them had, or intended to have, on the brink of completion an improvement on the telephone, usually a new transmitter. They were free-souled creatures, excellent company, sensitive, cheerful, 
and profane, liars, braggarts, and hustlers, with an air of making slow old English hum, which never left them even when, as often happened, they were wrestling with the difficulties of their own making or struggling in non-thoroughfares from which they had to be retrieved like stray sheep by Englishmen without imagination enough to go wrong. Mr. Samuel Insull, who afterwards became private secretary to Mr. Edison, and a leader in the development of American electrical manufacturing and the central station art, was also in close touch with the London situation thus depicted, being at the time the private secretary to Colonel Garrod, and acting for the first half hour as the amateur telephone operator in the first experimental exchange erected in Europe. He took notes of an early meeting where the affairs of the company were discussed by leading men, like Sir John Lubbock, Lord Avebury, and the Right Honourable E. P. Bulvery, then a cabinet minister, none of whom could see in the telephone much more than an auxiliary for getting out promptly in the morning's papers the midnight debates in Parliament. I remember another incident, says Mr. Insull. It was at some celebration of one of the Royal Societies at the Burlington House, Piccadilly. We had a telephone line running across the roofs to the basement of the building. I think it was to Dinedale's laboratory in Burlington Street. As the ladies and gentlemen came through, they naturally wanted to look at the great curiosity, the loud-speaking telephone. In fact, any telephone was a curiosity then. Mr. and Mrs. Gladstone came through. I was handling the telephone at the Burlington House end. Mrs. Gladstone asked the man over the telephone whether he knew if a man or woman was speaking, and the reply came in quite loud tones that it was a man. With Mr. E. H. Johnson, who represented Edison, there went to England for the furtherance of this telephone enterprise Mr. Charles Edison, a nephew of the inventor. He died in Paris, October 1879, not twenty years of age. Stimulated by the example of his uncle, this brilliant youth had already made a mark for himself as a student and inventor, and when only eighteen he secured in open competition the contract to install a complete fire alarm telegraph system for Port Huron. A few months later he was eagerly welcomed by his uncle at Menlo Park, and after working on the telephone was sent to London to aid in its introduction. There he made the acquaintance of Professor Tyndall, exhibited the telephone to the late King of England, and also won the friendship of the late King of the Belgians, with whom he took up the project of establishing telephonic communication between Belgium and England. At the time of his premature death, he was engaged in installing the Edison quadruplex between Brussels and Paris, and being one of the very few persons then in Europe familiar with the workings of that invention. Meantime, the telephonic art in America was undergoing very rapid development. In March 1878, addressing the capitalists of the Electric Telephone Company on the future of his invention, Bell outlined prophetic foresights, and remarkable clearness the coming of the modern telephone exchange. Comparing with gas and water distribution, he said, in a similar manner, it is conceivable that cables of telephone wires could be laid underground or suspended overhead, communicating by branch wires with private dwellings, country houses, shops, manufactories, etc., uniting them through the main cable with a central office where the wire could be connected as desired, establishing direct communication between any two places in the city. Not only so, but I believe in the future wires will unite the head offices of telephone companies in different cities, and a man in one part of the country may communicate by word of mouth with another in a distant place all of which has come to pass. Professor Bell also suggested how this could be done by the employ of a man in each central office for the purpose of connecting the wires as directed. He also indicated the two methods of telephonic tariff, 
a fixed rental and a toll and mentioned the practice now in use on long-distance lines of a time charge as a matter of fact this centralizing was attempted in may eighteen seventy seven in boston with the circuits of the Holmes burglar alarm system four banking houses being thus interconnected while in january of eighteen seventy eight the bell telephone central office system at new haven connecticut was opened for business the first fully equipped commercial telephone exchange ever established for public or general service all through this formative period bell had adhered to and introduced the magneto form of telephone now used only as a receiver and very poorly adapted for the vital function of a speech transmitter from august eighteen seventy seven the western union telegraph company worked along the other line and in eighteen seventy eight with its allied gold and stock telegraph company it brought into existence the american speaking telephone company to introduce the edison apparatus and to create telephone exchanges all over the country in this warfare the possession of a good battery transmitter counted very heavily in favor of the western union for upon that the real expansion of the whole industry depended but in a few months the bell system had its battery transmitter too tending to equalize matters late in the same year patent litigation was begun which brought out clearly the merits of bell through his patent as the original and first inventor of the electric speaking telephone and the western union telegraph company made terms with its rival a famous contract bearing the date of november tenth eighteen seventy nine showed that under the edison and other controlling patents the western union company had already set going some eighty-five exchanges and was making large quantities of telephonic apparatus in return for its voluntary retirement from the telephonic field the western union telegraph company under this contract received a royalty of twenty per cent of all the telephone earnings of the bell system while the bell patents ran and thus came to enjoy an annual income of several hundred thousand dollars for some years based chiefly on its modest investment in edison's work it was also paid several thousand dollars in cash for the edison phelps gray and other apparatus on hand it secured further forty per cent of the stock of the local telephone systems of new york and chicago and last but by no means least it exacted from the bell interests an agreement to stay out of the telegraph field by march eighteen eighty one there were in the united states only nine cities of more than ten thousand inhabitants and only one of more than fifteen thousand without a telephone exchange the industry thrived under competition and the absence of it now had a decided effect in checking growth for when the bell patent expired in eighteen ninety three the total of telephone sets in operation in the united states was only two hundred and ninety one thousand two hundred and fifty three to quote from an official bell statement the brief but vigorous western union competition was a kind of blessing in disguise the very fact that two distinct interests were actively engaged in the work of organizing and establishing competing telephone exchanges all over the country greatly facilitated the spread of the idea and the growth of the business and familiarized people with the use of the telephone as a business agency while the keenness of the competition extending to the agents and employees of both companies brought about a swift but quite unforeseen and unlooked-for expansion in the individual exchanges of the larger cities and a corresponding advance in their importance value and usefulness the truth of this was immediately shown in eighteen ninety four after the bell patents had expired the tremendous outburst of new competitive activity in independent country systems and toll lines through sparsely settled districts work for which the edison apparatus and methods were particularly adapted yet against which the influence of the edison patent was invoked the data secured by the united states census office in nineteen o two 
showed that the whole industry had made gigantic leaps in eight years and had 2,371,044 telephone stations in service, of which 1,053,866 were wholly or nominally independent of the bell. By 1907, an even more notable increase was shown, and the census figures for that year included no fewer than 6,118,578 stations, of which 1,986,575 were independent. These six million instruments, every single set employing the principle of the carbon transmitter, were grouped into 15,527 public exchanges in the very manner predicted by Bell 30 years before, and they gave service in the shape of over 11 billion of talks. The outstanding capitalized value of the plant was $814,616,004. The income for the year was nearly $185 million, and the people employed were 140,000. If Edison had done nothing else, his share in the creation of such an industry would have entitled him to a high place among inventors. This chapter is of necessity brief in its references to many extremely interesting points and details, and to some readers it may seem incomplete in its references to the work of other men than Edison whose influence on telephony as an art has also been considerable. In reply to this pertinent criticism, it may be pointed out that this is a life of Edison, and not of anyone else, and that even the discussion of his achievements alone in these various fields requires more space than the authors have at their disposal. The attempt has been made, however, to indicate the course of events and deal fairly with the facts. The controversy that once waged with great excitement over the invention of the microphone, but has long since died away, is suggestive of the difficulties involved in trying to do justice to everybody. A standard history describes the microphone thus. A form of apparatus produced during the early days of the telephone by Professor Hughes of England for the purpose of rendering faint, indistinct sounds distinctly audible depended for its operation on the changes that result in the resistance of loose contacts. This apparatus was called the microphone, and was in reality but one of the many forms that it is possible to give to the telephone transmitter. For example, the Edison granular transmitter was a variety of microphone. It was also Edison's transmitter, in which the solid button of carbon was employed. Indeed, even the platinum point, which in the early form of the Reese transmitter pressed against the platinum contact, cemented to the center of the diaphragm, was a microphone. At that time, when most people were amazed at the idea of hearing, with the aid of a microphone, a fly walk at a distance of many miles, the priority of invention of such a device was hotly disputed. Yet without desiring to take anything from the credit of the brilliant American Hughes, whose telegraphic apparatus is still in use all over Europe, it may be pointed out that this passage gives Edison the attribution of at least two original forms, of which those suggested by Hughes were mere variations and modifications. With regard to this matter, Mr. Edison himself remarks, After I sent one of my men over to London especially to show Priest the carbon transmitter, and where Hughes first saw it and heard it, then within a month he came out with the microphone without any acknowledgment whatsoever. Published dates will show that Hughes came along after me. There have been other ways also in which Edison has utilized the particular property that carbon possesses of altering its resistance to the passage of current according to the pressure to which it is subjected, whether at the surface or through the closer union of the mass. A loose road with a few inches of dust or pebbles on it offers much appreciable resistance to the wheels of vehicles traveling over it, but if the surface is kept hard and smooth, the effect is quite different. In the same way, carbon, 
whether solid or in the shape of finely divided powder, offers a high resistance to the passage of electricity. But if the carbon is squeezed together, the conditions change, with less resistance to electricity in the circuit. For his quadruplex system, Mr. Edison utilized this fact in the construction of a rheostat, or resistance box. It consists of a series of silk discs saturated with a sizing of plumbago and well dried. The discs are compressed by means of an adjustable screw, and in this manner the resistance of a circuit can be varied over a wide range. In like manner, Edison developed a pressure or carbon relay adapted to the transference of signals of various strengths from one circuit to another. An ordinary relay consists of an electromagnet inserted in the main line for telegraphing, which brings a local battery and sounder circuit into play, reproducing in the local circuit the signal sent over the main line. The signal relay is adjusted to the weaker currents likely to be received, but the signals reproduced on the sounder by the agency of the relay are, of course, all of equal strength, as they depend upon the local battery, which is only this steady work to perform. In cases where it is desirable to reproduce the signals in the local circuit with the same variations in strength as they are received by the relay, the Edison carbon pressure relay does the work. The poles of the electromagnet in a local circuit are hollowed out and filled up with carbon discs or powdered plumbago. The armature and the carbon-tipped poles of the electromagnet form part of the local circuit, and if the relay is actuated by a weak current, the armature will be attracted, but feebly. The carbon, being only slightly compressed, will offer considerable resistance to the flow of the current from the local battery, and therefore the signal on the local sounder will be weak. If, on the contrary, the incoming current on the main line be strong, the armature will be strongly attracted, the carbon will be sharply compressed, the resistance in the local circuit will be proportionately lowered, and the signal heard on the local sounder will be a loud one. Thus it will be seen, by another clever juggle with the willing agent, Carbon, for which he has found so many duties, Edison is able to transfer or transmit exactly to the local circuit the mainline current in all its minutest variations. In his researches to determine the nature of the motograph phenomena and to open up other sources of electrical current generation, Edison has worked out a very ingenious and somewhat perplexing piece of apparatus known as the chalk battery. It consists of a series of chalk cylinders mounted on a shaft revolved by hand. Resting against each of these cylinders is a palladium face spring, and similar springs make contact with the shaft between each cylinder. By connecting all these springs in circuit with a galvanometer and revolving the shaft rapidly, a notable deflection is obtained of the galvanometer needle, indicating the production of electrical energy. The reason for this does not appear to have been determined. Last but not least, in this beautiful and ingenious series comes the tazimeter, an instrument of most delicate sensibility in the presence of heat. The name is derived from the Greek the use of the apparatus being primarily to measure extreme minute differences of pressure. A strip of hard rubber with pointed ends rests perpendicularly on a platinum plate, beneath which is a carbon button, under which again lies another platinum plate. The two plates and the carbon button form part of an electrical circuit containing a battery and a galvanometer. The hard rubber strip is exceedingly sensitive to heat. The slightest degree of heat imparted to it causes it to expand invisibly, thus increasing the pressure contact on the carbon button and producing a variation in the resistance of the circuit, registered immediately by the little swinging needle of the galvanometer. The instrument is so sensitive that with a delicate galvanometer it will show the impingement of the heat from a person's hand thirty feet away. The suggestion to employ such an apparatus in astronomical observations occurs at once, and it may be noted that in one instance 
the heat of rays of light from the remote star Arcturus gave results. End of chapter 9